Right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our 10 a.m. public portion of closed session of the August 13th, 2019 meeting of the City Council. In this part of the meeting, the council will, will receive public testimony. Thereafter, the council members will move to the courtyard conference room for closed session. I would like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone? Here. Weber? Here. Myers is walking in. <laughs> Brown? Here. Matthews? Here. Vice Mayor Cummings? Here. And Mayor Watkins? Here. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to any items on closed session today? Um, please come forward. And Thank you. Uh, good morning, Mayor Watkins and members of the City Council. I'm Zeke Bean, Water Resources Supervisor and President of the uh, OE3 Supervisors Unit for the City. Um, I've met with most of you on a couple of occasions already, and I'd like to reiterate uh, what, we're, what we've talked about and why we're all here today. Supervisory, supervisory employees deserve a fair and equitable contract. When there's a sewage leak in the middle of the night, supervisors drop everything and rush to clean it up. When our streets are flooding, we head out to the, in the pouring rain to unclog the storm drains. We fix our streets, we clean up campsites, we clean, we clean human excrement off our sidewalks, we pick up needles, we care for your children in our recreation programs, and we put our lives on the line every single day and work just as hard as every other city employee to protect and to serve our community. And we do this all because we place a high value on the city. So when you tell us that you just don't have the money to do what's right and give us a fair contract, and then you subsequently turn around and offer even more to other employees and other units, it's a slap in the face. It sends a message that you simply do not place the same value on supervisors as you place on other employees. We understand that the city needs to have a balanced budget. We've understood that as we've fallen 18% behind inflation since 2003. We understood that during the last recession when we volunteered to take pay cuts and forego raises so that we could keep the city solvent while doing the critical work of maintaining our infrastructure. Because we understand that when you defer the needed maintenance on your infrastructure for too long, it crumbles. Well, guess what? We're your most critical piece of infrastructure and you've deferred us for too long. It's time to start taking us seriously. We're just $80,000 away from a fair and equitable contract. You control the budget and it boils down to how you prioritize us just a few more seconds. You have the power to do what's right today. You have the power to ensure that supervisory employees come to work knowing that we're valued, and you have the power to treat supervisors with the dignity and respect that we, reserve, that we deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Is there any other member of the community who would like to address the council? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting to the Courtyard Conference Room at this time. Thank you. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our 1.30, approaching 1.40 um, City Council meeting. And I would like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member is Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here and Mayor Watkins. Here. Before we move forward with the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to, if I could, ask those in the audience and um, my colleagues up here to take a moment of silence to honor the victims of the horrific shootings that took place in, um, as close as Gilroy to us in El Paso and as well as in Dayton and probably the numerous others that um, don't necessarily get the same media coverage. So if we will, we'll take a brief moment of silence. Thank you. So I'll go ahead and ask our clerk to now lead us through our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the So at 
this time we have the introduction of new employees. And we'll start with our um, Economic Development Director, Bonnie Lipscomb, who will be introducing her new employee. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council. It's my pleasure to introduce Jessica DeWitt, who joined our housing team and economic development as our new housing and community development manager. Um, so she's been working a little over a month and it's been great. Um, Jessica's responsible for managing the city's housing programs, including inclusionary housing, Measure O, home ownership programs, rental housing developments, accessory dwelling unit programs, program and compliance monitoring and affordable housing preservation. So she's very busy um, already. Um, she has over 13 years of affordable housing development experience working for local affordable housing nonprofit developers, including Midpen and First Community Housing. So she has great affordable housing background, which we think is going to be perfect timing and expertise for some of the projects that we're working on right now. Um, prior to joining the city, um, Jessica worked for the County of Santa Clara, managing the development feasibility and loan underwriting program for affordable housing projects. Jessica earned her BA degree from University of California, San Diego, and a master's in regional and urban planning from the University of Michigan, which is my alma mater too, so very excited. Um, Jessica also received her certificate in real estate development from the University of Michigan, and also has, is a graduate of LISC's um, um, affordable Housing Development Training Institute. So she's very well qualified for the position. Um, she was born locally, Stanford, fairly locally at Stanford Hospital, and grew up in the Bay Area and made many regular trips down to Santa Cruz growing up. She's lived in the Santa Cruz area on and off since 2006, and is excited to be working the community she um, loves and lives in. You'll be happy to know that Jessica bikes to work at least two times a week, um, and her favorite thing to do outside of work is mountain bike, and the surrounding area loves Wilder, um, also loves West Cliff and Natural Bridges and eating anything locally. So she's a huge fan of our local farmer's market. Um, she's impressed by the team atmosphere, oriented atmosphere at the city and is excited to bring more affordable housing, jobs and transit options to downtown. So please join me in welcoming Jessica to the city. Welcome Jessica. So at this time, I'll also invite up our Director of Parks and Recreation, Tony Elliott, to introduce his new employee. All right, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Uh, I'd like to introduce Catherine Green here. We were furiously writing notes uh, as uh, during that last presentation to add some more things here, so excited for this presentation. Um, Catherine is our new administrative assistant in the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, she began working in mid-July. Um, Catherine grew up in Lemoore, a small town in the Central Valley. <laughs> um, school and employment opportunities her, have allowed her to live in Southern California, the Midwest, and the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, she has her BA in Sociology from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, she's volunteered with local organizations such as the City Library, the uh, Pride Parade, uh, Second Harvest Food Bank, Habitat for Humanity, and she also serves as an instructor for the Community Emergency Response, the CERT team, uh, and is the team leader for the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, the Municipal Wharf is her favorite park or one of her favorite places uh, in the city. Um, and she uh, can be found if you guys wanna meet Catherine or ever talk to her, she's at the front desk of the Parks and Rec office at 323 Church Street across the street, uh, along with our awesome uh, front office team. So uh, please help me in welcoming Catherine. Welcome. And we have next our Director of Public Works, Mark Dettel, to introduce his new employees. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce two new employees. Uh, on my far left is Jose Armando Ortiz. Uh, he's a new resource recovery worker working in the recycling processing uh, area. He was born in Mexico and raised in Santa Cruz. He lives in Capitola. He's currently married and has a son who's two years old. Um, Armando's, uh, he's been a roofer and a restaurant manager. He worked at 99 Bottles for five years when he's going to school. Uh, he graduated Santa Cruz High attended, and attended Cabrillo College. Uh, when he's not working, he likes fishing at Pinto Lake, and he loves meeting new people. Um, we're glad to have him up at the Recycle Center. Um, also next to Armando is Katie Shirtleff. She's a new assistant engineer, too, uh, in the Stormwater and Wastewater Division. 
And she was born and raised in Seattle, Washington, and currently lives in Santa Cruz. Um, she has two years in geotechnical consulting experience, and she studied uh, engineering geology at UCLA for undergraduate, and has a master's of civil engineering with an emphasis in geosystems from UC Berkeley, go Bears. And when she's not working, um, she likes to mountain bike, hike, rock climb, and explore local state parks. So please join me in welcoming our two new employees. Welcome. And then last but certainly not least, we have Rosemary Menard from our water department. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Welcome back. Um, so it's my pleasure here today to introduce James Cassad. He's a new utility services rep in our customer services group. He was born in Monterey, but has lived in coastal California all of his life and moved to Santa Cruz in, in 2009. Three goals, he said, to see the sun during the summer, this week is good. Uh, <laughs> learn to surf and for Charlie Hong Kong. So there you go. Uh, he's worked in a variety of different kinds of jobs over, looks like he has really um, 10 or so years of experience production at Santa Cruz Bicycles. He's done a various kind of accounting and um, revenue management jobs. He's worked at the boardwalk and um, at Walgreens and a lot of different kinds of customer service jobs. So he's really great coming into the customer service group and um, understands the sort of financial transactions that go on there. He enjoys uh, cycling, uh, road and mountain biking. However, his real passion is long distance, uh, 75 to 130 mile bi bike road trips. Um, and he's traveled a lot with different kinds of activities to learn about different cultures. He's been active as a community volunteer for Habitat for Humanity and the Diversity Center and also Wildlife Center and SPCA of Monterey County for several years. So please help me welcome James Cassad. Welcome, James. So um, before we move on to the presentations, I have a brief announcement to make that on um, August 24th, I'm excited to be biking in our upcoming Street Smarts family bike ride. August 24th will be a busy day. Um, and we at the city invite you all to bike with us and our police officers and, eco and ecology action along the Riverwalk. We'll start and end at the tannery with penny ice creamery cones for all who ride. There is also a traffic safety open house with games and our favorite Warriors Maverick, um, the mascot. So I hope to see you on August 24th at 10 a.m. at noon um, for the Tannery bike ride. And if there's any of you interested in attending, there's more information on our website. Um, so at this time, I have a opportunity to have a presentation and then a proclamation for our lovely Derby girls. So um, I'll go ahead and invite up our Derby girls to uh, share and then happy to present the, pre the proclamation. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting us here today. We're so honored to work with the city of Santa Cruz each year and each season to proclaim Derby Girl Month in Santa Cruz. My name is Eileen Hill. I've been with the Santa Cruz Derby Girls for 10 years. My roller derby name is Sharon DePayne, and I have uh, been skating with the Harbor Hellcats. I also uh, volunteer on our public relations committee. And in my real life, I'm the executive director of the Carrillo College Foundation. Well, I'll just introduce ourselves real quick. Um, I'm Skirt Vonnegut. I'm a retired Boardwalk bombshell. I'm Kim Luke. My derby name is Mildred Fierce. I've been with the league since the beginning, 2008. I've been a skater, a juniors coach, an announcer, uh, a PR maven, and a legend, which is an official title. <laughs> My name is Knox. I skate with and am captain of the Harbor Hellcats. I've been with the league for a couple years now, and my job there is a boot camp trainer, so I coach all the new people coming in. My name is War, and uh, I'm a skater on hiatus for probably two years now. <laughs> Until my son starts driving, then I'll be back. <laughs> also, where, where do you work? Where do you work? Oh. And I work here for the city. <laughs> she just happened to be here. Right. My name is Jennifer Wood, or Swoop Dog. I'm the current executive director of the Santa Cruz Derby Girls. I've been with the league for 10 years, two months longer than Sharon, I believe, yes. but not as long as Millie. 
Um, and in my regular life, I'm a system, healthcare systems analyst for Salud para la Gente in Watsonville. So we have a few slides to go through here, and just to uh, give you some background on the Santa Cruz Derby <laughs> Girls and what we do here in Santa Cruz and for the community. How many of you guys have been to about? Oh, almost everybody, almost 100%, I love it. <laughs> All right, go ahead. All right, I'll give you some history and background. Uh, some of you might remember roller derby from the olden days. It was on a banked track. There were crazy names and some fights and wrestling also mixed in. Modern roller derby began in 2001 in Austin, Texas. It's quickly spread worldwide to well, well over 1,200 leagues throughout the world. Modern roller derby is played by a set of rules and it is not scripted. We like to think it is entertaining sports and not sports entertainment. We play on a flat track, not a banked track like the old days. Uh, most of the higher comp competing teams do skate on a flat track. The sport has evolved and grown exponentially from tattoos and fishnets to serious athletes who train and practice seven days a week. Our league began in 2009 as the first full contact flat track roller derby league in Santa Cruz. And some might say the first sports team in Santa Cruz. I'm looking at the Warriors right now. <laughs> A small group of determined women who really wanted to make roller derby happen in Santa Cruz put a lot of time and work into creating this league. We are one of over 400 leagues internationally that are part of the Women's Flat Track Derby Association. It's the governing body in roller derby like the NBA is for basketball. And we are a 501c3 organization. All right, um, so our league has grown to 170 members who are comprised of skaters, refs, non-skating officials, announcers, and volunteers who are committed to furthering the sport of roller derby and giving back to the community. Um, our organization is completely volunteer run. It's the hard work of our league members that makes Santa Cruz, um, roller derby here in Santa Cruz possible. Um, in order to be part of the league, members need to pay dues, and because it's a bit of a pay to play, you're sca seeing skaters not, not, not only pay money, um, but time, blood, sweat, and tears into a sport that they love. You pay money to get hurt. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and that's what makes it so great, is everyone's so passionate about it. And uh, besides those 170 adult members, we have 100 Junior skaters, um, it's through our roller derby um, grommets program, and they're age seven to 17. Um, our Santa Cruz Derby Doms, Groms, which is the A team, they've climbed the rankings in the Junior Roller Derby Association, and they're currently ranked number two nationally. Um, and we're really proud of our Junior Derby program and athleticism, female empowerment, and confidence we are instilling in these young skaters. They are the future of roller derby. I need to pay attention. Uh, so the adult league structure works sort of like a farm league in that you're uh, continue trying to move up to get to the, the A team level. And our, uh, we have a boot camp that we run twice, twice a year for the public. We teach all fundamental skills. That's one of the key ways people uh, onboard into the league. And then from there, you can keep ascending. You can try out for fresh meat and skate with the fresh meat skater pool for a while. From there, you can become a Seabright Siren, which is our C team. Uh, and, and so on. Our B team is the uh, Harbor Hellcats, and then our all-star team is a charter of 20 of the top players on the league, who is our competitive team that Skirt's gonna talk a little bit about. That's right, so our Boardwalk Bombshells are our all-star team. Um, the Bombshells travel and compete internationally for rankings um, all over the world. Our all-stars have played teams from Australia, Canada, Finland, England, Florida, Utah, Washington, New York. You can actually name pretty much any state and we've probably played a team from them, from there. Um, last spring we hosted a tournament in Santa Cruz at our practice facility and we hosted seven teams from five different US states. Um, our little Santa Cruz team is making an impact worldwide and we're now ranked number 14 out of more than 400 WFDA leagues um, worldwide. So, thank you. So when you come to see us play, you're literally seeing some of the best roller derby players in the world. Um, 
And uh, here's some coverage uh, of our teams in the Santa Cruz. Oh, that's oh wait, that's <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Uh, and then, yes, here's some coverage. We're lucky to have the Sentinel cover us uh, in some of our games throughout the year. Um, okay, and also, so this year we qualified for playoffs in North Carolina at the beginning of September, and the top three teams are going to go to championships in November in Montreal. We have yet to make it to championships, but we're really rooting for it this year. Um, and then this is, of course, the bracket of the um, teams that we're going to play at playoffs. And our first game is against the Paris Roller Girls. So a lot of, uh, not only do we skate and we train and we compete uh, and also volunteer for the league, we also commit a lot of time and energy into giving back to our community. So, so far we've donated nearly $50,000 back to our Santa Cruz community, contributed over 1,500 hours and support more than, oh, support more than 40 local nonprofits, schools, and community groups. Um, this year we're partnering with the SPCA as our uh, nonprofit partner and we, um, uh, promote them throughout the year and at the end of the season proceeds from our bout go to them uh, We also do things in the community like support the wharf to wharf the autism net family networks homeless services soup line We like to go to community events and arm wrestle community members. So if any of you guys are interested <laughs> look out for that uh, We also help uh, support monarch services do beach cleanups uh, Walnut Avenue services. The Pride Parade is one of our favorite things to be a part of, uh, as well as um, different parades, for example, the, at the Autism Family Network, Human Race, um, as well as um, elementary school uh, reading programs. So we like to be in the community as much as possible so that we can give back, um, and we hope that um, our community will come and see us play at the Santa Cruz Civic Auditorium. So we are excited to be celebrating the Santa Cruz Derby Girls all of this month in Santa Cruz. You'll see our banners up downtown every summer. They're up for a whole month. That's thanks to Catherine, who is one of the new employees. She actually <laughs> Thank you. make that happen. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> you guys got a good one. <laughs> uh, downtown window displays will be featuring Derby Girls gear. It's kind of a fun program. Uh, we're creating a Derby Girl beer with the Santa Cruz Brewing Company. Do you know what it's called this year? I don't know year? what it's called yet. They I'm usually just, come up with something idea. gnarly. The, our next bout on August 24th at the Civic, our junior players will play at 4.30 against Sacramento Roller Derby and the Boardwalk Bombshells, the All-Stars, will play at 6.45 against Sacramento as well. It's your last chance to see our All-Star team play at the home on their home track this season. We will have Crazy George there to help pump up our fans. He invented the wave. So he says, that's our mascot. That's his, that's his claim. To that's his claim. He, yeah. he invented the wave. And not this one. We will be honoring and surprising Mayor Watkins with her own derby name. It's a tradition that started with Cynthia Matthews, who was our first honorary derby girl. Her derby name is? Sybil Servant. Sybil Servant, that's right. And I do want to throw in a few more because they've been that's so good. fun. Okay, I'm going to throw out a name. You tell me who you think it was. Uh, Vito Power was Ryan Coonerty. Policy maker was Lynn Robinson. Steamer Lane, no, no that's Don Lane. <laughs> yes. Civic Booty, now that's Hillary Bryant. <laughs> Protect and Swerve was former police chief Kevin Vogel. We had Hot Sauce, who was Matt Hot, firefighter of the year for Santa Cruz. Uh, Red Alert was Cynthia Chase. And Terrazosaurus Rex was you know who. <laughs> So uh, it'll be a fun night on August 24th, and we hope you can all make it and cheer on your Santa Cruz Derby girls. Thank you. Well, I think the Derby girls are awesome, and I want to thank you for your presentation. And I have a mayor's proclamation here, and I was looking at the whereases, and I think you touched on all of them. So I'm going to go straight to the therefore, and, and that's, the, that's a really important part of it, and I look forward to sharing it on the 24th. So I, Martine Watkins, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do, do hereby proclaim the month of August 2019 as Santa Cruz Derby Girls Month in the city of Santa Cruz, and, in, and urge all citizens to celebrate this hardworking and dedicated league of women and men who bring the sport of roller derby to our city and to attend the August 24th, 2019 bout at the Santa Cruz Civic Auditorium. And I look forward to being there. 
Yeah. And I'm happy yeah. to Thanks present for this to us. you. Sure. Can we take a selfie? Absolutely. Hey, with you guys just in the background? <laughs> yeah, smile, Council. <laughs> do, you want the, do you want the proclamation? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah just, just, hold, just, hold, just hold it in the back. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. I see it. I All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. I have derby girl envy because I'm terrible on roller skates, but <laughs> anyhow. Okay, so that concludes the presentation. So at this time, we'll go ahead and move on to the rest of our agenda. And so I have a few announcements. And um, first announcement is that today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25, and it's streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. <laughs> There you go. All city council members can be emailed at citycouncil at cityofsantacruz.com. If you would like to communicate with us about any agenda item, we'd like to receive your email by Monday at 5 p.m. before our council meeting. This provides us with an opportunity to review your email and include it with the rest of our agenda packet. Please do bear in mind that all items of correspondence with the city and the city council constitute public records and are generally subject to disclosure upon request by any member of the public. Accordingly, if you have any sensitive or private information that you wish not to be made public, you should not include that information in your correspondence. Our rules of decorum are on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside and outside of our city chambers. At this time, I'll go ahead and ask our council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and see if there are any additions or deletions to um, the agenda from our city clerk. No, no. I have a brief announcement about oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. Oral communications will occur at or around 7 p.m. I'll go ahead and turn it over to our city attorney to provide a report on closed session. Mr. Condotti. Thank you, Mayor Watkins, members of the City Council. The following items were discussed by the, closed, uh, by the Council in closed session, um, which began this morning at 10 a.m. Uh, item A was uh, liability claims, the claims of Olga J. Ocon, <coughs> Jerry L. McInturf, and David W. Turner. Those items are also listed as uh, item eight on your consent calendar this afternoon. Um, the next item was a conference with labor negotiators involving the following groups, the mid managers, supervisors, executives, POA, police management association and fire. Um, council received a report and gave direction to its negotiators. There was no reportable action on those items. Um, one of which is also on your afternoon agenda. There were two items of significant exposure to litigation. Um, there was no reportable action on either of those items and one item of considering initiation of litigation, which also um, did not result in reportable action. There were two items of a conference with legal counsel concerning pending litigation. Um, the first is a case of Habitat and Watershed Caretakers versus Regents of the University of California, pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Um, there was no reportable action on that item. The second item was a discussion of the pending lawsuit in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals entitled Martin versus the City of Boise. Um, there was no reportable action on that item either. Lastly, there were uh, real property negotiations. Council received a report from and gave direction to its negotiator, um, Bonnie Lipscomb, concerning the property at 125 Coral Street. Um, and there were performance evaluations for the city attorney and city manager. Um, no reportable action on those items. 
Thank you very much. Okay, so now is an opportunity to see if there are any um, changes to the meeting calendar, which is attached to the agenda. Um, is there any changes to the meeting calendar? No. Next, we'll go ahead and move right along to our consent agenda. <laughs> Councilmember Glover. Um, I'm sorry, there was, uh, I may be miss, or not or missing it, but there normally was the section for us to add things to a future agenda that weren't listed on this one. Is that number two that we just went past, or? There is, um, it's, that's, uh, the, it's essentially written as to have it be, uh, if there's any changes to the meeting calendar dates, and it's been used as a way to add items to the agenda. So. But it's not advertised as that. So it's. I'm just making sure that this number two item is normally when council members would bring forward things they'd like to see on future agendas that aren't on the agendas or that we want to be taking. Just, just because there's been concern from the community that this item has been moved from the end of the agenda to the beginning of the agenda, which doesn't really give us the opportunity to holistically look at the uh, feedback that we get from the community through the afternoon agenda to determine if there is the need to schedule things uh, post haste for the following meeting. So I would request that we move this to the end of the uh, afternoon agenda. So I make a motion for that. Second. Okay, there's a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crone. Any further discussion? Councilmember Matthews. I would just leave that to your discretion, frankly. Okay. Well, there's a process for agendizing items and items that come forward. And as you know, today we had a, we have what is estimated to be a 12 hour meeting. Um, so I use that to the best of my ability and the vice mayor and myself, and we'll be discussing that later in our meeting, um, our main in our discussions around um, what happened from the retreat, we'll be looking at a refined process. The meeting calendar is, um, as far as I recollect, and I'll ask if our city manager or city attorney want to weigh in on this, has always been um, sort of an opportunity if there's been any structural changes to the meeting calendar dates, and if by necessity, if there hasn't been um, an item agendized, then that would be the opportunity to do that, but that was often um, not the case. It was very rare, I'd say. So given that, it's structurally for me, as the person who works on setting the agenda, makes the most sense to have it at the beginning, knowing that there could be a better process to agendize items. Um, that said, if there's a motion and a second to have it later, then um, the majority of the council can go ahead and do that. Councilmember Glover. Thank you. And yeah, uh, so I don't anticipate that we'll need to use it at all, but I feel that it gives uh, it r limits our ability to, if something comes up in the conversation between now and the end of the afternoon session that does require us to be uh, more uh, intentional in moving things on the next agenda, I think that it sh we should leave that opportunity for us to be able to use that tool if necessary. Also, in the last six months, myself and others on the council have had to use that tool to make sure we got items such as the ability for us to address the ICE immigration raids which took place, which would not have been placed on the next agenda, um, or we would have had to hope with our fingers crossed that it did show up on the next agenda as opposed to making sure that the community could address something as important as immigration reform and protecting of undocumented citizens. So again, it's a very vital, in my opinion, vital aspect to the agenda, and I would love to see it just put to the end of the day, um, as well, you know, in the future open a conversation conversation of how the agenda is built as a whole, but uh, for just today, it'd be great to see it put towards the end of the agenda. Okay, so there's a motion to postpone the item until the end of the meeting. Council Member Cohen. One moment, we're having discussion. I'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. You can go ahead and take a seat if you like. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to s support uh, the motion because it just seems like there is a right of the council here too as, as a whole, and I don't want us to give this away and I think coming at the end of the meeting makes the most sense because things happen during the course of the meeting uh, as a very relevant one that Councilmember Glover just mentioned, the ICE raid, and there's been others as well. So I, I really um, uh, make a plea here to my fellow council members to preserve this right and have the calendar where it has um, been for the last time since I've been on the council, I think. Uh, last three years uh, at the end of the agenda. It seems more appropriate. I'll just maybe ask if our city attorney wants to weigh in here on this one. My understanding is that it's agendized as the meeting calendar. It's not agendized as a process for council members to agendize anything that comes up because I think it would be sort of not necessarily in um, and with the intention of the of the Brown Act to be agendized in that way, if that's the opportunity. So when I think that was sort of the task of the vice mayor and myself to look at clarifying that language then, if that's what we want it to be, 
as opposed to saying it's just sort of a meeting calendar update in terms of date changes or date adjustments. Do you have any insights into that as our legal counsel? Um, first of all, I, I concur with your uh, description of how this has been done traditionally in the past, but with respect to the application of the Brown Act and your own meeting rules, what it says is, <clears throat> quoting in part from the Brown Act, a member of the legislative body or the body itself subject to rules or procedures of the legislative body. Um, this is an exception to the rule that says no action or discussion shall be taken on an item that's not on the posted agenda. So this is an exception. Um, a member of the legislative body or the body itself subject to rules or procedures of the legislative body may provide a reference to staff or other resources for factual information, request staff to report back to the body at a subsequent meeting concerning any matter or take action to direct staff to place uh, a matter of business on a future agenda. Turning to the meeting guidelines that the council has adopted, it states that the mayor in consultation with the city manager, city clerk administrator and department heads will establish the agenda and the order of the agenda. So um, there's a little bit of a conflict there between the meeting guidelines and the, and the Brown Act. Um, Councilmember Brown and then Vice Mayor Cumming. I would just say I welcome hearing from the mayor and vice mayor and having a discussion with the council about uh, looking at the process for placing items on the agenda in general. As for today, I don't see, given that it, it may not, probably won't be used, um, we could just move on. I don't see any reason to not just add it to the end of the agenda just in case. So that, I'll be supporting it. Vice Mayor Cummings, did you have I'm just gonna say that in the past, when important issues have come to our attention during public comment, for example, was in relation, for example, to ICE raid, that we as a city council made it a priority to make sure that we address that. And I think that myself and the mayor work with the city manager very hard to understand the concerns of the community and make sure that they're addressed in a timely manner. Um, I would like to add that should we need to bring the calendar back at the end of the meeting, I think that there would be votes to do that. But I think that at this point in time, we should just move forward. If there's, if in the event something comes to our attention and we need to revisit the calendar, I think that we can do so at the end of the meeting. But as it stands right now, we should move forward and continue with the meeting as, as it's been scheduled and planned. Clarification. Councilmember Council Brown. Can we do that without an agenda item? Can we just decide to revisit something at the end of our meeting without having an Re item? You can bring a vote to reconsider. So you and, can and we need how many votes to do that? You need a quorum. You need four. So we have a motion on the floor by Councilmember Glover, a seconded by Councilmember Crone. Um, any further discussion? Councilmember Glover? I'm just amazed that it's taken this much discussion to move something to the end of the afternoon agenda that literally takes 30 seconds to just move past. I don't understand why there's such contention around giving us the opportunity to maintain a tool on the on the agenda that is there specifically for us to be able to allocate important issues on the following agenda. But uh, it, it's just very reminiscent of experience on the dais, it's just really unfortunate that something as simple as moving something to a later portion of the agenda has caused this much of a delay. Okay, so we'll go ahead and open it up to see if any member of the community wants to weigh in on this. Is there any member of the community that'd like to address the council on this? Ms. Norris, you'll have up to two minutes. There's a clear division on this council and part of that division is reflected in how the agendas are created. So when the mayor, the vice mayor, and the city manager and his staff creates an agenda without paying any attention to sidelining and deep sixing stuff that's presented by the three other council members, this has happened at least once and actually more than once, it's important there be a process where this can actually happen in a public way where items can be put on the agenda where even four members of this body apparently can't get something on the agenda if it's against the will of the mayor and the city manager. Uh, I, I want to see a, a, an item put on this agenda for the next agenda actually, which talks about totally revamping the agenda process and making it public so that the public has an input, but that certainly three members of the city council get a priority item on the next agenda if they want it on the agenda. At the last city council meeting, Mayor Watkins also glided over this issue very, very quickly. She didn't even mention it, moved right into the, uh, the consent agenda. And she also unilaterally moved this to the beginning of the agenda without a vote 
on this by the city council. So I think it's an exa another example of a minority on this council using one member who is wavering, that's Mr. Cummings back and forth on I think key issues to in essence create a majority and also using the city attorney in this way. Uh, which I find to be unfortunate and I think somewhat disingenuous because these issues to some extent should be allowed the vote of the council, trying to get the, uh, the city attorney to weigh in on your side after you've taken a unilateral action, you being, I think you being the mayor and not addressing the mayor directly but referring to her is <sighs> loading the whole situation and the whole process. So I would say vote for this but certainly vote at the end of this agenda to put some decent items on the agenda and open it up to public discussion. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm not seeing any other member of the community who wants to speak to this item. We'll go ahead and return to council. Council Member Crone. Uh, uh, the only, what is on the floor is, I understood also that you can bring back um, any agenda item later with four votes, but it's, it's the transparency here that I'm really um, a bit upset about just because an email or um, something uh, from the mayor would have helped, you know, this is why I'm, you know, before the, before the, the meeting just said, hey, I'm thinking about this, any input, I'm, you know, I'm moving this calendar item to the front without any, you know, I just think that we should be pursuing transparency up here amongst ourselves as, as well with the, the public. All right, well, I, I hear your feedback and we'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. So that fails with Councilmember Brown, Crone, and Glover voting in support. Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, myself, and Myers voting against. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to our consent agenda. So Here. those Mayor? items on the agenda, oh. Councilmember Matthews. Excuse me, just a comment on that item. It seems to me historically, reviewing the meeting calendar used to be, as we've said, just strictly dates. What date and what time are we meeting? Are we having a study? Just a review of the dates, not the agenda. And other people have brought up issues of what items do people want put on an agenda? And is it the next agenda or is it a future agenda? And we've all talked about workloads. So when you consider this item in the future, I think it'd be good to separate those two things. What days and times are we meeting? And what's the process for agendizing? And I think that could clarify some of this. I agree, yeah. I agree. And that, um, thank you for that. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on now then to our consent agenda. Those are items three through 23 on our agenda. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any items that council members would like to pull at this time? Council member Glover. Items five, item six, item seven, there's a question. Item 10, item 17. Item 19, item 20, and item 21. And item seven is pulled or you have a question for that question, item? Just a question for clarification. So you're not pulling, pulling item seven. Right. Are there any other items that are gonna be pulled from the council consent agenda? <laughs> council member Crown. Item number four, the uh, minutes of our special meeting. Okay. So we have items four, five, six, 10, 17, 19, 20, and 21 polled. I'm gonna go ahead and just sort of note that for the um, purposes of managing this meeting and the content of our full agenda, that if we go over a certain period of time, I will postpone, I will take public comment for any of the consent agendas items, but then postpone them until either the end, if we have time before around six or 6.15 um, to rehear them or after our evening agenda to hear them at that time. So we'll go ahead and have what up to around uh, 3.40, I'm sorry, 2.45 or so to get to as many items, at which time then we'll have public comment and then visit them at later in the agenda. So we'll go ahead and start with item number four, Council Member Crone. Actually, before we do, pause. Um, move the remaining items on the yeah, consent agenda. Before we do, before we, okay, so we have a Council Member Brown motion to remove the Second. remaining items, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. And then before we do, we had a question for uh, item number seven by Council Member Glover. This would be the time. Great, yeah, so there was just some confusion within the public about <laughs> item seven and what the, uh, the changing of the budget and allocations, percentages, the GAN limit. Uh, so could uh, you could just explain it for the people watching at home that may have no idea what that means. 
that's a high bar to explain this. Yeah, yeah But it's essentially meant to make sure we don't exceed our tax base. It's meant to be a limit on what we can spend, not what we should spend. So it's meant to be an upper limit on what we can spend based on our tax base. So it's just merely a, a checkoff box that was implemented in 1979 to make sure government agencies don't overspend. Thank you. Yep. All right, so we have um, a motion uh, by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. That's for our consent agenda items other than item four, five, six, 10, 17, 19, 20, and 21. Does any member of the community want to address us on any of those items? Good evening, I'm Scott, I'm, or good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, I think it was item 17 that I wanted to address. I'm gonna go ahead and pause you. Item 17 has been pulled, so you have an opportunity. Oh, to I thought you wanted, oh. No problem. So this is for any other item other than item four, five, six, 10, 17, 19, 20, and 21. Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and return to council for action. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So we'll go to item number four, Councilmember Crone. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this has to do with uh, a meeting we had on, was it, um, it was our special meeting in uh, De La Vega Park. Item number three. Excuse me, it was item number three. I didn't mean four, I meant item number three. Um, and it was just, it just briefly, in our, in, our, in our council handbook, it does talk about how, I mean, I'm disappointed all the time about how minutes aren't, aren't kept, and, um, but it does say in, in our council member handbook, the minutes of the city count, of the council shall be kept by the city clerk administrator and shall be recorded in a file kept for that purpose with a record of each particular type of business transacted by the council set off by paragraphs with subheadings. The city clerk administrator shall also be required to make a record only of such business as was actually passed by a vote of the council and shall be required to make verbatim transcript of proceedings. A record shall be made of the names of persons addressing the council, and I'll stop there. And the, the item number three, that our special meeting was not videotaped, and there was, I don't know, seven, eight, nine people, who members of the public who spoke to the council on that occasion. And not only was it not videotaped, the names of the folks was not written down, were not written down, and what they talked about uh, of, wasn't uh, recorded either. And I just wanna uh, put my dissent in for that, and I hope that we do better in the future and get those names uh, of the public who went to the, the you know, the trouble of going, attending the meeting up in De La Viega Park and registering concerns with the council about our strategic plan. Thank you. Yep. Councilman McGlover. And then yeah, I think uh, accurate minutes and recollections so that people from the public and as well as us uh, as colleagues are able to look back and understand what happened and who happened and where happened. I recently found an error in a previous uh, minutes as well, which I brought to the attention. So uh, I'm not sure if it would be uh, in the form of a motion that we would give specific instructions to how uh, minutes are kept. I mean, it's in the handbook, which is very explicit, it sounds like there, so maybe we could understand why that meeting wasn't captured in minutes and uh, whose responsibility that was. Mr. Bernal. Yes, so with respect to these types of meetings, which is the, the council retreat, um, historically, uh, we what we do is because it's, uh, first of all, it's a special meeting where no final action is taken by the city council, one. Two, it's uh, an offsite retreat, um, so we don't have all the infrastructure and facilities that we have at, in here at the council chamber to record, televise, all of that. Third, we hire a consultant uh, who, through the process, records. Uh, and in fact, we have a very detailed outline of everything that happened at the meeting in an agenda item that will be before you later on this afternoon. Um, so the, the recording process is pretty extensive of what happened. Uh, no final decisions are made. That'll come back to you in the form of minutes and in the forms of actions, and which again is scheduled on your meeting this afternoon. Um, so these meetings are just a little different because it's a retreat, it's an offsite, and the city clerk uh, does not attend the meetings. It's just staff with the consultant, and we rely on the consultant to help to uh, uh, create the notes, typically it's charts, tables that are created at the, at the meeting. So that's the context of this meeting. It's very different than your typical meeting that we have here at the city council. 
So potential resolution could be if we decide we want to do something different in the future, then we could potentially see how that would look in advance. Sure, absolutely. And if you want more detailed minutes of them, we can we can do that. Uh, normally, we have not had a lot of public comments at these at these meetings, so that we, we tend to focus on the council work as far as some, as uh, the note taking is concerned. But we can certainly do more extensive ones of the public if the council wishes us to do that. Councilmember Glover. So, I might a motion to adopt these minutes, uh, but give specific instruction for any offsite meetings to be audio recorded with an audio device because I mean all it takes I mean just from my experience a phone in the middle of the table can capture basically all of the conversation that happens in the room uh, or live streaming it through a, a laptop so that people can see what's going on or something but I mean there are ways that we can keep and capture the information even if it's off-site even if the clerk isn't around so is that something that you think would make it easier if you had that kind of direction or it's if I could maybe just offer, I think if since we don't have anything calendared at this time, the next time something is calendared, we can have a discussion about how we might want to capture it more holistically um, at that time. But since we have nothing calendared, I don't know if we necessarily have to go into the details of what that could look like at this moment sure. in the interest of time. Okay, Councilmember uh, Myers. I'm just gonna move to, I believe four was pulled, so we haven't approved that, so I'll move item number four. Approval? Second. All right. Any further discussion? Okay. And I'll go ahead and see if any member of the community wanted to address us on item number three, since that was um, incorporated into our consent agenda. Mr. Norris, you'll have up to two Council minutes. Council members, members of the community. Um, it's really important, I think, for those who can't or don't want to or un are unable to attend the council meetings or the retreats to have as convenient uh, an access to what happened. And looking at the minutes, how they've been treated generally, both of the city council and in this particular case, you don't find much in the way of anything that the public says other than they spoke on the item, they spoke against the item, they spoke for the item. This dates back to Mayor Rotkin and his attempt to streamline the process. But for me, streamlining tends to mean uh, excluding the public and moving right beyond and essentially, to some extent, rubber stamping staff recommendations, which may or may not be good depending upon the recommendation. So I I would encourage council members to, uh, first of all, not to wait until the next special session when that might or might not be dealt with, depending on the preferences of the mayor, but to do so you know, in an open council meeting to make these changes so that the public does have this power to actually review what's happened at a council meeting and to hear what their fellow members of the public actually said on these issues. Now it's true that for most council meetings, when there, when there isn't defective material or defective recording material, you, you get this, although that's not always the case. And I try to keep a record of uh, these kinds of proceedings myself. But having it summarized can be very helpful because who wants to listen to four and a half hours? I'm sure nobody does or longer periods of time. Going through it once is enough, I'm sure, for the council and for the community. But for those who haven't been there, it presents, I think, a burden, and I think it's appropriate to have extended, to, re, to revisit and to once more have decent minutes for these council meetings. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to now um, move to item number four since item number three was already uh, moved. Uh, we had a motion by Councilmember Myers, seconded by Councilmember Crone, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. I just wanted to maybe make a recommendation um, that we look into uh, purchasing or the price, the costs around purchasing um, um, technologies that we can transport for the rec for recording um, city council meetings offsite. I know that this has come up with regards to holding city council meetings in the civic, and I feel that since it's come up a number of times, it might be worth us looking into just how much it would cost for us to have portable um, recording devices and technologies. I don't know if you, I, my understanding that was something that was already being explored at this time. Is that not accurate? Yeah, with respect to the Civic Auditorium, um, yeah, we can look into it if the council right. wishes okay. to do that. Okay. Sure. okay. Do we have a motion and vote for three? We, we had a, a three was voted upon with the majority of the consent agenda oh, items, so we're now revisiting four. So, uh huh. Okay. All right. 
All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. So we'll move on to uh, item number there. five. But before we move on, I, um, I think it would be good since you said if it's the council's wishes, but there was no direct specific direction. So would you like direction to explore audiovisual solutions to offsite? It makes sense that there was a consensus from the council to do that. So. Okay, I just want to make sure. I that took that as uh, that you'd want me to do that. So okay. Yes. Thanks. So item number five was pulled. I'm not quite sure by who. Okay, uh, Councilmember Glover. Yes, thank you. So um, this was something that was a little disconcerting to me, just in the sense of the partnership uh, and who we're in partnership with. Now, it is incredibly important for us to have uh, medical services for people that are experiencing homelessness or who are of too low income to pay for it, but there are some issues with the partner that has been named in this memorandum of understanding, specifically Dignity and Dominican Health, for two primary reasons. The first, well, in question to their, their care of poor people, uh, what, uh, you can turn to the um, article from July 1st, 2018, uh, 2019, uh, talking about something that took place in January of 2018, I believe, where Dominican uh, discharged a nearly naked homeless man. And the uh, title of that article is Late Night Santa Cruz Hospital Discharge of Nearly Naked Homeless Man Riles Community. So. Uh, this is an issue that uh, is facing uh, p different municipalities all over the place with regards to hospitals discharging people because they aren't feeling that they're required to provide shelter. So there's that first issue of the potential abuse of uh, low income and uh, people experiencing homelessness, but also the issue with Dominican and Dignity Health and their labor relations and the difficulty that their union workers have had in acquiring uh, fair working wages and negotiations with management. So those are two really big issues I have with continuing a memorandum of understanding with this specific group. Um, in conversations with representatives from the catch, it seems like it would make more sense to have it go through the catch to look at potential partnerships with Dominican as we see in other cities like Portland, Oregon, where um, healthcare facilities actually pay into a program that opens up beds that's run by either the county or the city, and that there takes the load off of those uh, facilities for their medical aid and or sheltering of people that are recovering from uh, different medical issues. So. Um, I would make the motion to table this item uh, while we, while more research is being done in maximizing the positive impacts of our healthcare system and those experiencing homelessness with the most efficient use of funds and approach Dominican and Dignity Health to partner or coordinate with the catch to explore ways to uh, maximize the resources including hospital community benefits and obligations. We have a motion by Councilmember Glover. I'll just go ahead and say um, one thing. Second. And then um, we have a second by Councilmember Crone. Uh, this was something that was sent over to our office, I think back in January, was not was overlooked for some reason, and is essentially allowing them to access funding to support their mobile van and caring for the financially challenged patients and other community activities that they perform. Um, I don't think that having us support that work precludes any Future, future conversations we may want to have in terms of partnership, but I think having our partnership in this regard will only allow more access for better, for more services or for a continuation of services that they provide at this time. So I won't be supporting the motion. I think it's uh, it's really appropriate for us to support this MOU. Uh, Councilmember Brown and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Uh, yeah, I. Um I agree with the concerns expressed by Councilmember Glover. I also have concerns about not having an alternative in place. And so I think that both could be happening. I think approving this now and having that conversation and, and referring this to the catch is a good idea. So I'll be, um, I, as, as uh, currently um, stated, I can't support the motion, but I'm definitely interested in moving ahead with the idea. I share those same sentiments, but I was also going to ask um, what the timeline is for um, this MOU to be processed because what I would hate to see is that we delay passing this and then um, Dominicans not eligible for the funding and then we lose the funding and the ability for our community to provide the services that are needed for. My understanding from them is they'd like to have this approved as soon as possible. Um, this is not the request that we've uh, had uh, every year 
and so when I first came in, there was a question as to, the first request came for the city manager to sign it, so we had to do a bit of analysis as to what level of authority or authorization it was needed, so there was some work to do that, and then it was determined that uh, from a legal perspective that we needed to bring it to council, so that's why it's been brought forward to the city council. Uh, but again, it strictly uh, relates to the hospital's interest in being able to access these federal funds to address indigent care, which is completely separate than you know, the labor or uh, community relations issues. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Glover. Yeah, I'm, I won't support the, the motion. Um, and I am concerned that, um, that the cash is becoming a, a parking place for um, a variety of different things that I don't think the intent of our, our process as we outlined it. Um, I appreciate the interest and I think, um, uh, you know, if we need to have dialogue with Dominican Hospital on, you know, care of, of both residents as well as county, county residents, we can do that. Um, but to put a citizens committee in charge of figuring out how to provide medical care for uh, underserved populations in our um, city, it just is, it's, it, 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 I'm, I'm just, kind of curious as how you can do that with a citizen committee that is not uh, staffed with, well, without membership of professional qualifications that can make those decisions. So I'm not gonna support the motion. Um, and uh, I, I'd, I'd like to see us pass this so that uh, we can get care for our, for our residents. Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Brown, Matthews, and then I'm gonna open it up to public comment. So I always find it strange when these items come to council when they were submitted months ago, six months ago now, uh, that somehow got overlooked and now need to be passed immediately or otherwise the funding is going to be lost. Uh, we have a tool in which to negotiate with Dominican right now to either expand their care, make a statement that they will not discharge people in the middle of the night half naked, especially those that are experiencing homelessness, and uh, get a statement on their perspective of union labor and how they're going to respect their workers. Uh, I, as, <laughs> Out of everyone on the dais, I think you can understand that I care about the uh, service of medical care to people that are experiencing homelessness, but not in just signing a memorandum of understanding so that a group can get funding and then are currently practicing in the oppression of people experiencing homelessness. So uh, it, <laughs> Yes, it can happen simultaneously where we can pass this and then we can open up into negotiations with Dominican, but why are we giving Dominican something that they want without having some very specific guidelines as to what it is that we need to be able to co-sign as partners? And with regards, to the, with regards to the catch, there are so many things that were pushed into the catch as a, what you call, I forget the, the term that was used, but a storage facility, a holding pattern, whatever it might be. We have people that are defecating on the streets and yet we're having the catch analyze bathroom access. We have people dying in the woods and yet we have them analyzing safe sleeping places. So uh, I have no idea how asking them to open up a dialogue with Dominican to see if there was a potential for a partnership between city uh, entities and the, the hospitals to be able to increase medical care for people experiencing homelessness and how that would happen is that there are people experiencing homelessness on the catch. So we'll be able to hear their perspective as to their experience with getting medical care in emergency situations, their networks and how they've experienced medical care in those situations and their feelings on Dominican, which I don't know if anyone has been asked from the population of people experiencing homelessness, how they feel about Dominican and a potential memorandum of understanding with the, with the city. It's, it is, it blows my mind uh, a lot of times, but that's okay. Okay, uh, Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matt. Yeah, I just was get, wanted to make the comment that I, I also don't consider the catch a catch-all space for, um, you know, anything that we don't, we're not dealing with here or, or things that we might want to deal with but can't get around. I, I totally understand that concern. Um, I think in this case, the reason that I suggested or agree that it might be a good idea is because I think we're already asking them to do some kind of inventorying and un uh, developing an understanding of the services that are available for unhoused people in our community. So indigent care is part of that and it just seems like it makes sense in that, specifically about this, but I, I hear you. Councilmember Matthews? 
Just as this moves forward, there are some other uh, entities that I think should be brought into the um, discussion of how to improve uh, health care available to um, those experiencing homelessness, particularly the uh, continuum of care group at the county level and the health improvement partnership, which have a lot of experience in this and really work hard to coordinate for um, most effective care with the available resources. Okay, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. I'll bring it back to the council. Does any member of the committee want to address the council on item number five on our agenda? Okay, you'll have up to two minutes. Hey, my name's Serge. Uh, hope you had a good summer vacation and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I'm a member of the catch too, and I don't want everything dumped on the catch. And I don't want to be telling people how to do medical care beyond my knowledge either. Um, the reason that this one is something that's interesting, uh, SB 1152 was passed last year and it was implemented, uh, hospitals had to implement it as of July 1st. And it said for discharge planning of homeless people, uh, they had to have a discharge plan, they had to give them some uh, weather appropriate clothing, medication, make sure they were connected with the hospital and sending them to appropriate uh, shelter that they would actually be eligible for. Other counties and other hospitals talk of like set somebody up for a week or two. Little frustrating, I worked winter shelter and middle of the night emergency room just sending somebody over and the person needs more medical care than we can deal with and doesn't really put any energy into that. I understand it falls on them to have to deal with it because no other agency has to deal with the homeless, but the law says the hospitals do. So if the city could make some sort of negotiation, whether they put some funding, like they, they put large money into the RCC as one of their services, um, but whether they help, supplant, help pay for some beds in the shelters or help do something, it just seems that since there's not a timeline that I've heard for the MOU, that this is a good time to have that negotiation. And we do know of there have been dumping situations even in Santa Cruz. Not to say anything against the staff there. I like the social workers there and stuff, but it falls on them to do something that's very hard that they can't do. So it just seems like we should try to partner with them for that. All right. Council members, community, I'm with Huff, Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. Uh, we've covered and received reports about Dominican for 25 years, some of them good, some of them bad. But the issue here, it seems to me that a direct question of the city manager got the runaround. Uh, you know, is there, is there a, uh, a deadline date that requires you to rush into this today? Apparently not, unless I misheard uh, what Martine was saying. So you have that option to look into it for the reasons that have been described. Um, it seemed to me that the council likes to do a lot of talking about issues like shelter and care and uh, resources for homeless people. I mean, to, to me, catch is a way of talking this thing to death as well. Although I think there's some damn good people on it and they're trying to say some honest things. And I think you should be listening to them. But I saw this process uh, 20 years ago with the Homeless Issues Task Force, which I called the hopeless, icky task farce, because what it was, was it was a diversion of community attention from real issues that, and good recommendations came out, but they were never acted on by the city council. So as far as healthcare goes, you know, I, I would simply reiterate what has been said before by several folks and hopefully will be voted on by progressives on this council that it's time to use what power you have to get the changes that state law now allows you. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and bring it back to council. Um, so I'll just go ahead and reiterate that this was brought to our attention as something that wasn't, um, w that is time sensitive. It's my understanding without having representation, I don't have um, the actual documentation to confirm that, but it was my understanding that this was something that they hope to have in place a lot sooner. So I would be, um, um, that would be my assumption. So I think time is of the essence here. And so I wouldn't, uh, I would support, I will not support the motion on the floor and would support the MOU at this time. Um, further discussion, we had Councilmember Matthews, Glover, and Brown. Uh, quickly, I won't be supporting the motion on the floor. Um, I would like to uh, then propose a motion um, 
uh, authorizing the MOU, but also requesting a report from Dominican on the status of their discharge planning for homeless persons and surge wherever you are, you can give us the name of the bill, you know what it is. So then we actually do get a report back and it does bring to their attention that we're concerned about this. Councilmember Glover. So what is the timeline associated with the MOU? My understanding from them is they would like this to be done as soon as possible because I think it's delaying their ability to access the funds right now. That's my understanding from them, from the correspondence that we received. They didn't give me a specific date, uh, just that they need it right away. And I think they did follow up with the mayor as well. And that was the indications from them. So that's what's bothering to me is that there's no information you said they, they, they hope that it gets taken care of at some point. They'd like for it to be taken care of. You think that they're not having access to the money, but if we're about to sign a memorandum of understanding, shouldn't we understand what the timeline is and especially with regards to what's available to us? I, it, I just don't understand why we're not asking these questions. Well, I would say that the first time this was brought to my attention was yesterday, you know, uh, so we haven't had any time to do this. I mean, when this was brought forward, it was seen as an administrative item, again, trying to provide funding. This question of uh, these other questions are not something that's been brought to my attention. I had no, no clue, no idea that anybody would have any concern until yesterday. So if council members had let me know ahead of time that you had concerns about that, maybe I could have answered those questions or given me more time to do it. So that's a problem as well. So I would appreciate that. So again, we put it on as quickly as we could. Uh, again, not anticipating the issues. If we had known about it, we would have answered the question. Uh, so again, there's no intent here to try to circumvent anything or to try to manipulate anything or not provide you the information that you had. You know, we presented it with all the information that we had based on the, on, on the uh, request and, and it's here before you. Okay. So just a uh, point of, or a question for clarification. We have a motion and a second, and we have a and I, another motion, no second. Um, what if that was that a substitute motion? Why don't we go ahead and take the? Can we? Yeah. Okay. Let's go ahead and I just want to because uh, I have a question for the okay. maker of that motion when the time comes. Okay, we'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor of not approving the MOU with Dominican Hospital at this time, as presented by the motion of Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crum, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Okay, so that fails with Councilmember Crone and Glover voting in support and the remainder of us voting against. Um, so, uh, Councilmember Matthews, do you want to restate the, the other motion that you had? Yes, I'd like to move the recommendation that we authorize the MOU with Dominican Hospital and we also um, uh, direct the um, staff to uh, request from Dominican um, a report to the City Council on the status of their discharge planning for homeless individuals. I'll go second. Ahead. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by uh, Councilmember Myers, question by Councilmember Brown. Did I see a hand? Question by Councilmember Crown. Would the maker of the motion be willing to put a request for a report back by a specific date, for example, our first meeting in October? Sure. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, I'm just thinking to give them time. I mean, I don't know if how long it'll take them to get the money. It, it, it can be sooner if well, they I don't can mean, get they're two different things. Oh, One is to yes. approve the MOU, and the other is to get a report back on the status of yes. their discharge planning. So, two so, different things. so that they should be able to do pretty quickly. Okay, so I'd like to include a, a date certain for them to, you know, within a, okay, within yeah. a month, great. And um, also, uh, in light of the uh, comments uh, we received from the public. Would the maker of the motion be willing to include a request as part of that request for information about discharge planning, um, a request that um, they, that Dominican have a conversation with uh, the city about support for, um, you know, some kind of partnership with shelters as, you know, along the lines of what other communities have done? That's getting into territory that I don't know enough about. I should think that would be part of the discharge planning. Let me just say um, in the report on discharge planning that it include their relationships with local shelters. Does that sound? Sure, I, sure. I would. What I would like is for them to understand that it, this is a burden on our the shelters. I mean, I, we've heard it, and it you know I, I don't have any reason to believe that's not the case, and that it um, we would like to use this opportunity to um, do more than just ask them for information, but really encourage them to 
So, so you know, asking for the plan, I, I want to just make sure that we ha there's something in there that makes clear we'd like to have a conversation about that potential for a partnership. Um, I'd like to leave the motion pretty clean that we uh, request a report on their discharge planning for um, um, homeless patients, uh, including the relationship with local shelters, and just leave it at that. But I think when we get that, then that can raise the issue for our participation in the continuum of care and the local health and improvement partners. I think that's where that conversation continues. We're not gonna do a whole lot of medical negotiating. So I think that it'll make the point. Is that okay? I, I okay. can work with that. Yep. Okay, Councilmember Cohn. Yeah, I had a question. Um, you had, uh, Councilmember um, Brown, you talked about sending it to the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness. Um, well, I, I, I said that I was, you know, that that was an interesting idea for, to me. I don't know that I um, want to ask the maker of the motion for another um, request to be included, but um, I'm, you know, I mean, it would be great if the catch had some, wanted to weigh in when they have an opportunity about the potential, you know, the kind of the range of services that are available for indigent, you know, health related services for indigent population, um, but I don't, I don't have to do that. I right wonder this if, moment. I, in the interest of, um, sort yeah. of moving I mean, us along, I'm wondering if we can have our staff explore whether or not there's an opportunity as they start to get into the work that they're doing at the cash level to integrate this into their work as well. And I know I'm sure staff would be willing to listen to the conversation that ensued here to use that to hopefully determine how that could fit into the cash. I know that they're just beginning also. Mm. Does that feel appropriate? I think it would certainly fit into the context of when you're discussing the system and services. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's also some analysis that's being done with the county, the study that they're doing mm -hmm. sure. as it relates yeah. to services. So there's a lot of work in this topic in general that the cash is gonna be doing in any case. This is just one narrow piece of it, so they'll get that. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Cumming. I would just like to make the recommendation that the report that comes from Dominican also go to the catch for their really? yeah. ability to review and, sure. and then take into consideration. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you. Okay. Does the city clerk have the motion at this time? Or do you need the motion restated? We can go ahead and restate. Why don't we go ahead and restate the motion? Councilmember Matthews? Yeah. Um, move to authorize the MOU with Dominican as recommended on item five. Um, and also request of Dominican um, a report on the status of their discharge planning for homeless patients, including the relationship with local shelters and that that report be shared with other interested parties locally. At the first meeting of October. I don't know if it necessarily needs to be an, I, an item, but around before October. Within a month. Within a month, ideally. Right. Okay. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Um, we're gonna go ahead and we are gonna go ahead and take public comment for the remainder of our consent agenda items. Then we're gonna go ahead and postpone council deliberation and action on those items until after our afternoon agenda. And if there's not adequate time, then we'll go ahead and postpone them to our evening session. So we'll go ahead and see if any member of the community would like to address the council on items number six, 10, 17, 19, 20, and 21 at this time. We're gonna go ahead and take public comment on this at this time, and we're not gonna have public, we're not gonna go into the details of the staff reports on each of those individual items. Well, that's how we're gonna do it today. So if anybody would like to speak on items number six, 10, 17, 19, 20, and 21, you're welcome to do so, and please come forward, you have up to two minutes. Hmm. Okay, item number six, the, uh, um, endorsing the bad Green New Deal. I'm not for it. The, the Green New Deal is the worst piece of legislation to have been crafted in my memory. The trillions to unimaginable trillions cost is astronomic. The benefits not assured. It's more about money and social change than the environment. Do not endorse it. There is no reliable replacement for carbon energy that makes up 80% <laughs> of our energy needs, except perhaps nuclear, but nuclear isn't part of the Green New Deal. It is reliable energy, I mean, Carbon is reliable energy that transforms a hostile environment into a less hostile environment. The last I checked, the sun doesn't shine, the wind doesn't blow all the time. Renewable energy makes up less than 5% of power despite decades of subsidy and research. No country is this stupid anywhere in the world. 
There is considerable evidence that there are other factors like galactic cosmic rays that can fluctuate by 50% that account for cloud formation and global warming. There is considerable evidence climate has always changed and this may be no different. There is considerable ice core evidence the Earth has had much higher temperatures and much higher CO2 levels and it did not lead to runaway temperatures. There is considerable evidence of a greening the size of North America that is due to the increased CO2 in the last few decades and the Earth is trying to rebalance itself. The environmental wackos called for the end of the Earth by the year 2000 back in the 90s and we're still here. No country sank under the seas. In 12 years, we'll still be here. We should prepare for what we know. Sea levels are rising. So far, five to eight inches in the last 120 years. Using worst case scenarios of 10 to 15 times that for the next 100 years is hysteria. Equally presumptive is the idea of man's ability to control climate as a sure thing. The prudent thing is to do is to prepare modestly for rising seas while the science is being sorted out. Crazies like AOC are removed from office for mental incompetence and perhaps other more reliable energy sources are found. This is really about money and social change for the worst by an anti-American socialist. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Lee Brokaw and I am speaking as a member of the ACLU. I've been working on being able to say that out loud since five o'clock this morning and just got a revised script that I am to read while I was sitting here. The ACLU of Northern California and your local chapter are in support of AB 516. AB 516 is designated to curtail poverty toes and unjust practice where people lose their cars and RVs because they cannot afford to pay parking tickets and when their vehicles are towed, cannot afford to get them back. Cars are a vital lifeline, don't go away. Cars are a vital lifeline that people depend on to get to work, pick up their kids and provide their families. For those who live in RVs, losing their vehicle means losing their home and contributes to homelessness. I have sent three things electronically, two things from the ACO copy and I urge you to not send the letter in opposition. Good afternoon, I'm Brett Garrett. I just want to speak strongly in favor of item six, the Green New Deal resolution. Um, it's been 90 degrees in Anchorage. There's lightning near the North Pole. Um, things are getting bad and we as a city need to do all we can. I'm gonna keep my comments very short because I know you have a lot on your plates, but please support the Green New Deal and please anything you can do to strengthen it and make it more, especially the uh, social justice aspects of the Green New Deal, anything you can do to strengthen it would be great. Thank you. My name is Raphael. Um, I'm speaking uh, in opposition to item 17. Uh, uh, I'm uh, recommending this council uh, uh, support AB 5, uh, 516. Uh, not only should Santa Cruz be supporting, not condemning this bill, but we should be proactively following its sound principles as public policy. Uh, Poverty-related toes are not a tool our city needs to wield. According to uh, uh, information uh, collected by the Western Center on Law and Poverty, uh, uh, data from three diverse California municipalities showed that toes, towed vehicles are usually sold for at least $2,000 less than the towing, storage, and lien fees that have accrued. Santa Cruz should not be enforcing money losing, often unconstitutional policies to punish the most vulnerable members of our community when they're already down on their luck. Po poverty related toes drive people into debt, impact low income workers' ability to re retain or seek employment, make it harder for people to move off of public assistance, make it harder for people to access public benefits, reduce access to education, and limit housing opportunities. Of course, poverty related toes also significantly affect those who live in their vehicles. Uh, this report I mentioned uh, notes a recent study by the Economic Roundtable in Los Angeles found that although one third of all homeless people live in their vehicles,
vehicles. Only one sixth of people who are homeless or for over a year live in their vehicles. In other words, after a year of homelessness, an individual was, sig was significantly more likely to be living in a tent than in a vehicle. The report linked this trend to the frequency with which unsheltered people lose their vehicles due to debt debt collection and registration toes. Santa Cruz should be condoning policies that help lift people out of poverty and homelessness, not policies that push people into the streets at the taxpayer's expense. Um, this procedure removes two minutes of time for speech for every person on individual items, which is guaranteed by your rules of procedure. But the mayor has again unilaterally decided, first of all, to eliminate all staff presentations for the benefit of the public, indicating to me pretty clearly she doesn't want to hear from the public. If she's got problems with the agenda, I would encourage her to extend the session, you know, uh, you know, just, Get it together and have an additional council meeting if necessary. The fact of the matter is the public is the priority here and fair and honest discussion of these items is the priority here. We have how many items? Five, six, seven, 10, 17, 19, 20, and 21. These are individual items that have been pulled from the consent agenda properly and we, instead of getting to hear from staff or being given two minutes to speak on an item, everyone is being shoved together, rushed through, and away we go with the latest decisions of the mayor. I would encourage that some member of this council respect the process that we're supposed to have here instead of supinely going along with this. With regard to the particular item that I came to speak on, and it was only one, it's really clear that the police department has presented no evidence that uh, you need to continue these severe parking restrictions that are in fact resulting in lots of conflict against homeless people and putting more people on the streets out of their vehicles. And it's, I think it was, uh, it's very articulately put by your, the previous speaker who has also sent you a letter on this item and I would encourage you not to disgrace yourselves by signing on to this if you have any respect for the rights of homeless people and poor people with vehicles and renters. I mean, people who just do not have the money to pay this kind of stuff. Thank you. Hello, I'm Susan Cavalieri. I would... Um, urge you to support the Green New Deal um, and let the Congress know the, that you are in favor of it. We are currently facing a uh, very severe situation with fires in the Arctic Circle, which cause um, feedback loops of dark soot falling on the ice, allowing the ice to absorb more of the heat from the sun. As the ice melts, the dark water absorbs more heat. We have um, a, a situation that's becoming a, a uh, situation where we are going to lose our future. And we have to act now if we're going to have any, um, any kind of a life for our children. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Carol Long and I represent the planning committee of the Santa Cruz Climate Action Network, which has an email list of about a thousand and reaches many more. I just want to read <clears throat> one of those copies. You can go, you can go ahead and pause your time. We urge all city council members to come together to support the Green New Deal resolution presented by Drew Gover at today's meeting. The aims of the Green New Deal that he is <clears throat> proposing is to craft a resolution that would endorse the Green New Deal on the national level to help guide our future policies in order to better our government, decrease our reliance on fossil fuels while simultaneously creating green new jobs to help those of us to help us in those endeavors. 
The resolution would support climate mitigation, which means preventing climate change through a social justice lens by prioritizing the security of our most vulnerable commun communities. This is from Drew's newsletter. Drew aims to implement these goals at the local level by achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions through a just transition for all community members. He wants to protect and preserve our city in a manner that provides everyone equal access to nature. He wants to restore and redeem marginalized and indigenous communities of Santa Cruz that have been severely affected by historical oppression. He also wants to ensure economic security by creating high wage green new jobs that will enable this transition to happen. The local resolution would endorse U.S. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez Green New Deal, and the, which is in the House, uh, and the uh, Senate Resolution 109 by Senator Ed Markey, drawing in local community members and leaders to help create our local version of a Green New Deal. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. We have one more speaker before, go ahead. I'm here to express strong support for the Green New Deal resolution. It fits wonderfully with the mayor's health in all policies because that's what it's about. There will be no health if we, in the future if we don't address this issue. And it addresses various um, people problems, employment, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really the only way forward. What's rather sad is that um, a lot of the city staff seem to believe the only way forward is business as usual. But cities, countries around the world are demonstrating that they can turn in a totally green direction, set up all kinds, and people love it. First of all, the businesses say, oh, we're not quite sure. And then after a while, the businesses say, hey, this is attracting new business. This is what we want. So somehow we have to get the city staff to look at something different than business as usual and to realize that for any future, we have to look at a different future. Thank you. Hey, again. I'll just go ahead and pause the time here. Serge, are you speaking on behalf of a group here, or are you yeah. needing the full four minutes at this time? I'm not going to need the whole four minutes. Okay. So we'll go ahead and maybe give you three. Does that sound good you since you're give, requesting in advance? Are you okay you with the give two? give four, and I'm not going to use Okay. Why don't we do it? Go ahead and yeah. do that. I'll honor the acceptance. Okay. okay go ahead. Um, asking to the council to vote in opposition of AB 516. Uh, I went and talked to the assembly member Mark Stone's office on Friday, and he had originally voted for it before there was any issue of it. And then there was, there's lots of issue about it. There's lots of politics about it. And he went to the sheriff's office and said, do you guys have any issue with it? Sheriff's office said, it doesn't stop us from doing any of the abandonment towing that we want to be doing. Uh, I think the, the complication, the confusion is whether we're talking about abandoned vehicles or we're talking about homeless people's vehicles. Um, for abandoned things, the AB 516 gives exceptions. Anybody breaking a law, blocking a, a roadway, all of the things that we talk about for the dumping and the needle, the sewage, and all of those kind of things, those are still breaking the law kind of things and still towable things. But we're talking, the specifics is about poor people who can't pay their tickets, and if we tow their car and then charge them, put a lien on it to tow their car, well, we're talking hundreds and hundreds, and we're getting up to 500 and 1,000, but then they're gonna be in our shelter system, or they're just gonna be wandering the streets and stuff because we have a very limited shelter system. So I'm not saying anything about okay to criminal behavior. I'm saying find other ways to do it other than money. We've already, California's already voted against cash for bail. We've already voted against taking people's driver's license for needing tickets. To make it more of a money thing, makes it they, they can't fix it, and we're just gonna have to deal with them in a different way. Thanks. Good afternoon, I'm Scott Graham. Um, I would like you to sign on to the new Green New Deal and direct the city manager and all department heads to 
uh, come up with a plan to implement it. Um, as far as the two uh, Caterpillar devices you're going to purchase, I would also like you to send a letter to the Caterpillar company and telling them to stop harassing local cafes that have the word cat in the title of their, uh, you know, if you're gonna buy something from them, you should tell them you don't like their harassment of our local cafes. Um, <clears throat> As far as uh, number 17 goes, I think you should be in support of this resolution instead of opposing it. Um, you should support the uh, AB 516 because it's, it's basically stealing. It's like authorizing the government to steal people's property and to force people, you know, people that live in their vehicles end up losing their vehicles. Oftentimes they can, can not collect the money fast enough. And as the impound fees grow daily, they're just continually getting behind on the amount of money they need to raise in order to get their vehicle back. I had a friend one time that had a, he was a silversmith. He had all of his equipment in his van it got towed for non-payment of tickets, and by the time he got his van back, all of his silversmithing equipment was gone. And even though he tried to file charges against the tow yard, they claimed they had nothing to do with it, and it went nowhere. Um, so I think stop stealing people's vehicles. All right. So I'm not seeing any other members of the community interested in addressing the council at this time. Again, we're on our consent agenda. We have items 6, 10, 17, 19, 20, and 21 polled. We're gonna go ahead and uh, pause council action on those items until after our conclusion of our afternoon agenda and then revisit them, at which time we won't take any public comment. Mr. Dettel, we'll go ahead and have, did you have a? Yeah, I just had one comment. We have some representatives from uh, Enterprise here off for item 21. So if there's a question that would be directed to them, if we could get that answered and they could then take off, um, that would be great. And we can ha have the discussion about that later. Otherwise I can answer the questions if it's directed to the, to the department. I would um, just sort of encourage our council if they have any specific questions, um, for general practice to get those answered in advance. Um, for today's purposes, in the interest of time, if there's any short questions, we'll go ahead and have maybe another few minutes for questions, but then we need to move on to our agenda as we have a very full agenda. Did you have a short question, Councilor McGovern? Yeah, I pulled 21. Um, uh, it gets back to, and this would make more sense if we were going chronologically through the uh, agenda since we're about to discuss the endorsement of the Green New Deal, but we have two purchases of tractors and then uh, this open-end lease. So my main question was, are the vehicles that we're getting through the open-end lease electric, fusion, flex vehicles, or fossil fuel burning? It could be all three. We have a lot of flexibility on that, and so it really, I, I can deal with that, but the, the lease allows us to have that flexibility and it's an open end, so if we secure a vehicle, it's a five-year term, but we can shorten that. If a newer vehicle comes up, that makes it more effective for us to do that, mm -hmm. and we have that opportunity. So that this provides us that flexibility instead of purchasing those vehicles outright. Right, that's, that's fantastic. And then do we have any guidelines uh, on the uh, preferential or prioritization of electric or flex fuel vehicles uh, in the that would be a department that we could we could talk about that I don't think that's an inner that's not a contract issue so right well I'm just I mean I just want to make sure that if we're going and getting into a contract that there are clear stipulations within the departments that we're going to be structuring a primary focus on using electric and non fossil fuel burning vehicles and that's that was the main point and like I said it would make more sense if we had done number six first, and then we could talk about how our values play into the agreements that we have with car leasing companies and the acquisition of fossil fuel tractors, so. Right. No, I, I think all of these work in that direction. Um, the details can be worked out as we go forward, mm -hmm. but the, um, the purchase of the specific vehicles depends on the demand of the, of the department that's requesting it. Does it meet their needs? Are there charging capacity available? Does it have the range? Those type of questions, so. Mm -hmm. That's what we would evaluate. Okay, thank you. Uh, so then I'll just move. 
I guess reluctantly move item 21 uh, to do the contract. Second. Okay, motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. Councilmember Cohn? I'm just wondering, uh, uh, Mr. Dettel, if we could get a list of vehicles that could be, I mean, I'm not sure what the criteria are um, and how does that, happen and you know does enterprise say we have this number of vehicles that we could give you that are electric or that are even hybrid uh what is the the process that's what i'm not understanding and uh, and that's what my intent was with my email to you also just try try to figure out this process a little more and understand it from the council uh perspective given our endorsement or maybe of the green new deal today let me give you an example um Currently, I know there's interest in the hybrid in police interceptors. They currently aren't available to us and we won't be able to get them. Enterprise has access to those vehicles. We'll be able to bring them online sooner than, than we can. So that provides us that capability. Um, we have to provide the charging infrastructure in place at the PD so that we can accommodate that. But this is a tool that we can use to implement some of these, these vehicles and this technology faster than what we could do if we purchased it and then the technology changes and then we're behind the curve on that. So anyway, it allows us to stretch our dollars faster moving in that direction. Thank you, thank you for that. Thank you, Mayor. No problem, we have a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Matthews. Yes. Further discussion? Very quickly, this in a way mirrors some of the discussion we had at budget time about vehicle and fleet purchases and so forth. And um, it's my impression that we had some kind of a policy direction, maybe it's in our um, climate action plan that our intention was to move towards fuel efficient and alternative fuel uh, to the extent that those vehicles met the operational needs of, <laughs> of the department or so forth. I don't need to go into it now, but um, I think that's what you're looking for. As we make purchase and lease agreements, we always go to the most, whoops, fuel efficient, non-petroleum. Non, um, In our fleet policy. Yeah, right. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. Just had a quick question around the, the timeline of the contract. I was just wondering what the what that timeline is going to be, because I would imagine that right now it would likely be easier to get and to go along with this lease agreement so we can get some of these hybrids online. But later down the road, it might be more beneficial for us to purchase vehicles as they become cheaper. So I was just curious what the timeline on this contract. We have the flexibility. It's an annual contract that we can continue to, con to, um, to extend if we want. And so that gives us the flexibility. Um, they also have the capability of taking these vehicles back and selling them at a higher value, then we can sell them when we, when we take them back and provide that towards the next lease. So I think it's, it's definitely a, a better way for us to leverage our, our dollars. Thank you. Okay, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, postpone action on item 6, 10, 17, 19, 20 until after our um, afternoon agenda. And if uh, time will do it then, if not, we'll uh, go ahead and ha handle those in the evening. So we're gonna move on to item number 24. And um, what is next is a uh, consent public hearing. And these are items 24 through 26 on our agenda. And I'm wondering if there are any council members who would like to pull the items, Councilmember Brown. 25, please. Okay, item number 25 is pulled by Councilmember Brown. Are there any um, comments on items 24 and 26 then at this time? Seeing none. Actually, can I make one quick comment? On item 24 or 26? On item 24. Sure. Uh, on my way here today, um, I just happened to talk to three people who, you know, asked me what was on the agenda and specifically mentioned each parking parking meter rates and asked why we were keeping them so low. I just had to say it, um, but I, I fully support moving ahead. But Thank you seemed to be the consensus on my street and heading to downtown from the east side. Thank you for that. And then um, we'll have an opportunity for uh, members of the community to speak to item number 25. And um, item number 24 and 26 will be acted on as one motion and one item, unless there is a member of the community who would like to see that separated. Okay. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and look for a motion for items number 24 and 26 and postpone uh, item 25 for further discretion. Councilmember Myers and then Councilmember Glover. 
So I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve items 24 and 26. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Meyer, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Is there any member of the community who would like to address us on item number 24 or 26 on our consent public hearing? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. At this time, we'll go ahead and revisit item number 25 on our consent uh, public hearing agenda. And I'll go ahead and ask our staff to um, provide some context in this uh, for this item. Is that our planning? Uh, there isn't usually for second reading. Oh, okay. It's a consent, uh, uh, yeah. Is, okay. So, it's if there so are, then if, if there Councilor are Brown has any questions for staff, I guess at this time, would that? Correct. Well, um, I don't have any specific questions. We received some information about um, some additional uh, work that had been done to look at how other communities are handling these um, these ordinances, and um, so if there is if if staff wants to say anything about that, that for you know the benefit of the the council or, or members of the community, I'd welcome hearing about that. But I specifically wanted to revisit some of the language um, in the ordinance and um, provide some direction about um, perhaps returning at a future date to finalize this. I realize this is a second reading, um, but we've received a lot of information since that first reading. And, um, you know, so I think that it, it warrants a, a broader conversation. Um, it, given the time, um, you know, well, we'll see. We'll, we'll see how, how that goes. But if, if staff wants to say anything about um, any other ad additional information that you've provided to us or received, then go ahead and do that. If not, then I'd like to hear from the public and then I have some comments to make about uh, amendments. Okay. We'll go ahead and see if staff has any. Sure. Uh, Mike Ferry with planning. <clears throat> you did all receive a uh, memorandum from the city attorney's office dated the 13th? Okay. As long as you saw that all. Okay. Great. Well, why don't we go ahead then and turn it to public comment on this um, on this item. This is item number 25 of our consent public hearing. And I received a request from EMF Aware, and I believe that, uh, Satya, you'll be speaking as the representative of that organization. You're welcome to come forward, and we will have up to four minutes to address the council. Thank you. I, I want to put a document up on the... Can you wait a second? Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. Um, today, and I appreciate opening this, uh, continuing the discussion on this. I'm, I'm speaking today for the rights of the disabled. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking today for the rights of the disabled. This is, um, EMF is a, an, inv an invisible disability, um, electromagnetic radiation sickness. The, or the ordinance states, which is wonderful, that the proposed projects will be in compliance with the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's in the approvals and denials section. But as we've shared, this, this is, is meaningless if there's not a procedure by which people who are affected by this um, this uh, sensitivity or have no process to bring that forward. So we've proposed a process. Uh, it's in um, a prior, 30 day prior notification process within thousand foot distance, which is the distance the signals travel and actually they travel further than that. So um, ADA is a federal law which is not preempted by uh, the Telecom Act, and you, we've also sent you a, a legal um, decision on the FACE School, which, which upholds that. We've also sent you, talked to you about a preamble to the ordinance, which will give a, a more accurate representation of the city's desires, I understand it, to, to protect and promote the public health, safety, and community welfare, despite being prohibited from fully doing that by the FCC regulations. And by the way, the FCC regulations are a lower level of legislation than the ADA, which is a federal law. Um, 
So I have up on, on the overhead, the Americans with Disabilities Act does not include a list of recognized disabilities as is commonly thought. What it does include is a definition of what disability is, which is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities. Now, any of us who are um, impaired by electromagnetic radiation sensitivity know that there's a big list of life activities that are impaired by that sensitivity, which in, incidentally is not just from cell towers, it's from many sources, <coughs> including in this room. <laughs> many of us couldn't be here today. A lot of the people who wrote letters, 50 or more people wrote letters, couldn't be here today. Um, also, I wanna correct something that's been shared um, by the city attorney's office, that um, while the US Access Board has recognized that electromagnetic sensitivity can be disabling, the US Access Board is only, uh, only sets um, guidelines for public buildings. It's, it has nothing at all to do with ADA other than that. It does not, just because they have not said anything about specifics, and actually they have said some things about specifics, it, it's not what we're talking about here. It just gives more credibility to this di diagnosis, I will say, which has been recognized uh, medically. It's been recognized by the ADA. So another concern that I've uh, heard shared before is about the shot clocks. Now, I wrote to Mark Del Bianco, who is a telecom attorney, and I'm, I'm gonna give you this information again. I've shared it with you before. He also, um, he also created a summary and final, um, of the final FCC small cell order, which is very helpful. But he basically said that if the shot clocks are not met, um, no one has been sued over that. What perhaps could happen is sort of a slap on the hand, encouraging the city's to can talk more. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Just uh, want to warn the public that wearing your cell phone in your pocket, in your back pocket, can cause colorectal cancer. There's an increase in that. If you wear it in your front pocket, there's an increase in testicular cancer and sterilization. And if you wear it in your chest pocket, people are getting breast tumors and uh, tumors on your heart, which is unheard of. And also thyroid and brain tumors are uh, doubling or rising. Yes. So um, this is former chairman of the FCC, Tom Wheeler, promoting 5G. The United States will be the first country in the world to open up high band spectrum for 5G networks and applications. And that's damn important because it means that US companies will be the first out of the gate. We will be repeating the formula that made the United States the world leader in 4G. It's a simple formula. Lead the world in spectrum availability, encourage and, pro and protect innovation driving competition, and stay out of the way of technological development. Unlike some countries, we do not believe that we should spend the next couple of years studying what 5G should be or how it should operate and how to allocate spectrum based on those assumptions. Like the examples I gave earlier, the future has a way of inventing itself. Turning innovators loose is far preferable to expecting committees and regulators to define the future. We won't wait for the standards to be the first, to, to be first developed in the sometimes arduous standard setting process or in government led activity. Instead, we will make ample spectrum available and then rely on a private sector led process for producing technical standards best suited for those frequencies and use cases. Thank you. Okay, 
Thank you. All right, our next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Drew Lewis. Um, I know that there's been a lot of said on this subject and a lot of uh, people in the council have been struggling with uh, this issue. And I'd just like to point out amidst all this that um, right now where 5G has been turned on, people are getting nosebleeds, vomiting, headaches, uh, dead birds and bees are being found within 300 feet of the 5G towers that have been turned on. And in regards to Tom Wheeler's um, uh, statements uh, about being the world leader. Well, yes, we can be the world leader. We can be the world leader in dead birds, dead bees, <laughs> dead wildlife, and human cancers and birth defects. Thank you. Michael Archer, and uh, I'm EFF uh, sensitive. I can't turn on my cell phone without my face burning. I have to have it on speakerphone, and if, if I'm in the presence of it, you know, more than two minutes, my face begins to burn. If I'm next to a cell tower, my, my lips tingle. But I also want to, I just want to carry that on into something I found in just researching all the wireless and electronic industry is, is a product called tantalum. Tantalum is the most important element you've never heard of. It is increasingly important in the 21st century because it plays a large role in making personal electronic devices smaller and it naturally fights corrosion. As a capacitor, it is found in cell phones, DVD players, laptops, hard drives, and PlayStations. Essentially, almost every piece of home and industrial electronic equipment has it. And along with the increased demand of tantalum, tantalum comes a human price. Resources funded portions of the Second Congo War, the bloodiest conflict in, since World War II where 5.4 million lives were taken and where one third of the children are a part of the mining labor to get this. And this mining takes place in very few countries. Most is found in Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Congo excuse me. Areas known for issues related to conflict materials. Together they account for 60% of the global production of this. In response to the unethical support of these conflicts, the 2010 Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act was designed to stop the flow of conflict materials from countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo, but has been slow to have impact. Once more, what's more, once in power, Trump voiced a desire to repeal the parts. Okay, I'm done. And you're welcome to, you are done, but you're welcome to leave your comments with us and we can review them at this time. So we'll have our next speaker. Okay, well, I'm just, you know, bringing out the morals and ethics sure. of this upgrade at the expense. Okay, you're welcome to do that. Okay, next speaker. Hello, my name is Esther Francis and I'm speaking here out of personal experience with many of my friends with their sensitivities and the disability that they've experienced. I've also done extensive research on the internet from testimony from physicians and people who have looked into this that also correlates with what people have already been sharing. But I wanna add something else to this discussion, which is that the most vulnerable are the children and particularly the youngest children. And they can't articulate, they can't say a voice because they're not yet capable of that. Yet, because they're in the stage of development that they are, they're the most susceptible. And I wanna say something else, which is nothing here has looked into the cumulative effect in other words, not only is it that, not pro that we haven't had the proper research on this modality, but we haven't looked at it within the context of how it exists with all the other attacks on our immune system on our planet. We just can't look at things fragmented anymore. We, we're, we're a planetary people and everything affects everything and the commodification what is the value of having if you're sick and your dear ones are and your trees and your earth? So I, I ask, please look at the 
as many have said, the moral and the ethical uh, issues here that are so important. Tobacco was legal, slavery was legal. Legality is not the fact that's really underneath of this. It's like, what is really gonna be most beneficial for not only human beings, but the totality? Thanks for... Hello, my name's John T. Hickman. I'm, a, I'm an electrician and an acupuncturist. I understand about energy fields and I understand how they affect the body. And uh, believe me, you don't wanna be uh, exposed to this 24 seven. In 2010, I got diagnosed with leukemia and most of my, he and I had stage four, and most of my healing was um, building up my energy field um, that was broken down due to just, just regular 3G that we had then. Um, thank you. Oh, are you ex I'm gonna just go ahead and ask that if you, you, if you were, are you planning to be our last speaker, sir, in the front with the black shirt? We had somebody else here in line then. We'll go ahead and acknowledge that person oh. who's been waiting in line. Is, that's okay. If you wanna just let me know that you're planning on speaking, I'd be happy to acknowledge you and let you know at the end if you can't stand in line, that's totally appropriate. Is there any other member of the community who would like to address us besides this uh, woman here in the front? Okay, if, you could, if you're able and could please stand to my left. And when uh, we've concluded, we'll go ahead and have uh, the gentleman in the front speak last if that's appropriate. Okay, go ahead. You have up to two minutes. Hi, my name is Gloria. I've lived in Santa Cruz for 35 years. And so as far as city council goes, one could say I've seen them come and I've seen them go. And I want to um, thank Mayor Watkins for bringing up the issue of health and following a po get developing a policy on that. Um, so Verizon is gonna erect 80 new cell facilities in Santa Cruz County. And here locally, there are gonna be 40, well, they're proposing 40 small cell antennas per square mile. Okay, um, previous speakers have talked about the deleterious effects of 5G and even 4G and the rest of it. Cancer. Neurological disorders, including ADHD and ADD, heart disease, sterility, including permanent DNA damage, diabetes, tinnitus, headaches, insomnia. I wonder how many of you have grandchildren and children. I want you to please consider the seventh generation because there ain't gonna be no seventh generation if you go through with this. This is sterility. How would you like one of these outside your child's or your grandchild's bedroom? How would you like one outside your bedroom? What effect do you think that that might have? I urge you to consider your legacy, what you're gonna, what you're gonna leave behind when you go. What kind of a record, what kind of, what will you be known for? Thank you for protecting our health and the health of our children. Thank you. Good afternoon, City Council. Um, I don't know, it was probably about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago that I went to the Resource Center and heard Daphne speak about um, some of the uh, effects of the EMFs. And a few things, uh, I didn't know much about this at all, and I by no, mean an ex by no means an expert, but she said some startling things like that um, somehow this, these EMFs can go through the brain blood barrier, which then can cause issues with um, DNA and um, the resulting effects could be cancer or other neurological issues. That was very startling. And, um, and then just looking at 
our government and how sometimes um, studies have been done, and she did suggest that there were that um, that were then kind of um, buried for the public to, from the public, and. Um, and I think about tobacco and x-rays and all kinds of stuff that came down the pike. Being a kid in the 50s, 60s, you know, all kinds of pesticides and uh, exposures that were really um, very hard on people's health. So um, I would just ask you to do what you can to mitigate. Um, I know it's you're in a tough position, I get it, really tough, but whatever you can do to mitigate some of these, um, these regulations that are coming down the pike. Um, and um, that's it, be well. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi there, my name is Monica McGuire. I've lived in Santa Cruz County for 22 years. It's been a while since I've lived in this part of the county, so I haven't been to these meetings in the last eight years or so. But I have been a healthcare practitioner in Santa Cruz County for 22 years, as has my husband, who just did a an interview, uh, Dr. Carl Merritt, in order for you to get one of the nationwide experts, which he is, to help you understand some of what these people are saying, which is all perfectly true. It's what we've witnessed in healthcare offices for decades, that more and more people are building up electrosensitivity. It's as much as 10% of the population worldwide, according to a number of European experts, and that is absolutely, if not more true in this county where there are a lot of people that are very sensitive. This is known, an area known for that. This is very serious information and it is that there's been no precautionary principle with any of the money thrown at this issue. It's been, we gotta have it, we gotta do something on a monetary level, which is a let, let it go too far too long. And this is a huge issue that has a lot of deep information. And there are literally hundreds of healthcare practitioners like myself who could sit and explain enough to have your hair stand on end and give you the pause that everybody here is asking you to take. The pause is necessary for your children's future. It is absolutely true, as others have said here. We do not have an answer to the rising sterility, but we do know that it is in part caused by people carrying cell phones next to their gonads. That is a known. You can look it up along with thousands of other health facts that are terrifying. There is no reason for this city to hold back from doing what other cities have done to say, not in our backyard. That has been vilified. NIMBY is an idea that's vilified, that's insane. The idea of political leaders is to take that brave stance. Thank you. Please do. Hi, I'm beyond EMF sensitive, I'm de EMF disabled. And I wanna support what EMF aware is suggesting or asking for, notification prior to planning an application, spacing of the facilities, what's been asked for, eliminate the fees to protest, and ADA uh, accommodation. Um, those disabled have to be able to live in their homes and be able to leave their homes. Um, for business uh, to just to, to live, and there's already less and less places to go to get away from from um, what exists electromagnetically, and now this this particular plan wants to blanket every square inch of Earth. It's not acceptable. It has to stop now. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brett Garrett. I'm I'm a fairly techie person. I'm on my computer like all the time. I don't need to download a movie in 30 seconds or whatever it is. Nobody does. I just want to say we really don't need this extreme high speed that they're talking about. I read an an article where someone was doing a review. By the way, this is not telling me my time. Um, a review of the. Um, 
of a 5G system in New York, they were just going around town, walking around, trying to use it. And they were finding that, well, sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. They'd be close to a tower and it still wouldn't work. It was just without rhyme or reason where it worked or didn't work. Um, and it kind of gave me an insight on as to why they want so many towers. They just want, I mean, it, in order to work properly, it needs to be everywhere. It needs to be an incredibly dense network of uh, cell towers. Um, and that's what scares me. I mean, it's someone who's EMF sensitive, they might want to put three, three towers near their house. I mean, it's, and that might be a $645 fee for each one of those that they want to appeal. Um, I'm, I am concerned about the appeal fields, uh, fees. I believe Satya has brought this up. Um, and I hope something can be done so that if, if an individual has an appeal about a cell tower that they can bring their case to the planning commission at no cost to them. Um, these are people who often cannot do a lot of the work that other people would do because they can't be in the environments where the work is being done because there's too much EMF and to have it at home too is just beyond the pale. So I'm, I'm just very concerned about this issue. I, I think we need to care about people who have sensitivity and know that we may all have sensitivity that we don't know about. Um, I, th I, think, I think these signals, the low wavelengths are dangerous for all of us and I'm, I'm very concerned about it. Thank you. Before you get started, is there any other member of the community who would like to address us on this item besides the gentleman in the front? Okay, if you want, you're welcome to come around to my left and, and we'll acknowledge you or you first if you'd like. Hi, um, I'm Carmela Weintraub. I've been watching you guys on home TV and um, I was gonna come and then I wasn't gonna come because I'm not feeling well because I was awake until two o'clock in the morning because I have so many health issues that are related to being highly sensitive. And I know Elaine Aaron, who's from Stanford, PhD person, um, did all of her research on the highly sensitive person book that she wrote right here in our own little town. Um, so we have a huge population of highly sensitive people here. But I'm assuming that because you guys ran for office and you are now city council members that you have the well-being of your citizenry really high on your priority list. I'm assuming that for each and every one of you. Not only am I assuming it, uh, it but I'm really praying that you guys use your power, which you've always done here in Santa Cruz. We've always been at the forefront of dissent about these ridiculous things that have come through the culture over the years. But for my mind, to my mind, this is a life and death matter. It's like th these um, telecom people could come, like anybody else could come and say, we want to we want to pay you a fee to poison your water. We want to pay you a fee to let to have us allowed to put chemicals in your water on your plants. Uh, we can uh, pollute your air. This is electro pollution. They have no right to make money on putting electro pollution into our Santa Cruz air. We have beautiful clean air here and this is a, this is pollution and we're paying they're going to we're letting them go. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Graham. Um <clears throat> I, excuse me, I believe that the uh, city of, of Los Altos made it so that they can't put these uh, nodes in residential zones. And I would encourage you to pass a resolution doing the same thing, no nodes in residential zones and also uh, keeping them away from public facilities and parks. Um, Make it harder to put up a node than it is to open a marijuana shop. You know, it's like, this is ridiculous. Uh, my understanding from reading online, the only reason they want 5G is so that these 
high intensity games that are out there can be played on your phone. Right now you can stream movies and you, you know, you're with 4G and there's no buffering. But if you're playing War, World of Warcraft, your phone is gonna be buffering constantly. And so in order to alleviate this problem, they've come up with 5G. I mean, the computer industry right now is being driven by gaming. Every, every leap that they make is to satisfy the gaming industry because everything else has been taken care of. Rocket science has been taken care of. Uh, mo you know, streaming movies has been taken care of. It's the gaming industry that to get things smoother graphics, more realistic graphics, uh, more intense graphics, all that stuff is what's driving the computer industry and that's what's driving 5G. So, you know, these gamers can stay in their parents' basement and play on a hardware computer. They don't need to do it on their phones out in public. Thank you. And I believe um, you will be our last speaker if there's the what last one here. Okay. Hi, I'm Mark Lee. I've lived here 25 years. I live in Ben Lomond, California. Thank God we don't have 5G up in our neighborhood. I, wanted, I used to work in the tech industry and also for NASA at JPL. The people that worked in those, those labs around 5G uh, servers and generators for the Mars rover were wearing very protective equipment. And when they were, of course, working within 50 to 70 feet of these transformers, this whole revolution is being driven by money and politics and also security reasons, not so much by the gaming industry, but by the such security and intelligence agencies as NSA. They have a huge stake in the involvement and uh, in the evolution of 5G being uh, established throughout the country. They want to download personal data, <coughs> everything from uh, you know documents to uh, word, your uh, emails, that's our, they're concerned about security in the country. Regarding health, everyone has heard the various problems with the health uh, ramifications, including heart, lung, uh, testicular uh, cancers, and also palsy and nervous system deterioration. 5G goes through the system and actually starts eroding your neuro system. It's terrible, please think twice before adopting this, yeah, particularly in the residential areas. It's extremely dangerous. In Holland, they did a study of a 10 block area in the Netherlands uh, near uh, the capital in um, Amsterdam. Uh, when they turned on the, uh, the 5G transformers, birds started dropping out of the air. They started picking up hundreds and hundreds of blackbirds. They did autopsies and found that their, their hearts had exploded. What time is that? Please use your zoning and protect the public Thank health you. welfare. Your time um, is that. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. I'm just gonna go ahead and, I'm just gonna go ahead and acknowledge that you uh, with the lay will be our last speaker. Okay, go ahead, you have a Hi, question. my name is James Ewing. I've been a resident in this county for 25 years. I wasn't gonna speak, but I wasn't exactly hearing what I wanted to be heard. Oh, pardon me. I wa I've been a resident for 25 years. I wasn't going to speak, but I wasn't hearing what I wanted to have heard. Um, 5G wave wavelengths have been used by the U.S. military for more than 40 years. There's planning on 20,000. There's planning on 20,000 satellites with 5G <coughs> energy. Um, any three-phase street light, <clears throat> once someone gets up there, snap, 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 the street light is opened, the fixture is a quarter turn unscrewed, another one is put in, quarter turn, and that's 5G technology, whether it's gonna be used for information or as a weapon. That's all I have to say.
Hi, my name is Judy Rosella Myers, and I've been a resident of this county since the 70s. And I felt like that this was a safe haven for many reasons when I moved here from LA. And um, it's really sad for me to see a safe haven turned into a place that may become as intense and um, not healthy for individuals based on uh, the electronics that we need to have in our world, um, <coughs> that we think we need to have in our world, and the damage that it's doing for the insects, just for agriculture in our area is just so overwhelming to me. And uh, so many of my friends are electromagnetic sensitive. And I actually have a handout, which I'll give to her, that will hopefully um, educate people on the council and any other people that you might know about symptoms of the effects of wireless. Um, I personally was hit by a car in a crosswalk in front of Staff of Life, and I suspect that that person was distracted driving, or she would have seen me in that crosswalk. I was wearing bright red, and her eyes must have been off the road. So I feel very, very affected by the fact that people are distracted when they're driving. Right now, it's gonna be months for my healing, and I feel like that even regular media is acknowledging this because they're putting advertising right now up for electromagnetic protection with fabric and clothing on the... Your time is up. Okay. Okay, okay so we'll go ahead now and return it back to Council Action and Deliberation. <laughs> Councilmember Brown, I'll go ahead and look to you at this time. Oh, we went ahead and closed public comment. We'll go ahead, okay, we'll go ahead and pause. You'll have up to two minutes. You are our last speaker, and there will be no more public comment. It's my understanding nobody else wanted to address the council on this topic at this time. And you'll have up to two minutes. And then we'll go ahead and turn it to Councilmember Brown. Hi, I saw you Sunday in the health and all policies. Health and all policies requires that you not deploy these biologically harmful antennas everywhere in the public right of way. And to remind you that nobody has authorized 24 seven microwave radiation toxic trespass known to cause biological harm. We do not consent to violations of our health and privacy and constitutional rights. I gave you a copy Sunday of 5G apocalypse, the extinction event. It starts out, and it's very important to understand this. It's important to understand what the 5G is doing and what they say it's doing. We're told that on the IEEE beam forming document that this took technology, cooks your eyes like eggs in World War II. We all need to understand these are military weapons these are assault frequencies. If you know nothing more than that, that's what you need to know. It's microwave radiation warfare. That's what it is. Santa Cruz needs to stand up, take a leading role, and join with others in stopping this 5G deployment. And we're looking to you to do that and to defend the rights of the people and of the beautiful environment of Santa Cruz. And thank you, please do not adopt any ordinance, say no, and do what you're supposed to do for the public. All right, Councilor Brown, do you want to make your comments that you alluded to were coming? <laughs> sure. Thank you. Um, so thank you to uh, folks who came and 
spoken with us. Thank you to those who have commented um, in writing, those of you who aren't able to be here. Um, we appreciate hearing from you. And, uh, you know, I think I've made comments in the past about my concerns, my um, dismay about the bind that we find ourselves in uh, due to the Telecom Act, the fe federal um, FCC rules, and the aggressive behavior of the telecom industry when local jurisdictions try to restrict um, this kind of technology. Um, and so I'm not going to repeat that. But um, I also want to thank staff for bringing us, you know, we're doing a lot of work. I know it took a, a lot of effort to bring us within the what you believe is in the bounds of our legal authority, uh, an ordinance that is, um, does have reference to the ADA. Um, so I really do appreciate all of this work. Um, that said, I think there's, um, having now had additional conversations um, with people who have been doing a lot of work on this, I think there is more we can do. And so I'd like to um, put it out there and, um, you know, see what my colleagues think about, um, in, so, so first of all, the, the preamble of our ordinance, um, is, I believe, um, mm, misleading, let's just say. And I don't, this is not, no um, judgment here about the intentions of our, our um, the city and our staff in, in including this, but I think we need to call it out. And so I'm gonna um, suggest that we make some changes to the preamble of our ordinance. So this is um, for anybody who's following along and has access to the documents for ordinance number 2019-11, chapter 15.38.010, the purpose and intent of this ordinance, it is not to protect and promote public health, safety, and community welfare. Um, it's just not. And um, I think that we've heard a lot about that We've all, we're also aware that we're not allowed to restrict based upon um, health, but I don't think that we ought to be saying that we're promoting health and welfare. So I'd really like to um, see that language changed. Um, we have received um, potential language for an alternative preamble, and um, I think everybody on the council has it. Um, I believe staff has also received it. So um, rather than reading it here, um, unless my colleagues would like for me to do that, I um, would say, you know, I'd like to just um, have a conversation about whether option one or option two, something that um, points to the reality of the situation um, be included in our preamble rather than um, what is currently there. Um, secondly, I think that the question of public notification and ability for, for people to request accommodation under um, the ADA is <coughs> critical, and I think that we um, there's more that we can do there. Um, so I have read the materials that we received from council, um, from our um, city attorney's office, about um, notification triggering our, the shot clocks that are um, that we find ourselves uh, needing to abide by, and um, I'm not convinced that 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 is the case. I think that we could require that notification um, to pe residents, um, pe property owners, residents, and I would add workers um, who are within a thousand feet of a uh, proposed location be notified and given 30 days opportunity to um, request accommodation um, before the application process and the shot clocks are triggered. I think that we can do that. And so I wanna propose that as well. Um, I think that we, you know, I have had in the past concerns about waiver of the appeal fees because of the question of um, that being discriminatory when we're not, when we have appeal fees for other kinds of um, projects and um, plan, planning um, development projects, et cetera. However, um, the case has been made pretty uh, clearly and convincingly to me that um, this is a different situation because this would be, because we don't have a public hearing, all other um, 
projects that get appealed to us have some kind of public process in advance, and this is the only situation where that would not be the case. And given that, I think it's really important that we consider waiving uh, the appeal fees in cases where um, residents uh, want to appeal the installation of one of these small cell facilities. So I think that those um, would be uh, some additional measures that could be taken to help ensure that the public has one, uh, is a, becomes aware, is made aware of where and when these things are, are being installed, um, have the opportunity to request accommodation and, um, and actually have that be meaningful rather than just saying that it's the case that um, ADA compliance is required. This gives people an opportunity to demand that, and I think they have the right to do that. So I'll leave it there for now and um, see what others uh, think, and um, hopefully we can move forward quickly. Mm -hmm. so, okay. <laughs> for Myers, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Council Member Glover. Okay, Council Member Myers, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Council Member Glover. Yeah, I'm supportive of um, making sure we get this right. Um, Tony, uh, 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 Mr. Condotti, I, uh, there was a recent court, there was a recent uh, federal court order that court, a judgment that just came out, it looks like last week. Um, it was done with, through Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, and in the ruling, um, the petitioners won. Um, and my read of the, read of the ruling was that, um, the ruling basically says the FCCC did not um, follow NEPA in doing the environmental um, impacts. So my That's question right. for you is, how can we provide an ordinance when we haven't really followed even the federal statute around um, environmental review and, and impacts, and now we have a court, a court decision that says yes, um, that was our arbitrary and capricious. So I'll stop with my lawyering speech. <laughs> yes, question and, for you. And, and um, a good question. We've looked at the case and, um, and others on my team can address this probably in more detail than I can. But in general, uh, it's my understanding that the reason why NEPA was implicated in that case is that it, that it involved tribal lands. Federal lands, right. Yeah. Right. And so it's there's not the same. Uh, so the this, so here. we're so the FCC basically um, now could this be brought into general public health? So I guess what I'm trying to figure out is we seem to have pretty well documented public health impacts. So well, how do we how do we do the right thing in that we are introducing a technology that that could potentially cause harm to our residents because the federal government is basically forcing us to. <laughs> I, I wish I had a, a better answer to that question, but as, as we've said on many occasions, um, one of the FCC's rules that have been applicable long before the most recent small cell wireless order was issued back uh, in last, last fall is that the city cannot take into account potential health effects of EMF radiation in, in deciding on the location of cell tower facilities. Um, you know, that's, that's not a popular uh, opinion, but that's what the law says. Um, we've looked at that um, <coughs> DC circuit case, and we've also conferred with the attorneys that are um, working with Portland and other cities and challenging the FCC order in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and they agree with our assessment that that the DC Circuit case has really no bearing on our ability to regulate or the FCC or the implementation of the FCC's order. There are some aspects of the FCC's order that the court in the DC Circuit case did um, say. Um, Need, uh, were inadequate, uh, and and one was uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, I think, and um, and NEPA. Um, but the order remains in effect in the D.C. Circuit too, and they basically referred it back to the FCC to address the the concerns that they or the deficiencies that they found in that analysis. So. Um, like I said, I wish I had a better answer to the question. I, um, you know, I've been going to these hearings for 
25 years. And uh, the main concern people have with um, EMF radiation, or, or with cell towers is the EMF radiation um, and, and the aesthetics too. But the main concern is, radiation. is the, and legitimately, but um, you know, we're very constrained in, in how we can regulate that. And, and we have no, no way to, to use the California Environmental Quality Act to look at this as a review with, with for example, the, the um, cumulative outlay of 40 some odd towers. There's no, there's no review we could do under CEQA for this? I, I think that, that we do. Um, you know, the, the adoption of an ordinance, just like, an app, just like a development application, is, a, is an activity that can <coughs> trigger CEQA review? Um. You know, when we look, I think we've looked at these individually, but I'm just curious about the total array, cumulative, uh, and whether or not this could trigger CEQA. Yeah, they, they can CEQA. come in with one application at a time. That's typically exempt from CEQA review. If they came in with 40, probably it wouldn't be. said if they came in with 40 applications at one time, we would probably look at that a little differently. And there's nothing we can do with, for example, any kind of, I mean, if we got an application for, you know, a subdivision of 40 houses, we could, we would be doing environmental review. Is there any way to project? I'm, I'm just literally being creative here. Um, I, I do support Council Member Brown's um, uh, amendments, and I, uh, I just want everyone to know in the audience here, um, I don't know that really anyone here in the city, whether it's our attorney or anyone really is wanting to do and, and support this ordinance. We are in a very difficult position and we are trying to um, create as much protections for our residents as possible. So um, yeah, just being creative, but I, I certainly um, support the amendments. <coughs> uh, Mayor Watkins, Member of the City Council, I'm Josh Spanger, civil, uh, Senior Civil Engineer. I just pointed out to Mike here that um, there is, in the application, there is an in initial CEQA assessment that is required, and the city can determine uh, whether it needs to go through a CEQA process or not. It doesn't talk about the cumulative effect at all. I mean, that's not, that's not that, but there is an initial uh, CEQA requirement. Vice Mayor Cummings and Councilmember Glover. Yeah, I just want to um, share the sentiments that were expressed by Councilmember Brown. I did think it was important, though, that um, because the public doesn't have access to the options that were laid out, I just wanted to read one of them because I think just even the first one kind of captures what both of them are trying to express. Um, but in terms of the preamble for the purpose and intent, uh, one of the options that have been provided states that the city ordinances should protect the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Normally, the preamble of an ordinance includes the following statement. These regulations are designed to protect and promote public health, safety, and community welfare. Due to Section 704 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 and subsequent court decisions, the city is prevented from taking into consideration the health effects, safety, and welfare of the community when adopting ordinances regarding the location of small cell antennas. Therefore, and I add the little sentence, the city cannot guarantee that this ordinance protects the health, safety, and welfare of the community. And I think it's really important that we are transparent and clear when we're when this ordinance is passed that um, the people of Santa Cruz understand that there are restrictions that are inhibiting us from preventing this technology from coming in, from doing these health and safety reviews, but that we as a city council are very much concerned about this and that we are trying to do everything in our power to make sure that we can have uh, the most restrictive ordinance possible within the legal guidelines and federal framework. Thank you. Councilmember Glover. Um, so there was a lot that was given by Councilmember Brown as far as suggested edits. Is there a place where that's noted so that we can review them before we vote on them? I'll just maybe go ahead just to offer so that we can move our conversation along. If Councilmember Brown is interested in making her suggestions into a motion, we can then move it forward with the purposes of, of finding consensus. Mr. Condotti? Yes. Um, I just want to raise one issue is that some of the comments that have been received by members of the public, and I, I believe some of the comments that that uh, were made by Council Member Brown addressed issues that were um, 
at the, that were decided by the council in adopting the guidelines that you approved at the, gen, at the June 25th meeting. And so to the extent that um, the council would like to modify those aspects of um, the guidelines, the direction would be to return to the council at a future meeting with modifications. Otherwise, the action that you could take today or not would be with respect to the ordinances that are, uh, so with respect to the language of the ordinances that are before you. Okay. Okay. So, um, thank you for that clarification, and I believe that was included in our memo. So I'll try to address the motion to the appropriate um, documents as I move through this. So first I would move uh, that we direct staff to um, return to the council with, and, and I'll add, before I put a date on that, I'll ask the staff after we get through this to suggest when that might come back to us. Um, so um, to uh, return with an amended ordinance that includes the uh, change to the purpose intent. This is within the, do the ordinance document that is before us today um, related to the purpose and intent. And we, is, can we not get it up? Um, it, we're working on putting it up. Um, <laughs> it's basically what um, Vice Mayor Cummings read. Um, and I no longer have it in front of me because it's going up. I'll just go ahead and say um, this is related to the, the fact that, um, that we cannot guarantee that um, the, this ordinance, the city cannot guarantee this ordinance um, protects the health, safety, and welfare of the community. So um, got it? You don't need this anymore. Great. So it'll be up um, in a moment. So that with that language that staff returned to us with an amended ordinance, including that, then with respect to the, this would be with respect to the guidelines that, that we staff return um, to, um, hold on one moment, to include um, public notification for accommodation that um, provides 30 days notice to um, property owners, residents, and, and workers within 100 feet of a proposed small cell facility. For a thousand, thousand feet. Excuse me, thousand, thousand feet. Oh, did I not say that? I'm, I'm in, a thousand feet was going through my mind. 1,000 <laughs> feet, sorry. <laughs> 1,000 feet of the proposed small cell antenna um, of their right to submit a request for accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Second. And, but, well, there's one last thing, sorry, before you say yeah, jump on done, yeah. um, <laughs> And that um, uh, in terms of the, the procedures that uh, in the language that uh, appeal fees be, uh, be waived for appeals of small cell antenna installations. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Further comments? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was just uh, curious, maybe City Attorney Condotti could answer this. Uh, with regards to the content that's listed on the application, I know that there was a request to have that specific requirement, the uh, 30 days prior to permit application submittal, the applicant shall provide notices. Is, is this the time to note where that goes on the application and have it be visible on the bottom portion of the application itself, or is that a future conversation? Because I know there's the draft that's out with regards to what that uh, application would look like, but is there a way to get that language on the... I, I have to confess I'm not familiar with the application form that you're referring to, so I would... Okay. Um, this is uh, Deputy City Attorney Stephanie Hall. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I didn't hear that question. I actually wanted to respond to uh, the, the comment about the public notification being 30 days. Is that correct? I just did want to know, we still are subject to the shot clocks and city staff is concerned with meeting them. So if we give the 30 day notice, that's just going to you know reduce our window in meeting that shot clock. 
So um, thank you for for that. And uh, yes, I, I did understand that. And I, I believe that the, the memo that we received um, had that concern even with a 10-day a uh, notification. However, um, 10 days really isn't sufficient. I, I don't believe for um, that kind of, uh, you know, the, the documentation required for that kind of request for accommodation would probably be take some time and 10 days doesn't seem sufficient. One, two, um, I think there is a question and, and it, perhaps you could help us clarify. Um, there, it, for me, there is still a question in my mind about whether or not if this is done as a part of a pre-application process, the shot clock is triggered because my understanding is the shot clock is triggered by the application itself. So the FCC order says that pre-application requirements will trigger the shot clocks. And um, so they, they talk a lot about, you know, having voluntary requirements, you know, a voluntary neighborhood meeting, for example. That's why we called it voluntary, so that it wouldn't trigger the shot clock. Um, but any kind of requirement by the city would, would trigger it. That said, um, I'm also aware that no jurisdiction has been um, uh, pursued for non-compliance with the shot clock. So I'm hoping that we can um, acknowledge it's a concern and um, you know try to do our best to meet the shot clock deadlines, timelines, while giving people this kind of um, protection. Thank you. Uh, and so yeah, just, well, just perhaps if you could repeat your question. I'll just so to reiterate, that yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there is, a, and I noticed that it's not in the agenda packet, but there is the, there's a draft of what the application looks like with regards to small cell wireless. Uh, someone brought it to me and showed it to me the other day. It was from us. Um, and I didn't know if this was the time now to make sure that this listing of the requirement of the outreach be noted on the draft physically, if it's not already. Well, part of the intent was to um, take the take the application itself, the, the work that goes into that off of your guys' plates. So with the ordinance, basically um, it says that the director of public works can modify that that um, form as, as needed. So I'm not really sure which form you're, you're talking about because we've looked at a couple, you know, so. Um, that's correct, though. It's just a draft, and uh, Director of Public Works will be able to um, edit it. Right. So then would it be appropriate then in this portion of the agenda to then give direction to make sure that there's a certain language that's included in that application that is at the discretion of the um, of the Director of Public Works? And then also there's a question of some of the language in the uh, actual language that's supposed to go out for notification, so specifically in the line where they're uh, directing their comments to both the applicant and the public director or public works director. Um, there's a concern there because it's ideally a request for accommodations that they would be submitting to the public works director. And then um, there's a, there was some concern raised about the inclusion of private medical data to the service or to the applicant and why that's relevant for them to be providing their because the, the language reads, please direct your comments to both the applicant and the city of Santa Cruz director of public works. I'm sorry, that's in the application form right now, the uh, the draft one. Uh, again, we, we, that's okay. If it's not, yeah. we can deal with it later, I guess. Sure. But um, sure. it's just something that was brought up and is important uh, with regards to making sure that we are protecting people's information and that they're understanding that the, what we're asking for is their comments, but also specific needs for requests for accommodation as pertains to the ADA, because it's my understanding that the ADA circumvents any uh, policies that were put in place by the FCC. So if looking at ways that we can uh, push back against potential shot clock timelines or all this other kind of stuff is providing the accommodations for people that suffer from electrosensitivity. So I did want to respond to that comment about the ADA and uh, FCC order, Telecommunications Act. So I spoke, uh, we sp our office spoke with the attorney that uh, Mr. Condotti mentioned who wrote the brief for the case pending um, in the Ninth Circuit. And um, as we've talked about already, the Telecommunications Act is is the act, it's codified in 47 USC 332, which expressly prohibits cities from regulating based on our RF emissions. And we're not disputing that EMS is not a disability or that um, 
the ADA wouldn't apply here, but based on my conversation with that attorney, uh, the Telecommunications Act likely will supersede the ADA. And there's actually a federal court case, uh, Furstenberg versus City of Santa Fe, which addressed this issue. And it's a case from New Mexico, so it's not binding, but I think that a lot of the reasoning in the case could be illustrative to us. Uh, the court noted that the Telecommunications Act was enacted after the ADA, and so Congress presumably considered any conflicts with other current laws when passing it. Additionally, the RF preemption under the Telecommunications Act was a more specific pro provision rather than the general anti-discrimination provision in the ADA, and there's a fundamental tenet of statutory construction that a court should not construe a general statute to eviscerate a statute of, spe of specific effect. So under this standard, the broad language of the ADA prohibiting discrimination against the disabled cannot override the specific terms of the Telecommunications <laughs> Act with regard to regulating RF emissions. So I just, that's kind of where our analysis stands on that issue at this point. Thank you. I just have a housekeeping item. To the extent that the council would like to incorporate additional language into the ordinance, um, the recommendation would be that we pin down precisely what that language is should the council want to uh, introduce the ordinance for publication today so that we can bring it back for second reading along with um, the amended regulations and, and perhaps the issue that was just addressed by council member Glover with regard to the language of the notification that's provided on the application form. Okay, so that said, I think, um, Councilmember Crone had a comment, and then maybe we'll have uh, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Brown restate the motion. Um, just for the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and pause for a second. We have um, an item before us, item number 28, um, that will actually take place after we have our six month work plan offsite meeting uh, discussion, and then a revisiting of our previous council um, consent agenda items that weren't acted upon. Um, given sort of our tight timeline, I'm wondering if the council and the community would be um, supportive of moving that item to a future meeting and we can allow for uh, further discussion at that time. This is item number 28. It's the last item that's on our general business agenda and it's the Historic Preservation Commission recommendation on Water Street Bridge plaque. So is that something that the council would be interested in supporting? To postpone. To postpone that at this time. Uh, I would only be willing to postpone that if it was guaranteed to be on the next uh, city council agenda. Yeah, okay, we can have that on the next city council yeah. agenda. Okay. So for the members of the community that may be here to address the council on item number 28, our Historic Preservation Commission recommendation on the Water Street Bridge plaque, we're gonna go ahead and make, and maybe see if I can have a council member make a motion to do so. Right, the, make a recommendation. The, the recommended action would be a motion to continue the item to a date certain. Okay, go ahead and see that in there. Councilmember Matthews. I'll make that motion to continue to the next meeting. Okay. Second. Motion by Councilmember Matthews, seconded by uh, Councilmember Glover. We're gonna go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. We'll go ahead and hear that item at the next uh, council meeting agenda. Okay, so then we'll go ahead and return back to this item. And um, I believe that we had Councilmember Crone making comments and then we'll have um, Councilmember Matthews, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Brown. Yeah, um, I just had a question for the city attorney. Um, is it critical that we can't send this back and get another reading? Uh, you know, do we have to do that today? I mean, this is the second reading, but why don't we just, I'd rather see all the changes um, at the next meeting and then, you know, pass it. I don't think we're operating under any specific timelines here, so we could bring it back for introduction at the next meeting if that's the direction of the council. I think my other question had to do with CEQA, and I, I, I don't know if I understood what was said um, by uh, about, about that. You can can you do CEQA on a you know antenna by antenna uh, project, or do you have to have a, a bunch of them? It, it, was, it was confusing. I think it's it's. It, the practice has been to do it on a, on a per application basis. So they do, okay, yeah. thank you. Um, I'm wondering if, if maybe, 
if the council would entertain an idea of potentially having a subcommittee of council members work on some of these specifics with the city attorney's office and taking in sort of the input that we re received to really ensure that the next time we um, revisit this topic, we have a really well-informed uh, proposal. Um, I think that would help with sort of the introduction, reintroduction, and then modifications ongoing and allow us to really have a comprehensive and holistic approach that really allows us to optimize our abilities given our federal constraints. So that's just sort of a proposed concept for potential moving this forward. I don't know if our council would be supportive of that. Councilmember Matthews. Well, uh, I think we're pretty close as I get it. There's three issues. There's the preamble, there's uh, public notification um, uh, to request an accommodation and the appeal fee. Aren't those the three things we're talking about? I, I believe so. Is there any additional elements that we want? This, there was questions around the CEQA, questions that were raised by Councilmember Myers in regards to some of the other areas that we could look at. And I have one other question. And you have too. a question. Yeah. So Councilmember Brown? Oh, and I think, I mean, just given the the other items on our agenda for today um, and the fact that we've heard from one, at least one council member uh, preferring to see all of the changes um, kind of and have an opportunity to read them and digest them in advance, I, um, am, I'd be willing to go this route, I think, um, for the sake of the interest of time for today. Um, but um, so yeah, that, that, I guess that's all. I'll second that if that's part of the motion well, then. Or? Yeah, I guess I, so if, if, I, if I could just restate or reframe and restate <coughs> the motion. That'd be great. A little bit of a change here. Um, so um, I guess I would move that the council appoint a subcommittee uh, of two council members to work with city staff, with the city attorney's office um, and public works. So just city staff, um, appropriate city staff to um, return with an amended ordinance, um, including changes to the preamble, recognizing that the ordinance um, will not protect, cannot guarantee cannot guarantee protection of the health and safety and welfare of this community um, inclusion of uh, procedure for um, uh, so public notification for uh, people to request accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act um, and so notification to residents, <laughs> workers, property owners within 1,000 feet of proposed small cell antenna, um, their right to submit and re a request for accommodation under the ADA, that's the specific language, and uh, appeal of the, uh, or, or waiver of the appeal fees for appeals of small cell tower installations. And to return at uh, the, Council meeting, the first council meeting in September. Um, here we go. When uh, when people think that might be, um, I, I'd like to set a, a time certain uh, return date so that we don't lose track of this. Still second it. Okay. Does that? Did you get it? I know that maybe I, think, I um, went I off think track a little, but for the purposes of the process and time, unless this yeah, we think October probably. October is more realistic. Okay. I think that's, we have a, okay. So for the, pro, so as soon as possible, if it's the first than, meeting in October. Okay. So we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Um, I am supportive of that. I would like to propose that, you know, Councilmember Brown, you serve on that and we can identify a second person right now to expedite that <coughs> process if that's uh, supported by the council as well. Councilmember Crone. A friendly amendment, could um, Ms. Orion or um, one member of the group be able to join the subcommittee? Uh, my intention as a as a member of that subcommittee would be to include um, Ms. Orion and, and others in the conversation. All right, thanks, Mayor Cummings. I just also would like to ask that, and that, that the subcommittee takes into consideration the public notification to accommodate people with disabilities language that was presented to us today. Yes, okay. absolutely. It's, is there, is there I was just trying to be concise for the sake of time. Councilmember Matthews? Um, well, that subcommittee is um, morphing. I, I would actually prefer that the subcommittee be two or three council members drawing on the information that's been provided by the public. Um, that's a comment, but um, 
also on the request for accommodation, who does that accommodation go to? Does it go to the provider of the cell tower or to the city? That's what's not clear to me. Uh, I'm not sure either. I think that's something that the subcommittee could look, look at. That's a huge issue. That's a huge issue, yeah. For the ADA. For the ADA pieces, yeah. that's right. <coughs> So let's go ahead and um, have I that. Just interject a comment before the council takes action. Um, what I would request is that as part of that discussion, the council continue to um, explore the legal constraints that we've pointed out in our um, both in our comments today and in prior correspondence, um, which, um, you know, this is a policy decision for the city council. And so, um, you know, our job is A, to try to plot a legally defensible path forward right. within the constraints of the law, but B, also to support to the extent that we can the policy direction of the city council. Um, Great. I think meeting those objectives could be challenging under the direction that the council is heading in right now. Okay, so, um, okay. We'll go ahead and so we have a, a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Councilmember Glover. Councilmember Brown will be on that committee. How about if any council members are interested in serving on that committee or weighing in on areas they'd like to see addressed, they reach out to Councilmember Brown and we can go ahead and have you with the discretion if that's appropriate to form the committee of one, two or three council members. It's, it's fine with me if it's okay with my colleagues. Okay, yeah. is that okay with the colleagues? Okay, sounds good. So, Councilmember Matthews. And just one final question. So, I'm getting the impression from your comments that we have set you an impossible task. Is that correct? No, um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the path may be difficult for us to defend in court. Well, and I think my um, understanding was that the, you know, it was really an inclusive process to work with your office, work with the community and work within the confines and trying to figure out a legal best framework. of everything yeah. that we have. I yeah. mean, clearly we have, you know, constraints in this regard. Yeah. Does that seem accurate? So we'll do the best. Right, and Absolutely. my concern was just that we continue to um, have a voice in the discussion so that the council is fully aware of That's what right. we believe the, the legal path forward is. And, and the composition will allow, I think, include that. Right. That's the understanding. Okay. So you'll be part of that. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. That passes unanimously. Why don't we take a short transition uh, break and we'll go on to item number 27, and that's the City Council's six month work plan offsite meeting summary and next steps. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think basically we would figure All right. I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting back to order. And I will ask for you to um, stop your conversations as we have to get back to business. Okay. Oh, I could see how that would be. <laughs> I'm going to see if our council members want to come back and join us up here, and we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Brown. Um, and we'll go ahead and ask that if you have a conversation going, if you please go ahead and wrap that up. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and get started. So right now we're on item number 27 of our general business, and that item is City Council six-month work plan, offsite meeting summary, and next steps. And before us is um, our uh, great staff from the departments that will uh, be leading us in this discussion. And um, I'll just, for the interest of the community, let you know the process before we turn it over to our staff for the um, presentations, that we will have a presentation from our staff on the item. 
And we'll go ahead and ask council members at that time to ask any clarifying questions they may have of staff. We'll go ahead and open it up to the community for any uh, public input, and then we'll return back to the council for deliberation and action. So with that, we'll turn it right over to uh, Sarah and Ron. Good afternoon, Mayor Watkins, and members of council. How's that? Is that better? How are we now? Okay. Yeah, Ron Prince, Special Project Advisor for the City Manager's Office. Um, today, uh, Principal Planner Sarah Fleming and I will be presenting an overview of the recent uh, short-term planning session that we had back in June uh, 22nd. And um, it was a retreat uh, conducted by our facilitator, Nicole <coughs> Young, who was uh, not able to be with us uh, during the afternoon session today. So I'll be presenting uh, the PowerPoint that she prepared. And then uh, this is a two-part presentation, though. I'll be starting off, and then uh, Sarah will be finishing up with uh, some of the substantive advanced planning issues that uh, the council asked us to come back <coughs> and uh, present. So. Essentially, I, I just plan to move quickly through the, the PowerPoint, um, and it's a general overview of the day that we spent together, the council and, and city staff, and uh, it's to really, pretty much reiterate uh, the agreements uh, that we came to during that session and to give a, uh, a good overview of the work plan for the next six months. So some of the background behind this was back in uh, April. Uh, Council uh, directed staff to develop a, a work plan for the remainder of 2019 and to initiate an inclusive planning process to build a three-year strategic plan. To that end, the off-site uh, work plan meeting was held on the 22nd of June at the Regional 911 Center uh, with our facilitator, Nicole Young, from Optimal Solutions Consulting. Uh, she organized the meeting and walked us through the agenda for the day. Uh, <coughs> Prior to the meeting, uh, Nicole conducted one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with each council member, and based on these interviews uh, put together and co compiled uh, some themes that were the desired outcomes for the session. Uh, those themes were stronger communication and relationships among and between council members and staff, an agreement on priorities for a six-month work plan, including starting a three-year strategic planning development process, and then tools to guide future discussions and decisions about policy priorities and work plans. The meeting involved several group exercises. And exercise one was to create a collective vision for 50 years from now, what uh, the council would like to see, what their hopes were, and those themes are reflected here. There was about 15 themes that were discussed, and it was, uh, Somewhat of a whimsical exercise. You can see the graphic off to the right. Uh, everybody had a chance to express their vision in different ways, and it was just a, a way to actually produce some dialogue that suggested that we have some common uh, values and interests in the health of this community into the future. Um, exercise two was uh, developing some communication tools, and we had an open discussion about examples of each of the principles for effective communication as described in the rules of procedure uh, for conduct of city council business. Those nine principles uh, that are listed here right out of the, the, uh, the rules of procedure, and they actually, uh, we spent some time trying to um, give examples uh, of you know, what it meant to talk and um, discuss things uh, with these principles in mind. So that exercise lasted about uh, 25 to 30 minutes, and um, I won't go into each one of them, but it's, um, I think everybody agreed that that was an important uh, a list of nine principles that are important to follow. Uh, this discussion led then to the development of three agreements. The first one was to follow the model, uh, follow and model the principles during the day's discussions, continue to discuss and define what it means to follow the principles. Uh, it may look and sound different to, for each individual, and we actually went through some exercises to, to demonstrate that. And then staff uh, will arrange a facilitated conflict resolution session separate from the work planning session in an effort to move forward effectively as a governing body. <coughs> so that, these are the first three agreements of the day. And there were, like I said, there were several agreements. Um, essentially, we spent most of the morning talking about what we have in common and uh, 
uh, what we need to do to uh, uh, effectively or have effective governance uh, on into the future for the community. So that was that was the morning session. Um, the afternoon session spent on we spent time reviewing the staff's work plan for the next six months. Uh, we reviewed and revised the matrix of the current queue of key priorities and projects slated for July through December, and. Uh, this provided a structure for dialogue about current workload before adding new initiatives uh, to the queue. And there's an excerpt of that matrix uh, shown below there that just shows the, the headers across the top. Uh, the first one happens to say strategic planning and work plan update. Um, along the way, you can see that there's different milestones that are set up. Um, and just an FYI, I'm actually working right now with the Nicole Young uh, on a proposal to initiate a three-year uh, strategic planning process. So we're, it's all in draft form right now, but that's just an example of one of the things that we're getting traction on these things uh, right away. In the packet, you've got attachment one, which is the entire matrix of all the key projects that staff is working on currently. So that's, uh, that's the biggest part of uh, your agenda packet. It's the full matrix, uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the, the current queue um, uh, that was prepared by all the department heads, it's, um, when we went through it, we had a thorough discussion um, uh, with council and staff, and we updated items on the work plan, we gauged the feasibility of accomplishing key priorities uh, in the current queue, and then we determined whether and which time, whether and which time frames can or should be adjusted. The exception of the multiple large projects in the planning department queue, other departments felt that the matrix reflected a body of work that they can accomplish or make a lot of progress on within the next six months. And we'll talk more about the, the planning efforts, uh, why there is more on their plate than is manageable, and that's why we need to have this later discussion about uh, some, pr some priority setting. Um, so the next agreement that we had was to form an ad hoc, and that's actually a misnomer, it's not an ad hoc work group, it's really a volunteer group. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Vice Mayor and Laura Schmidt for volunteering, for the, to uh, develop a, uh, a process or rubric to include uh, alignment with pr uh, strategic priorities um, and external requirements, estimated costs, resources needing, funding available, and sources and t staff time, and the current workload and political readiness. And the idea is to develop this process that we could use as a guideline when we start adding and, and developing future major projects so we can get a good sense of what it really trans <coughs> translates to in terms of the level of effort. Um, and so, yeah, the three members of that volunteer group are Mayor Watkins, Vice Mayor Cummings, and Interim Assistant City Manager Laura Schmidt. And I believe Laura's already got a, a meeting scheduled uh, next week to begin that uh, volunteer process. During the afternoon session, a council heard a presentation by Council Member Crone, uh, and the, the presentation involved a, a draft strategic planning document centered on climate change, climate resilience, and climate action, shared by Council Member Crone, Council Member Brown, and Vice Mayor Cummings. It was developed based on discussions with community members prior to seeing the six-month work plan, which is understandable. That came uh, right before our retreat, the, the work plan matrix itself. So the attachment number two in your agenda packet is that, uh, that draft strategic planning document. And uh, initial feedback from other council members was that more time would be needed to review it before providing feedback, and that they observed that, that several priorities were already reflected in the, the new work plan. So next uh, agreement that popped up as a result of that discussion was to utilize the ideas and priorities referenced in the draft strategic planning document during the long, longer term strategic planning process scheduled to begin uh, this fall. It'll be here before you know it. The next exercise that we did was the facilitator conducted a, uh, a straw poll and the purpose was to get a better sense of the city council's priorities regarding the planning and community development department's advanced planning division. Current queue that all the, uh, almost all the city departments, uh, or the, that matrix that reflects their key projects, uh, like I said before, it's, there's a feeling that most of those target dates and milestones are feasible. Uh, the current queue reflects more work and required resources than feasible for the advanced planning division though, uh, certainly during that six month time frame. Some projects involving advanced planning division are mandated, time sensitive, require interdepartmental coordination, or were previously requested by the city council to, to return on a certain date. 
All advanced planning related projects on the current queue are still a priority, but timelines may need to be adjusted to ensure a realistic and feasible work plan. Poll process that uh, was conducted allowed council members to use dots to indicate six month priorities and it shows here the different dots that were used uh, and what they translated to in terms of a sense of uh, urgency. Uh, council members and staff agreed to review updated six month work plan in August uh, 2019, right now. That reflects the sessions discussion and the straw poll results. So that'll be coming up and we'll be talking that, about that in, in a few minutes in detail. Um, that's part of our post retreat follow up. Before we review uh, the advanced planning proposed work plan, uh, the retreat concluded with uh, these next steps. Uh, the, the key agreements that were summarized uh, at the very end of our retreat were that the facilitator would summarize notes from the work plan session, and those are included in your packet. I believe it's attachment three. Uh, ad hoc or actually volunteer work group will draft a rubric or template as a method to determine how to establish priorities for additional new projects. Staff will refine the six month work plan based on the city council's discussion and straw poll of priorities and bring it back to the city council in August for review and approval. And then staff will make arrangements for follow up conflict resolution sessions. And I believe the city manager's already got some uh, secured services of a, uh, a facilitator uh, slash mediator for that. And then the uh, facilitator, uh, Nicole Young, will develop a schedule for an inclusive planning process to build a three year strategic plan. And like I mentioned earlier, that's in process, um, uh, just a draft proposal. And that's gonna be vetted out through to the city council to decide if that's the public engagement part of that and, and the whole process uh, that the council feels comfortable with how to move forward with a three year planning process. Uh, for the second part of the presentation, I'd like to introduce uh, Sarah Fleming, who's the advanced planning, uh, the principal planner for the advanced planning division. And uh, she will present uh, all the, the post retreat work that uh, the planning department's been working on. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Pleasure to see you. I feel like it's been quite a long time. I'm used to seeing you every two weeks, so the, the summer break has got me all a tizzy. Uh, okay, so um, just quickly, I wanted to um, give you an overview of our division. So we are one of four divisions in the Department uh, of Planning, and uh, our team consists of myself, and I oversee two senior planners. You'll also hear me refer to them as project managers or PMs. And then we have one time uh, part-time temporary staff that is not a planning professional but is um, very talented in assisting us with research and data collection efforts. So in the prioritization session, there were 20 items that were ranked that were um, either uh, AP specific, planning specific, or that required significant advanced planning resources. So the list here is not all inclusive, but it does include things such as parking ordinance updates uh, in order to facilitate increased housing production, the rezoning of Ocean Street, picking that project back up again, uh, local coastal program updates. There are two of those that are in the hopper right now, one that's tied to our previous uh, a recent update of our general plan 2030, bringing it uh, into consistency with that as opposed to the 2005 uh, general plan, and then one related to uh, the Coastal Resilience Grant that we received from the Coastal Commission. Uh, uh, the rental housing data collection effort that we'll be talking about at our evening set, your evening session of council tonight, uh, a suite of ADU updates, both legislative and then uh, mandates, and then returning with things that um, we are, had committed to come back to council with from earlier in the year, and things of that nature. Uh, so 12 of those fall under the planning department or AP purview, nine of them are specifically advanced planning, and then um, the additional eight that Delta does require significant AP involvement along with other departments within the city. So what we did with the straw poll uh, data or information is I wanted to kind of weigh them out to get a sense of um, the value of each so that we could fairly rank um, the importance. And so the way that I did this exercise is I went through and I said anything with a green dot, let's assume that's three points, anything with a yellow dot is two points, and anything with a red dot is one point. And you'll remember from earlier in the presentation, the green dot was uh, indicative of things that needed to be taken care of right away within the six month period. The yellow dot was uh, indicative of of things that while important could extend past that time frame, and then a red dot was things that could go out further than that. So that's the reasoning behind the point system. 
So you'll see here the top items that came out. Um, essentially a tie was the rental housing data initiative and the transitional encampment project charter. Uh, the third item there is the suite of ADU related work, um, which again is everything from mandated legislative uh, requirements to updates to the fee structure to updates to um, parking requirements for single family homes in order to encourage more ADUs to um, returning with the uh, things related to um, affordability that we had talked about at the beginning of the year. Uh, an additional item that was added at at the uh, prioritization session was the community engagement effort on housing, uh, which uh, from what I've read in the documentation here was the Wise Democracy and Wisdom Council effort, uh, the interest in having a housing city council study session, and then uh, in our larger planning department, the Blue Beam electronic plan submittal and review. Those are the six items that came to the top. Additionally, on top of that, and the reason that I'm, I'm really here today is that I wanted to talk with your council about, is that while some of these items um, either were not ranked or did not make them to the top of the ranking, we do have a, a series of items here that are really time sensitive and that need to be undertaken currently. And so I want to chat with you a bit about how we make sure that we're addressing all the interests of council while also making sure that we're meeting our state mandated deadlines and, and other um, mandatory timeframes that we, we have to make sure that we, that we meet um, with the limited resources that we have. So um, the first one is the SB2 planning grant application. Uh, this is a Senate bill that uh, levies a transfer assessment essentially on real estate transfers of I believe it's something like $75 a piece. That money goes into a nice big pot that we can apply for planning grants from. And um, this essentially is approximately $310,000 of over-the-counter money that um, it, the, the application is not that challenging and essentially each jurisdiction is uh, guaranteed that funding if they submit a complete application. Uh, those applications are due uh, in November of this year, so that's something that we'll want to be really mindful of. Uh, if the council chooses not to apply for that, of course, that is your prerogative and we can replace that in the work plan that you'll see here with other things, but um, it is something that is, um, staff would encourage council to apply for that because it's essentially $310,000 uh, that we're guaranteed. Uh, the second is downtown plan updates. Um, there has been a series of non-conforming or, or not really non-conforming but uses that are going to sunset uh, in 2020 and we've extended this sunset uh, several times in recent years and, and the most current extension is until 2020 and I believe it's sometime in mid-2020. So. Um, Staff really would like to go ahead and have that dealt with and not extend it again. That would be another option that, that council could choose is to further extend that. I think the concern is that it provides uncertainty both for um, the people who <coughs> occupy those uses and are operating those uses as well as the community in terms of what those properties um, can be used for in the future. Uh, so that's one of the things that um, I have slated on one of our team members work plan for this year that we'll talk about momentarily. I mentioned earlier the two local coastal program updates, um, one of which is mandated by the end of 2020 because of the grant term, and the other one that um, frankly has really been um, kind of on the back burner since uh, the general plan, the new general plan update, and we really should um, get that dealt with, and it makes a lot of sense to do it at the same time as we're doing the uh, Coastal Commission grant because we will be going in and adding a new hazards element and updating a lot of our sea level rise policies. So it makes sense to go to the Coastal Commission once, go to Planning Commission once, you guys once, Coastal Commission once with that bigger package if possible. Uh, the next item on there is cannabis ordinance um, potential updates. Um, earlier this year, we had been given direction by your council to do two things. Uh, one is to look at uh, potential uh, best practices for on-site consumption of cannabis in existing cannabis businesses, and then the other one was uh, potential business license transfers. And so we have that slated to come back at the second meeting in September currently. And then I uh, just want to let you know, while it's not at the end of this year, we do have several state mandated annual reporting requirements that uh, are due in January. So we have uh, one to the Department of Finance that's due January 15th. Uh, we have one to the U.S. Census that is due 
usually due January 31st, and then we have a very large one that's due to HCD that will come to you in March, but that, they really, really changed the reporting requirements this last year, and that will start to pull resources from the AP team, um, at, probably in December, I would guess, as we're starting to pull the information on permits pulled and permits finaled this year. So what I've done here is I've split this in, so I have two project managers on the team, or we have two project managers on the team. So what I've done is I've split this into the yellow planner and the orange planner. <laughs> um, and so, I, You'll notice the yellow planner here has fewer items than the orange planner that you'll see shortly. The reason be behind that is because there's a different level of complexity in um, the various types of work. And I wanted to make sure that the work is done by the individual who is the expert, the content expert in the field. And so as an example here, you'll see with this planner, we have um, the rental housing data collection effort, uh, assuming that council this evening chooses to move, move forward with something there, um, she will be on that um, really as her primary focus through the end of the year. Additionally, she's our content expert on um, accessory dwelling units. And there's a pretty significant suite of legislative updates that I will expect will be signed by the governor, we'll know in September. Um, it, assuming he doesn't veto the things that are coming through, um, there'll be a suite of updates that'll come through with that. There's also, and I separated these two out for a reason, um, we had committed to the council to come back at the end of the year with the affordability review analysis that uh, we had talked to you about in February. Ideally, they'll go together. That said, I have them separate because since those are not mandated and the state ones are mandated and we need to have them in place by the beginning of the year because most of the laws require that they are effective January 1st of 2020, um, there's a chance that these other ones could go on a separate track. And so um, ideally, again, they may go together, but depending on the community outreach, uh, what council decides that they want to do with those items, they may end up extending or morphing a little bit more than the mandated legislative updates. And then um, we are going through a suite of approvals with the Coastal Commission uh, right now based on approvals that uh, your council had given us earlier this year to our general plan and LCP, some updates. And so those are now working their way through the Coastal Commission process. I don't expect that to take a ton of time, but again, you never know. Um, they are their own decision-making body. And so um, right now we have a tentative uh, deadline for the ADU parking changes that need to be approved by them for October, November. Um, and then you'll see the other ones on uh, the orange planners list here momentarily. So if you're looking at this planner, um, this is plenty of work for, frankly, I guess the next really four months because we're halfway through August uh, and you only have one meeting in December. And so taking into the consideration um, both the holiday season that comes at the end of the year too, I wanna be very mindful of that, that people are gone and that um, city closes to some degree. Um, I just wanna make sure that we are committing to something that is reasonable and that we're able to do and that we're able to meet um, our state mandated deadlines as well. So this would be my proposal for our first, for one of my two planners. So that would be the rental housing data collection effort, a suite of ADU updates, and then ensuring that the Coastal Commission approval for the parking changes is done this year, staying on top of that. So for Orange Planner, here are the items that I have. Um, so one of the items I guess that I did not put on the slide before um, that we had already committed to come back with is a Planning Commission Subcommittee City Council Review of Roles. This was an item that had been requested by the Planning Commission this spring, and we originally were going to bring it forward at the one of the June meetings, I don't remember which one, um, but due to scheduling conflicts, uh, the, the agendas were very long, we opted to go ahead and move that to uh, our next August meeting. So that will be coming, that is already drafted, already ready to go. Um, assuming that the council takes the staff for recommendation and doesn't have us do any additional work, that will be done as of August 27th. However, that said, if uh, council may have um, other opinions or other ways they want us to move forward and so then that would then impact the October, November, December that you're seeing through there in terms of what type of work that you'd like done on that. Below that you see the two cannabis items. Again, ideally they could go on the same track. That said, 
I like to separate things out. Um, I've, I've learned that sometimes some things are simpler than others, and I want to make sure that, um, again, I don't overcommit to something that, um, or assume that council will take a specific direction that potentially might change. So I have those separated out, but again, potentially they could move together. The only difference would be the business license transfers, so the cannabis item in orange uh, would not be required to go to planning commission. And so it would move on a slightly different track. So you would see the council first reading would come in November, and then the council first reading, assuming that council wanted us to move forward with some sort of on-site consumption ordinance that would also be required to have community outreach and go to planning commission. The earliest I believe we'd be able to be here for that would be December. And you have one meeting in December, so just be mindful of that. Okay, um, the next two are two uh, Coastal Commission approvals, one for the density bonus language and one for incorporation of the uh, local hazards mitigation plan into the general plan. Uh, again, these are tentative. I have a fairly certain um, direction from the Coastal Commission based on a conversation I had last week that we will be going in September on the density bonus item. Um, unfortunately, they had some, oh, and I forgot the co cultural resources maps down there too. There's three Coastal Commission ones. Um, unfortunately, um, there were some, because we haven't updated our um, general plan to be, cons or our LHMP, or I'm sorry, our LCP, this alphabet soup. We're gonna play bingo later. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the LCP, the way that we brought it forward to council is that it was tied to the general plan 2030, but our current LCP is not tied to general plan 2030. So we may have a little cleanup with you that we need to come back. That was an oversight on our part. We need may need to come back and just have you update uh, a the uh, authorizing resolution to take it to coastal to essentially say uh, general plan 2005. Um, so those, those two will be tentative. Um, we'll hear more from the Coastal Commission this month on if they need us to do that or not. So we're kind of in a holding pattern on those two. Again, not necessarily expecting that those two will take a lot of effort, but it really depends on what the Coastal Commission uh, staff ends up recommending to their approving body and if we need to write any rebuttals or anything like that. So. And then finally, uh, the downtown plan updates. Um, the planner who is uh, working on that, that uh, she is already the specialist on that and she's been looking into it and would be ready to go. Um, I don't, I wouldn't expect that we would be ready to have it completely to council by the end of the year. Um, there is a significant amount of outreach to the affected properties. And depending on um, what council decides they want to do with the SB2 grant, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, um, that may impact the scope of the downtown plan updates. Um, so that might change this timeline a little bit. But the idea would be that we would be do, able to do our outreach um, for a lot of these things, the ADUs, the cannabis stuff, the downtown plan updates in that kind of September through November area, and then be ready to be back before planning commission and then council with several things in that November and December timeframe. So that, those are the two um, planners that I have, the two resources that I have. This would be my proposal to uh, make sure that we're meeting all of our mandated deadlines, achieving and moving forward on goals that council indicated were important, um, and um, that we're able to do it in a time frame where we're, you know, I would much rather under promise and over deliver than tell you guys that we can be here with something that we, that we can't do. So that is why I'm proposing uh, everything to be done this way. Uh, then finally, I will work on uh, two additional things. So I will um, be coming forward to council in October or, no or November with several options for um, a proposal for the SB2 grant. Um, we're talking through right now with the Economic Development Department what we think might be successful in achieving um, a, a successful grant application, but we would really like direction from council on which of those projects to propose. So we're working on that now. Um, we have to have our package into them by the end of November. So we'll what you'll see from me in October uh, or maybe the first meeting in November, depending on the timing of uh, other agenda items, would be uh, three potential options, one of which would be uh, expanded uh, updates to the downtown plan. Um, but that's 
Another conversation for another time, but that could potentially impact the downtown plan uh, work timeline for the orange planner. Um, and so you'll see me there here in November with that. And then uh, I am a co-project manager on the Coastal Resilience uh, Grant item with Tiffany Wise West, our climate action manager. There are a series of deliverables um, that are mandated by the grant that we have to meet with that. So I will be working on that uh, through December 2020. And then obviously overseeing the team and reviewing reports and all of the things that come forward to uh, the council between now and the end of the year and ongoing. So with that, there were several non-AP division priority items um, or uh, priority items that had joint responsibility with our team. I've outlined these in the report. There's the transitional encampment project charter and community engagement effort that is currently underway, uh, being handled by the city manager's office. The um, Blue Beam electronic plan submittal and review, our uh, administrative team is working on moving that forward. And uh, housing city council study session, as I mentioned in the staff report, um, should council want the uh, AP team to move forward on that, we would need to have a discussion if that is before the end of the year on what other things would need to be prioritized given, given the resource constraints. There are existing presentations out there from the Housing Voices Outreach process which are readily available online. There's a lot of content online that might be helpful. That said, um, you know, we, we serve at the pleasure, we do, you know, we, our work is at the pleasure of the council. So if that is something you'd like us to do this year, then we should have a conversation about the, um, the trade-offs. Okay, so beyond 2019, I just really wanted to quickly kind of talk through, you will see as the fourth attachment in your package a uh, existing AP work plan. So this is the work plan that I had slated and um, ready to move forward before the prioritization effort happened. So you'll see in there, there are several things that were completed. Those are the items in gray in that packet that we did in this last calendar year. Uh, there's also a series of items that are kind of outstanding but are well un underway that are going to be moving forward. Um, into 2020, but they're they're underway, and you've seen those reflected in large part in this presentation. There's also um, several items that came out of the Housing Blueprint Subcommittee report implementation that were expected to begin at the second half of this last fiscal year, so starting in January, that because of uh, Council's reprioritization and interest in other efforts, um, we haven't been able to start. So I just want the council to um, know that those are still on the work plan, but they are not necessarily, unless they've been discussed here, the highest priority items. And um, on top of that, we have our core service items that um, we generally provide. So ordinance cleanups, things like slope, um, there's some slope ordinance stuff we need to clean up, uh, beekeeping ordinance, uh, or language that we'd really like to be able to update to facilitate that and make that um, an easier thing to do in our community. Uh, grant writing, there's a lot of core service responding to council and commission inquiries that um, do get pushed back or slowed up or right now. They're not, they're not necessarily the, um, we do our best obviously to respond to, to inquiries from the outside, but things that, uh, other things that we'd like to be doing more rapidly that are have been kind of pushed back. Um, also from our general plan 2030, there's about 350 implementation items in there, not all fully owned by planning, but many that planning is the lead or there's partnership on that um, we are not currently working on. Um, so that, again, something to think about. And so I would just, um, recommend that as council moves forward to uh, create your three-year work plan, that you would um, you know, stay in close contact with the planning department, myself, our director Butler, um, because we would love to find a way to work with you to ensure that those things are considered as well. So with that, I will turn it back over. Thank you, Sarah. So we only have two more slides left, I promise. Um, to recap, essentially, uh, Attachment one is, is the matrix that we've been talking about with the, this revised work plan. And on uh, the last page of that matrix is a legend <clears throat> that describes how each item is categorized. <clears throat> so it, the very last page shows, you know, that a W is, represents uh, the staff is actively working on the project. Uh, a C in the, uh, the monthly column <clears throat> is the recommended time frame coming back to council for action. And then we've got a couple other things, their planning commission, and we've also got uh, coastal commission. <clears throat> so there's some codes there that drop into the different monthly buckets. <clears throat> but the matrix sets forth clear direction for the city staff through the end of the calendar year 
and it's a really an important tool for us. Um, but so for today, uh, we had just the two recommendations that were represented on the cover sheet of your uh, agenda report, and that was uh, to receive this report on the outcomes of our uh, our six-month work plan offsite meeting, and uh, by motion provide direction on next steps uh, as appropriate. And then the second item was to, by motion, accept the proposed Advanced Planning Division six-month work plan. And uh, with that, that concludes our presentation. And uh, Mayor, I'll hand it back to you. All right. Well, thank you for the presentation and your hard work on all of this information. And to Nicole, who's unable to be here this evening or this afternoon to explain what uh, transpired since our um, study, se I mean, our um, special session. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and see if there's any questions from council members before we open up to public comment and then we'll return back for deliberation. And I believe council member Myers has a question. I have a question. Other questions, council member Matthews. <coughs> I just have a quick question on the, um, well, first of all, thank you for organizing all of this. Um, it's a huge amount of work. And uh, so I know you guys probably weren't on vacation in July based on all the material that you provided. Um, so thank you for organizing this. One of my struggles, I think, for the last six months is that I feel like our, our, uh, I feel like we have been a little bit all over the place. And so I really appreciate, I know I know things may change a little bit this afternoon, but I do appreciate seeing, seeing everything in one place. Um, I had a, a bit of a question about the, um, sort of the red, green, yellow dot uh, stuff. And, um, and I know without being there, kind of understanding what red, green, and yellow dots may be but I'm, I guess what I'm trying, so I, and I see later in the, in the document that some of these items will be referred to, for example, the, the cash, but in some of these um, situations, I, I'm not sure that the kind of the waiting um, exercise may be played out as clearly because I think when we were doing this, um, I don't know that we were thinking that these things would be weighted. And so, you know, one thing that pops out to me a little bit is, um, for example, um, you know, the, for example, I'll just take the transitional encampments. I think that's probably the one that, where you've got four reds and you got three greens and you got a yellow. So what does that mean, you know, in terms of the intent? I'm not saying that we need to, take that off per se, but I do think that um, as we talk through things today, we, sh we should remember sort of kind of, it, it was, wasn't a fully like developed process and I think some people decided not to put dots up. So again, um, I think it's just important for, for the public to know that, you know, there's a, there was a level of sort of casualness to this and uh, so I hope that we can continue to have these discussions up here today and, um, and just make note of that, uh, just specifically in terms of trying to understand how, how, we, were, how we were looking at things. Um, so I don't, I guess that's more of a comment than a question, but I don't know if you had any responses or you know, how those numbers played out at all. Sure, so I was not there. Um, so for me, this was the most logical way to try to quantify mm -hmm. the um, potentially somewhat nebulous dot exercise. Um, somebody voted twice on the transitional encampment project <laughs> charter, by the way, because there's eight dots. <laughs> Good point. But again, it was a very, um, open, from what I understand, a very open process. So this was how I decided to present the material. If council does not find that this is appropriate or would like it done another way, I am very, very open to that process. I just wanted to try to find a way to um, rank it so that I could make sense for my work plan. Great. Thank you. I just have a quick question and I'll see if other council members have questions as well. Um, and, and I hate to have you go back oh, on your fine. slides, but in terms of the items that you said where some of them are mandatory and others were prior council direction, mm -hmm. can you specify which ones are mandatory, this, this, this yes. slide, and which ones are not? Yes, so SB2 planning grant, is that deadline is mandatory if council does want us to move forward on that, okay? We do not have to, by the state, apply for that. And I, I have a question okay. on that. 
Well, then be, before we do, and then I'll just move it over to other. And then is the last also a mandatory yes, item? Yes, that and is everything. mandatory. Downtown plan updates, we have to do something by 2020. We either need to extend that deadline again, and I believe it's been at least two, if not three times extended already. Okay. Um, or go ahead and make the updates. So the two that aren't necessarily pressing, pressing are the local coastal plan and the cannabis ordinance updates, or is it just the cannabis ordinance? Uh, the local coastal plan, there's two updates on that. One is pressing, but that is, it will not take resources from the two planners on my team because I am the co-project manager on that. So, but we do have uh, deadlines to the Coastal Commission that we have to meet. Um, and so that pulls me from being able to do some other things. Uh, cannabis ordinance updates entirely up to the council, but we did commit to council to be back in September. So that's why that's on here. Uh, we, so we are currently working on that. And then, um, did I answer all the questions? Yeah, no, I just, yeah. I, I mean, you have time sensitive, mandated, or previously requested. Yeah. So just to be able to like categorize yes. it in my head yes. of what is truly mandated, some are time sensitive and others yeah. are kind of open. That's really helpful and clarifying. So thank you. My pleasure. So I see that Councilmember Matthews had a question. Councilmember Brown had a question. Councilmember Crone had a question. Basically, the planning matrices are so impressive. <laughs> <laughs> reminds us Thank once you. again how much is going in all the departments <laughs> and you guys just have everything on your plate. It's incredible. Um, I'm just going to make a few comments. I mean, I do we want to wait. Maybe we can hold off on comments okay, sure. and then we'll do questions. We'll open it up to the community and return okay. for comments. Does that sound good? Yes. At this time. Okay. So let me just see if I have questions. No, I'll wait. Okay. Any questions? Comes from Brown? Well, <coughs> it's, it's a, a question following up on, um, Council Member Myers' comment about the sticker dot exercise, um, because just and I understand you weren't there, um, and I really appreciate your efforts to make use of that um, the information from that exercise. Um, but my understanding about the red dots was those were placed on items that we that, that individual council members did not want yeah, to that was a negative proceed yeah. on so including them in the waiting is a little it, it, you know i don't know that it'll make a difference mm -hmm. in terms of the action we take today but i just wanted to, that so that i wasn't that was a clarifying that question. was what i recalled okay. too Deep got it okay <laughs> okay okay thanks just wanted to make sure i, I mean i was there but you know yeah, sometimes uh, i'm not always there all there a bunch of questions um <clears throat> Just going through this document, there's some things here I don't know about, like the downtown needs assessments, coordinated maintenance and beautification plan. That is not a planning item. I think that is, um, is that in the matrix that has the blue on the spreadsheet, the attachment? There's attachment one. Right, right, yeah. So that is more broader citywide. So I would defer to Ron on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have to defer to the department that that's associated yeah. with. So let, let me try to find that. And I have this here. Let's do this. Can, I can try to address it really quickly. So uh, this is uh, this is actually based on previous council direction um, with the previous council where uh, we were asked to really focus on drawing, trying to make some uh, beautification efforts in the downtown. Uh, largely, uh, a lot of it is sort of maintenance items, uh, painting the railings, uh, just updating some of the things that have gotten tired and worn. And so the economic development department is taking the lead and uh, they've done an assessment. They've walked all up and down and identified all the things that need to be, you know, kind of cleaned up or updated or painted. Uh, so that's what that's about. What's the EDA grant at UCSC Santa Cruz? What page is that one on? Uh, 11. This is not a planning item, so I'm not well versed enough to be able to spit. Well, here's Bonnie. Bonnie. Oh, <laughs> oh. Uh, Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development. That's a grant we applied for um, with UCSC and a number of partners. Um, and we applied for a, a few grants. That's one we've gotten initial feedback for to resubmit. Um, so we're, we take advantage of opportunities where we feel like we're a good fit to bring grant money into the community. And this is when we had a lot of support from the university as well. What, what is it hoping to do if, when, if you get uh, it? Right, the grant uh, specifically was looking at entrepreneurship opportunities and reinvestment in local businesses. And so we were um, looking with, um, and particularly looking at the university and they had some support with their startup sandbox and then with Santa Cruz Works. So we were trying to leverage uh, leverage that into bringing more funding in to incubate small businesses in Santa Cruz. 
Thank you. Um, the, on page five, there was revenue bond sale uh, implementation 350, 350 million 10 year CIP. What is that? That's the uh, water department's uh, uh, water infrastructure bonds, I believe. Yeah. Yes, that's the water departments. Right. Um, there was uh, just one more here. No, I think that that's all. Thanks. Okay. Did you have a question, Councilmember Clifford? <coughs> yeah. Um, thank you. So uh, all great information. Uh, it was a, it was a good opportunity to get an idea of all the things planning is doing. Um, I was curious. Uh, on the yellow planning sheet, I yes. think it was. Let's see here. The, the t yeah, that one. Um, the timeline for the rental housing data collection process. Uh, I know you all have a bunch of other stuff going on. It just uh, it seems like four and a half months to get it back out in front of um, the council is a long time for just establishing a concept. Um, not, I mean, I'm sure you're pulled in a million different directions. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm just curious in what, uh, are there some creative ways that the planning department is looking to try and um, get some of that work off of your principal senior planners and on to people that are a little bit, that don't, don't be quite as qualified to do some research and pull together some potential structures or look at contrasting cities like El Cerrito, I think, mm -hmm. and some of the other ones that are gonna come up this evening um, <clears throat> to, come up with the preparing of the concept and then even assisting with some of the outreach to speed up that process or allow your principal planners to be <laughs> focusing on some of the things that say community members or interns would not be available to do like the ADU language and stuff like that. Sure, so um, we'll talk a little bit more about the timeline of that this evening and why we feel that that is a um, reasonable timeline. I think potentially, we, and Sarah's probably watching this and is going to <laughs> shoot me for saying this, um, we could potentially be back to council in November. I don't think we would be able to do it any faster than that. Um, and the reason for that is that there's an extensive amount of community outreach that we're gonna wanna do for that particular topic. Um, you'll hear tonight that we will be talking about doing a series of focus groups, a couple of citywide community meetings. Given the tone and tenor of the conversations around everything rental housing right now, we really think that it's very important to do a deep dive with the community in terms of assuming, again, this is an assumption, assuming that council tonight directs us to go ahead and move forward with something close to the proposal that we put forward to you tonight. Um, those things take time to set up and to do properly. Um, I think we might be able to get back to you in November with a council check-in. I do understand the urgency behind it, absolutely. But again, I would much rather take the time to do it right. The time it takes to bake a pizza is the time it takes to make a pizza. You can take it out of the oven early, but it might not be that good, right? And I just wanna make sure that we're, and if we can over deliver, fabulous. But I would rather be really reasonable in terms of the time frame, and then come back early than tell you something and not be able to meet your expectations. Absolutely, and I totally appreciate that. The question though is, are there any creative problem solving or solutions being implemented that could take some of that smaller, less engaged work off of your principal planners and be placed onto, say, volunteers from the community, interns or staff or representatives that don't necessarily need quite as much professional training as your principal planners. So I know that there are a lot of people within the housing uh, rental world, I would imagine, that would be happy to donate their time to compare or draw things together, if that's mm -hmm. the kind of things that you're doing, just based off of the, the, the way you have it described now, each one of these headings may be completely different than what I'm imagining them based sure. off of the heading. But to prepare a concept would be, in my opinion, to gather information from other places and then put it together into a proposal that would then be used for outreach moving mm -hmm. forward. So, sure, sure. You know, could you use local housing advocate support in creating that process so that it wouldn't fall on your one of two principal planners. Sure, and so I think that obviously staff is open to all of these things. My concern would be um, that we really, and you'll hear this tonight when we make our presentation, we really as the city want to um, at least 
our staff, my team wants to do everything we can to be very neutral in that process. And we would welcome assistance from anybody who is open to giving it, but I also wanna be very pragmatic and diplomatic in making sure that it is I, I want us to be able to develop a data source that is trusted by everybody. And my, my concern is that if we start having outside input, especially in the formation of it, that the data will never be trusted. And, and I, want, I want us to get to a point where we're able to have a mutually trusted uh, conversation based on some data that we can all buy into. And so again, I am open and if you have suggestions and maybe as we talk about it a little later this evening, uh, you know, we can <coughs> maybe talk about if, how this changes or if we're able to do anything like that. But I would just be really hesitant because I want, I just really want our community to be able to come together around this, and I'm just so fearful that um, we just need to be very, very calculated in our approach in there, terms of making sure that's trusted. Maybe if I may, I think that um, for the purposes of this conversation, that we can have those in-depth conversations around this specific item this evening. Sure. And because I think that will absolutely influence the general kind of direction in the next several months. Yeah, it was more just a, with regard to the timeline that's anticipated here and if there's a way to either move resources for the more trained people into some of the more right. arduous mm -hmm. tasks and offset some of the volunteerism. But thank you for your input. I appreciate it and absolutely we can move forward. Okay. Unless there's any additional uh, questions, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment. Is there any member of the community who would like to address us on this item? Please come forward and you'll have up to two minutes. And I just want to note, am I acknowledging that you do want to address, okay, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm, no, I'm, sorry, I'm speaking to the gentleman in the left here, on my left here, who's sitting down just before I <laughs> fail to recognize that. Okay, please there, proceed. Uh, my name's Raphael. Um, and just to make sure you'll have up to two minutes, but we'll go ahead and see if the city clerk can do it. Thank you. Uh, so just uh, looking at the proposed plans, um, uh, as some of the council members noticed, uh, the, uh, the cannabis uh, work plan uh, is a plan that's uh, being implemented entirely at the direction of the city council. Um, I would suggest that maybe the council consider uh, substituting those planning programs with uh, other uh, programs that might be more high priority, such as uh, homelessness related policies uh, or planning around those. Um, Speaking personally as a, a member of the uh, Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, uh, I would personally like to be able to coordinate with uh, the planning department in uh, our, uh, our work. And the sooner that we could do that, the better, uh, especially considering that there are uh, uh, time constraints when it comes to uh, uh, state funding that's available. Um, I believe there's uh, there's a heap of money that's coming available uh, that hasn't been spent through the HAP process yet. Uh, that uh, you know that, that would be stuff that uh, would be uh, worthwhile to consider and to uh, worth be worthwhile uh, to coordinate with the planning department on if there are programs that um, the city council thought were uh, maybe more high priority when it came to uh, sort of the the human cost compared to something like a cannabis ordinance. Thank you. Okay. Is there any additional members of the community who would like to address us? Okay, you'll be our last speaker. Good afternoon, Scott Graham. Um, I would like to see the uh, ADU ordinances updated to reflect that uh, any units out there that are non-permitted now would be grandfathered in as long as they're safe and not a fire hazard. And uh, also that the uh, permit process be uh, brought in line with what's going on in the county where if people agree to keep these units at an affordable level that they don't have to pay the uh, the fees to, the permit fees to build a unit. Um, I would also like to see there an update to the uh, inclusionary housing element uh, that there's right now, 
uh, developers can pay an in lieu fee, which will not build a unit. So the in lieu fee used to, it needs to be raised to a, a level where it could build a unit and maybe even higher than the cost of building a unit. San Francisco, they haven't doubled the cost of building a unit. So if a developer doesn't want to have an inclusionary unit, the city will be able to build two units somewhere else. Um, the other thing which goes along with uh, what this last guy was talking about, uh, maybe doing something about homeless within the next six months, going along with uh, item 17, one of the things you could work on is a safe parking program. So that, you know, instead of having these vehicles that people are living in out on the street, there's a place for them to go where they're going to be safe, where there's going to be, you know, possible porta potties or something. Uh, thank you. Okay, we'll go ahead and return it back to council um, action and deliberation. The recommendation before us is to receive the report, which we have, and then by motion ex um, accept the proposed advanced planning division six month work plan. So that's sort of the parameters in which we are um, asked to consider the direction we're going in. Councilmember uh, Glover, and then Councilmember Matthews, and then Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so a lot of. Um, Great input from the community. I think something that's really telling and that I totally agree with uh, is the catch uh, and the ability for them to work with planning intentionally and freeing up some of the spaces. Uh, one of the things I know that the catch is looking into is transitional encampments, but a, a variety of other things with zoning and uh, parking space potentials, all those other kinds of things. So if feasible and possible, I'd love to hear from planning about the possibility of deprioritizing the cannabis ordinance, even though you were planning on coming back in September with it, and then re and prioritizing uh, solutions or at least tools for homelessness. Sure, so um, yes, we are open to taking whatever direction council would prefer on that. Those two um, would be good to swap um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, the cannabis items are not um, mandated, so we don't have mandated timelines. Um, the, the key commitment that we've made is um, to the industry that we would look at those things and to council that we would be back at that specific date. So those are really the two co commitments that we have. Additionally, um, Planner Orange is the the planner who um, I have slated to work with the catch on those ordinances. Yes, so she would be the content expert for that. So it would be a, a great swap if that is something that council was interested in doing. Okay. Then uh, I'd make the motion then that we would re we would deprioritize cannabis and replace it with uh, the analysis of the transitional encampment project planner to work with catch for a more expedited outcome. Okay, we have a motion by Councilmember Glover. Is there a second? Well, I have a question. Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember um, Myers. So in, in terms of, and, and I agree with the comments made by Mr. Sonnenfeld and Councilmember Glover about the importance of this item, I guess I'm wondering if given the timeline for the catch and the potential work that would be involved from advanced planning related to transitional encampments. Is that something that you think would be a one for one replacement? I also just wonder about the timeline because I wonder if we're going to get those kinds of recommendations from the catch like immediately. If I so, maybe if I may, before you respond, fingers. Sarah, um, the vice mayor and myself were at the first cash meeting mm -hmm. and um, just sort of welcoming them, but allowing them to do their work. So we stepped ourselves right. out of the conversation. Um, but my understanding was that there was an interest that, and this was related to the cash members, that if there were things that they could bring forward to the council um, right away in terms of policy recommendations prior to the conclusion of their um, time serving in this committee, that they would do so. So I think it was 
was sort of open in that that we had areas that we'd like to see action on sooner rather than later, and if and when they're prepared to do that, that that would come and take priority. So I think it's sort of to, to be determined, but definitely an area where we could bring and fit that in. Sure. Uh, so it, my question isn't just about the timeline; it's about the amount of work that would be involved with this with a, a preliminary conversations. I mean, I mm -hmm. I guess I'm just having a hard time understanding, like wrapping my mind around. What? Mm -hmm. I mean, would this be a full time or like, you know, a big piece of a work plan, you know, uh, project managers work? Well, it depends on what the catch would like us to look at. Um, I, you know, if it's if it's a full ordinance, that's a pretty big project. Um, if it is amending something existing, that's a little different, and it really depends on um, the. It really depends on what the catch would like us to look at, and then that will inform the amount of time and the outreach that would be needed. Um, and also, you know, if they're timing, if they don't, if they're not ready to move forward until October, we, we certainly would not be able to be back before council before the end of the six months, right? So maybe um, a suggestion that I could make is that we move forward with cannabis as uh, currently slated with the understanding or the caveat that should the catch be ready to move forward and have our staff plug in, that that would be the first thing that would potentially be um, deferred or that would be what that opportunity would co cost would be for that. So we would then put that cannabis work on hold and pick up the catch. So moved. Okay. Um, so Council Member Matthews and then sorry, Council Member Myers. Okay, I think there's a motion on the floor. I'd personally prefer to hear everyone's comments before we start amending the plan here. Okay. Um, and so I just have a few questions and comments. On the SB2 planning grant, uh, is that uh, for the project of our choice? So it needs to be <laughs> it needs to be a project that is um, in its planning stage. So not a development project or construction project or anything like that, but planning for um, increasing housing. That really is the goal of the of the grant program, and so what we would be, re, excuse me, be bringing forward to council would be three potential options for you to choose from for us to apply for. Okay, and I understand there's some out there that are eligible for this. It would help support the uh, staff support for this consultants. Uh, you mean in terms of the money? Yeah. Yes, so the money could be used for um, developing of the plan, funding staff to assist with the development of plan, hiring a consultant. There's a whole gamut yeah. of okay. things that that money could I mean, be could used be for, but it's for the planning. For example, mm -hmm. it could be like Pacific Station or is that? Planning for that, yeah. potentially. Yeah, potentially. I mean, that's just a poor mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. um, and um, what are the two local coastal categories of updates can just very briefly if you absolutely can. sure so um, one is one that's been outstanding since our general plan 2030 which is a comprehensive update of our local coastal plan in order to um, bring it up to date with our general plan 2030 because currently it references our general plan 2005 um, and then also to um, update uh, some sea level rise policies that was the original intent but since then we've received this grant from the coastal commission to add an entire hazard section to our coastal program or coastal plan that would um, address sea level rise uh, sea level rise in a much deeper way and so it's almost kismet that this other item has been on on hold so that we can can do them together, but they are two separate projects, but my my goal in order to maximize our resources is to try to take them forward together. In general, it seems to me those things that have dates and targets and yes. so forth. Yes, kind of no brainer. Yeah. Um, there are a couple, uh, one of the things that occurred to me that um, I think we have heard is a priority f for people, it's not on this list at all, is something we've been talking about, a, a plastic pollution ordinance. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's just one more thing. That's right, um, that would be how, in core services. For example, and I don't think we'd probably be inventing the wheel, probably collaborating with what the county's been doing in that general direction, but mm -hmm. again, it's one more thing. So how do you see that fitting in here? Um, kind of, well, um, I think I don't know if it would be advanced planning actually. Slated for an upcoming council member to be brought forward. I mean, upcoming council meeting to be brought forward in the near future. But I'm just thinking of yeah, because if it doesn't fall in Title 24, typically, 
Now this is typically. Public works. Yeah, yeah it would fall in a different department. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, just a couple of things. Um, I personally would uh, really like to see at some point a housing um, study session because I think back of the deep work that was done a few years ago and so many of these things have just been um, pushed back down the line but are so critical to everybody, I think, a shared uh, urgency about housing. So um, it's it's one thing to say, well, all that all that information is in the housing blueprint report, but honestly, that's not the same as having a study session. So um, probably, you know, not so much for me, but for the uh, council members that didn't go through that very deep year on housing issues, it could be um, a good personal um, uh, focus on that. Um, another thing that it's kind of related that um, I think it's a challenge for us to come up with a three-year plan is that um, we are one council and there's going to be another council in 2020. And this is what I'm thinking back with the housing things, the effort that went into that thing. And then, you know, life goes on. I mean, that's how city councils are. But the, um, uh, I think it'll just be for all of us and those who continue to maintain a focus and <laughs> um, not waste all that effort of, of thinking hard and developing a three-year plan and then it's all different. So that, that's just perspective. Um, one of the things that um, I just want to ask you about is the Ocean Street rezoning, because it seems to me that is such potential for um, upgrading of our main commercial core and housing. And um, that's just not on the map. Is that right. Correct? So it um, ranked, depending on if we're counting the red dots as one or as nothing, uh, it ranked mm -hmm. either as a three or a four with the highest thing on here ranking um, a, a 15. Mm -hmm. So that is why I don't have it reflected yeah, here. I now, if council chooses to give staff direction to do that, then of course we will pick that up. But in terms of the ranking, it didn't, it didn't rank high on the list. Okay, I think those were my oh, questions. questions. And so just sort of keeping a kind of an eye on the clock here, I think one of the things that we want to recognize is how comprehensive and complex this is, that this will be integrated into the three-year work plan. But if council members want to express areas of agreement for what's before us um, as they go through their comments or questions, that would be appropriate. Um, I'll just sort of, because I can't make a motion, I'll just briefly sort of share my thoughts on this. Um, I'm supportive of the cannabis um, kind of being on the back burner. I think when we think about the pressing issues, issues for the entire community, housing and homelessness and such like that, really does rise to that level. And um, if we can free up in terms of opportunity costs there, um, knowing that this is something we do want to address, but not necessarily it has to be within the next several months, then that would be an opportunity for an opening for us to address some of the other pressing issues. Um, I think that that said, that could go for um, the, if there's any items that the cash wants to bring forward as well as um, something that was brought to my attention that could become available, which is the electrification of policy and policy around that for planning and what could be potential funding available through the Monterey Bay um, community powers. And knowing that that is a area, I think, of alignment and um, opportunity for us to really um, accelerate our um, abilities to have more um, sustainable housing, that would be a really great um, opportunity that we don't want to lose sort of... Um, upcoming kind of potential there. So that would be sort of my um, kind of overall sentiment here. I think tonight when we have the in-depth conversation, we'll have an opportunity to go into what that means for the community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember uh, Myers and then Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember Brown. I just, uh, a couple quick quick questions. Um, let's see, God, I keep losing it. There, it looks like some reason the housing on page uh, page one of the chart at the bottom, for some reason the housing study session was put under the cash. It says handle through cash, and I don't I don't think that was the intent of the housing blueprint, um, which I think speaking to right. council right. members, um, Matthews, uh, this was really I believe meant to be looking 
more broadly at, you know, back at the blueprint, making sure we're tracking on, on our housing goals and objectives. I'm not quite sure why that ended there. And right below that, um, it's 125 Curl Street property acquisition. And based on the timeline, so I agree, I, I, I'm not feeling that transitional encampments are of immediate priority. Um, I'm very interested though to make sure that we don't um, ignore, and this is going to be a planning, um, unfortunately a planning uh, question, um, if we do and are able to acquire the Coral Street property and we go into a master planning process for both the HSC and the Coral Street, um, that is a huge priority for us for homelessness. I would say that's quite a bit higher than transitional encampments at this point. And from what I understand, we have a very short timeline to do the acquisition and then do planning, then actually start to, to, to operationalize what I think will be a major overhaul of our infrastructure around how we are able to actually service people who are unsheltered in our community. So that didn't come up anywhere. I know that's a big planning question for you. It's a cash question. I'm not sure who, whose world that belongs in, but I'd like to see that. Um, I guess my comment is, my question is, uh, did that get missed or should we refine this description and then just question about a housing study session and maybe, maybe that's just a typo and it ended up in a weird place. So yes, on the housing study session, that did end up in a weird place. I don't think that that was intended to uh, be handled through the catch. I agree. Okay, okay. <laughs> great, so that one addressed. Um, in terms of the Coral Street and the master planning process with that, um, I would defer to the city manager's office in terms of what department that would fall to. Um, I, it, it, you know, it would be up to them to assign the work uh, to, to where, it would, where it would best fit. With respect to the master planning process, yeah, it's it's a it's a team effort with uh, our office uh, taking the lead since we're focusing on the homelessness issues, in combination with economic development uh, and property management um, as well. Those I think are the primary and public works, and depending on the various issues that come uh, arise out of looking at the master plan, it also have to be done in conjunction with the county um, and the services that are provided there, obviously in the, in the homeless services center. So it'd be a, a team effort. Okay. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Cummings and then Councilmember Brown. I had a question because I know that there's a number of um, items that have kind of just been in the queue. For example, the inclusionary ordinance, and then um, I thought I remembered things, items coming up around the corridors plan and when that would be coming back to City Council. And so I was just kind of curious where those stand right now because those were brought up probably back in January, February, and it's now August, and I'm just kind of curious where those stand. Sure, so um, I would defer to the Economic Development Director on the inclusionary ordinances. Uh, in terms of the corridor items, um, they have continually been deferred from our work plan because of uh, repositioning council priorities. And so um, the unfortunate reality is that with the resources we have, they have it has been pushed back. It, we were originally expecting to be able to start, uh, restart that conversation with the community in January, um, but Things change and that's okay. Um, it's not that we don't wanna get to it, it's just that um, we haven't had the capacity. And so um, as an outcome of the prioritization effort, what we're seeing is that it's still not ranked highly. So I would say unless council um, decides at some point, either today or in the future to reprioritize that, I wouldn't expect us to be getting to that until at least nine months out at this point, given the current workload and the resources that we have. Thanks, and, and I would just add about the inclusion ordinance. Actually, it should be in there. I think we, we were having a discussion about sort of the timing of the settlement discussions and not wanting to put a time uh, down there, but I think we could put down there and leave it somewhat vague at, at this point. Um, but we should be tracking on that, and so it should be included so we can follow up and make sure it's in, it's in there. Okay. okay, Council Member Brown and then Council Member Matthews, and then hopefully we can move in some direction for... Yes. All right. So uh, there's a motion that's hanging out there. So I don't want to preempt that, but I would like, I have a motion that is has a, uh, some additional items that I would like the council to consider. So I'm just wanting to see, uh, which okay. will include. Okay. Do you want to withdraw your motion and allow for Glover's. Her to... It hasn't been seconded, has it? Oh, 
Uh, I'll, I'll still withdraw the motion just uh, to, out of interest of Council Brown's motion. I'm gonna give it a shot and we'll right. see where it goes. Okay, so I, um, first I just wanna say I really do appreciate all of the work that's gone into this. I also wanna appreciate staff for bearing with us as you have been uh, buffeted by shifting winds. And um, so I, I don't want to continue to contribute to that and I, I do want us to get to a place where we have some kind of clear understanding of what's realistic in, and priority in the next six months. Um, recognizing that some of these items will take more time than others. Some of them may take longer for reasons that are kind of external. Other things may come up. I All of that is still there and I, I don't wanna, um, you know, I wanna acknowledge that those are all possibilities. But right now what I'd like to accept the report as recommended by staff and move to revise the six month work program for the advanced planning division um, as follows. Do my best based upon the, what I've heard and if I miss something, jump in. Um, so I, um, I think that retaining the rental housing data collection program pending our conversation this evening, um, retaining the ADU affordability review um, retaining review of the Planning Commission subcommittee, and I think you said that should be handled, so it's not a big item. Um, and also retaining, obviously, anything mandated um, that's requ you know required for us, and retaining um, the SB2 planning grant application. I, don't, I think it would be silly to miss out on an opportunity for uh, getting some additional resources. Um, and, um, but I also do want to add back in the planning commission review of general plan policies related to the corridors to resolve existing conflicts. I have attempted to do this now. It's kind of been left on, put on the back burner, but I would like us, I believe this is a serious community priority um, and I would like us to take it on. I don't know that it, how much work that's gonna be to initiate that process and have conversations with um, members in the community. We've had requests for this repeatedly. So I wanna add planning commission review of general plan policies related to the corridors to resolve existing conflicts. And my motion is for staff to bring us back this, uh, the revisions at the next meeting, August 27th, with these changes um, and to delay and to add um, recommendations that may come f through the from the catch where they involve advanced planning. I don't want to limit it to transitional encampments, but I believe that's um, on since it's on their agenda and they've the a member has made that request. That's certainly there, but just recommendations that in would involve advanced planning to the extent they do involve advan advanced planning in this six month period. Um, and to delay remaining recommended projects until 2020, um, except projects can be included to the extent they don't impede these these projects. I think these are really for the priorities and um, return. so return at the next council meeting with the revised work program. Second. So we have a motion by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Um, is there a question from staff? Well, I just do have one concern. So um, the, Content expert for the Ocean Street and Golf Club Drive policies is the same individual who is working on this already very dense workload. And so my concern is that um, one of these items may need to come off in order for her to do that. Okay. And given the mandate of the state on some of these things and the rental housing data collection, assuming that does move forward, um, I, and we can't move the uh, Coastal Commission approval, I would, I guess, recommend removing the ADU uh, affordability review and uh, SFD parking modifications in exchange for that. That's really the only wiggle room I have for her. Okay. Um, that, that, that is all right with me. So I didn't quite finish my motion because this one I believe is Sorry. not for advanced planning. Um, I do want to include in the motion to ensure 
um, the review of inclusionary be recognized as part of our overall work plan, not advanced planning. So I, I'm making that separately, but it, within the motion. So I guess the third piece of that. Is that okay. So. And just if I'm I okay with that, I mean, I, you know, I, I think it's a priority. I, you know, I know we've been talking about it for a long time, but I, I just want to make sure that this, um, and the golf club drive is not in my motion. Okay, just noted. Okay, and then I would also say to, you know, as much as we can bring the affordability, the second ADU item, I can't seem to say that today, back with the mandated legislative updates, if it makes sense and it's able to do, and they don't end up getting split off into two separate things, it may be manageable. But if for some reason, either from the community consultation process or from council's desire to maybe have additional changes to that, that is the one thing on her work plan that would probably get dropped. It would have to get dropped in exchange for the, the corridors policies. And I appreciate you raising that and being realistic, and which is, it, why I say to the extent, uh, include sure. whatever, all, they're all priorities, so include to the extent they don't impede that added okay. project. Okay. Or those added projects. All right, so we have a motion by Councilmember um, Brown, a second by Vice Mayor Cummings. There are elements that I agree with in this motion, and then there's areas that I would like to kind of address in terms of concern and maybe um, probably not accept it as a friendly amendment, but would propose that you know, having gone through um, the corridor plan when we were running for council years ago and recognizing that it is unresolved, but also keeping in mind ultimately how are we best influencing housing and affordability of housing to revisit an item for me at this time with enough kind of controversy in the community doesn't necessarily feel to me as fruitful as it could be if that were in incorporated into the three-year strategic plan. So in the next six months for me, having us really focus on some of the things that are really going to facilitate in a way that had community support and community input on in regards to such things like ADUs and really helping ultimately with the mind around affordable housing, that would be my priority, to revisit and open sort of what I would suggest is sort of this kind of lingering wound and, um, and the time that we're at feels um, really concerning personally, but also recognizing it, it definitely will be resolved. And I know that was sort of the, that was the sentiment um, from the blueprint subcommittee, uh, from the prior council. I think that's definitely a, a area that this, I'm sure this council wants to revisit and not necessarily move forward with in a way that's dedicating resources on. But um, to, to bring that up in the next several months feels, um, for me, it's concerning. So um, that would be my sort of instinctual reaction to el that element of the um, of the motion. Although other areas, I I support. Uh, Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Myers. I got the impression from staff's comments that inclusionary uh, review should be on here. Is that a correct? Yeah. So I think we could. Just I'm just saying it's not, so I want to make yeah, sure it is yeah. and yeah. have that on the record. Yeah. And just to confirm, it's not on the AP work yeah. plan, but it is in uh, on page three of the larger city of Santa Cruz six months work plan. It is um, near the bottom there. There's a ordinance updates for rental projects and for ownership projects, and it's just indicated to start at the beginning of the next calendar year. And, and I have repeatedly brought... Uh, an agenda item to uh, have that considered sooner. I've pulled it and I'm not interested in waiting until next year. Understood. On that one. I, I'm not, so we'll see what others say. Just. I'm Councilmember Myers. Yeah, I'd oh. like to echo just a little bit for the motion um, maker. I think that I, I heard very clearly that there's a number of general plan 2030 objectives, and I think that. Um, we could probably realistically say corridors, Ocean Street, and probably um, Golf Club Drive are sort of that suite, which is you know future development areas. Um, and I think that that fits in our in our three-year strategic plan, starting you know really really well. Um, I worry that we continue to lose sort of the opportunity of low-hanging fruit with ADUs and trying to get um, those jump started. I talked to Lee just a week or two ago and you know there's a lot of permits sitting or you know there's really there's not a lot of movement because i think that we're sort of halfway through the revisions and i think people are still waiting to know whether or not they really want to try to pursue building an ADU so um, i would echo the mayor's co uh, comments that 
if we were able to prioritize those three planning efforts into the strategic planning process and we were able to really give planning staff time to just finish off the ADUs, if you would be amenable to that. Do you want to make that uh, as a, a friendly I, amendment? I, I, well, I mean, I can respond. I want to let others speak, okay. but I can respond or Yeah, wait. I mean, I would propose it as a, yeah. I think you had ADUs in your motion though. No, I, ha I and I want to keep ADUs in the motion with the understanding as, um, as Sarah suggests that that would be the, that would have to drop off. I would, so I'd like to keep it in there. But for me, um, no, I, I, so I, and I'll just try to explain my rationale here with the corridors. I believe, and I, I completely understand, Mayor Watkins, your concerns about, um, you know, the controversy around this. I understand the uh, possibility for this to be considered as a, within the suite of kind of expansions for um, development purposes. But what I'm seeing to extend the um, analogy uh, or the metaphor of the wound, I believe this is a festering wound and it's not um, something that ignoring is going to, I mean, it's it's open, it, you know, it, it is open. And so I don't believe that this is opening it up more. I believe that this is giving, uh, creating an opportunity for a uh, public that has been waiting and a pretty organized public that's been waiting to, um, participate in that conversation. So that is my rationale for, for doing this right now. I just, maybe I have a clarifying question. So in terms of the rationale to do that urgently, but also weighing that against the opportunity costs of having a impact on affordable housing sort of in the immediate, how do you reconcile that? Because that to me doesn't necessarily move the needle on affordable housing or sort of solutions around that at this oh, time. I'm not sure that it's going to preempt um, moving the needle on affordable housing. I mean, I think what's going to move the needle on affordable housing is if we approve projects that have affordable units in them and some of those will be coming to us. So I think there are, there are ways to move that needle and we haven't uh, been doing that and, and I hope we will. Um, but I don't think that that is a trade-off that's being made by inclusion of um, consideration of you know revisiting the corridors. Maybe that would be a question for advanced planning in terms of your expectation and timing. If we're unable to address certain things that you have listed here that fall within this person's parameters, that really I think do try to move policy that's going to influence housing production in a way that was sort of accepted by the community at the time in terms of policy. If we were to move forward with the policy to revisit the corridors and have that go forward as um, kind of a component of this individual's work pl plan, will that cost, will the opportunity be, cost be to stop work on some of these other efforts? Uh, yes, in the short term, uh, and there's a couple of there's a couple of points. So um, the first one is that um, we do currently have a tool to be able to approve projects in the on the corridors, even though we do have clearly the inconsistency between the general plan and the zoning. Um, that is. Absolutely correct. Um, but we do through our plan development and development agreement processes have a way to be able to approve those uh, projects. So we do currently have a tool in place. Um, yes, there would be an opportunity to cost if we did want to move forward right now with um, with it in really frankly the next four months. Um, it would be the ADU item here that we discussed. Um, Additionally, one of the items that we'll be bringing forward uh, as the SB2 grant proposal would be to um, potentially apply for the grant to help us have that conversation with the community, um, not only on Ocean Street, but potentially depending on, uh, you know, how the funding shakes out, potentially on additional corridors as well. Uh, that was one option. We'll be bringing, I believe, a downtown plan, expanded update, and I can't remember what the third option was. But that is something that is on, very much on our radar and that we're um, interested in getting feedback from council on in terms of that that grant program. Um, but yes, candidly, there would be an opportunity cost here and we do have tools in place to be able to approve projects in that area. So um, that's just something for council to, to weigh. I'll just reiterate my concern about that because I think, you know, given the fact that we are going to do a community outreach process for a long-term strategic planning process, it really feels very kind of fitting to have that 
corridor aspect built into that, knowing that within the next four months and under the current conditions of living and affordability that we could potentially make a difference, I don't feel comfortable doing that personally, um, knowing that that's the opportunity cost. So Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Matthews, and then I have a friendly amendment I'd like to add to the motion. I'm not sure, Sarah, I'm not sure if this is the right question, but like where, where is the corridors plan? Because I thought over the last couple of elections, it was, it was dying, dying, dying and dead. And other people in the community have raised concerns that it's not actually, and that um, they would like to see it <laughs> dead. Uh, I'm not saying that that's what I want, but where, where is the corridors plan and why does it still have life? Sure, so um, the corridors plan was actually put on hold in 2017 as a part of the housing voices uh, outreach process. Um, uh, the mayor at that time, Mayor Chase, um, really wanted to have a deep dive conversation with the community about broader housing issues. And so um, through that we had the housing voices outreach process and then subsequent to that we had the housing blueprint subcommittee recommendations which came forward in uh, just over a year ago. Um, as a part of that, the corridors process is in there, but it was not um, one of the primary priorities for that first six months of uh, the new fiscal year last year. And so what you saw us come forward with in the new fiscal year last year was our community outreach policy, some ADU updates, uh, large rent increase updates. Uh, we did an analysis of the uh, Measure M. So those were the things that our team was, was focused on. Um, we were slated then to start the quarters process conversation again in December, but when the new council came on, um, it was pushed back again so that we could continue to have conversations around homelessness and just cause eviction and um, other rental protections and tenant uh, and landlord protection conversations. And so um, as of today, where it stands is that it's still on hold um, because it has not come to the top and it's not on, it's on the next six month work plan because it hasn't come to the top of the prioritization list in the, in the straw poll. So that's kind of the history of where it's moved and where it's sitting, um, it very much still exists. It's not dead. Um, it just hasn't been the hottest boiling pot. And I, I will just sort of add that I have an email from the city manager that just basically, and I think nothing has really changed, that staff was suspending work on the corridors rezoning until further directed at that point. And that's been sort of the consistent Correct. message. Correct. When, we, okay. when the council last went through a prioritization process, that was sort of the council direction to um, right. not, make, not make it a priority. He didn't say don't do it, just said, let's not make it a priority. And so as uh, uh, was explained um, by Sarah, that has been what the staff has been doing. So uh, I think Vice Mayor Cummings, Council Member Brown, Council Member Matthews, and then maybe we can take mm -hmm. bit yeah. by bit the, yeah. the motion. I know that we're gonna end up pushing cannabis off for a while, but I just wanted to state that having met with a lot of the small business owners and knowing that cannabis is a new industry that's rapidly growing. Um, and additionally, the loss of tax revenue from retail that we've been experiencing that I think we need to keep in mind how we can work with some of the small local cannabis businesses that have been around for a long time to ensure that they're gonna be able to remain in our community and be successful because um, if we neglect them too much, um, the consequences could be that they would not be able to stay in our community and would be replaced by large corporate um, cannabis retailers. And so um, I just wanna put that out there that we should really think about um, how we can better support the cannabis industry as we move forward. Um, I also wanted to make a friendly amendment that we, that when cannabis comes back, that it also is considering um, standalone consumption sites, which were, which are different from on-site consumption. Uh, Councilmember Brown and then Councilmember Matthews and then I have a friendly amendment. I'd like to so just to be clear and so we're, just, there's no misunderstanding. Um, I think part of the issue that is calling for some, you know, re revisiting the corridors now is that w there are tools and mechanisms available to continue with elements of the corridor's developments without there being a clear plan and agreement about what that plan is. So it's precisely because there are those tools that there are so many people in the community who are very concerned about it. So I just wanna be clear about that. It's, it's not a, like that's part of the issue, it's not part of the uh, solution to we can deal with this later, I, for me anyway, and the people that have been communicating with me about this. Just to be clear. OK, 
Okay, Councilmember Matthews, and then maybe we um, can go. Forward. Yeah, uh, just a quick point I overlooked before. Uh, one of the items which is yet to be started, but it keeps coming up in terms of um, housing that could exist uh, is uh, looking at unpermitted dwelling units. And so I just, yeah. You know, that's what everyone's, can't we just deal with that one? Sure. sure. So um, again, it wasn't highly ranked in the yeah, straw yeah. poll. Yeah. Um, and there's two elements to that. There's working with our code enforcement team um, because there's the actual kind of building code issues, but then there's also the land use issues. So it's a dual team effort. And on the land use issues, which where we could talk about things like parking and things of that nature, um, that would require somebody from my team. So um, the code enforcement team is working, moving forward on their piece. Um, our piece has not started yet because we it hasn't been prioritized by council well personally that's an area where I'd like to go understood uh, as well as um, keeping the uh, ADUs on there um, I did have a just a comment um, it's on page one the community engagement it and throughout the text it refers to the wise democracy um, process when I heard that it was like a tool but it was not guiding the whole engagement it's one among many many tools I think it would make sense to delete that specific reference it sounds like that's the uh, framework for the whole community engagement process that, that's just my comment that's the way I sure. understood that um, and then just in terms of process I think um, I would really like to see specifically the actions that are different from what's what we've been given here, and that we uh, either achieve consensus or vote on the changes, because I think we all have some we're going to vote for and some not. Right. Yeah. And we could we could do that. We could facilitate that. Yes, and I do have the sheet here. So I mean, I know we are a little constrained for time. So if you would like us to come back at the next meeting, we could do that. But I'd also have a worksheet here that if it's if you'd like. I think we, we could, could do the exercise I, Let's try here. to go through it by just sort of item that we have in the motion and then we'll see if we need to do it by sheet. Okay. I'll have a, I have a friendly amendment. One of the things that I know that I know Councilmember Brown knows that we talked about with the housing blueprint subcommittee was to get the child care developer impact fee before us. That's a really great tool to um, facilitate um, a resource for child care, which is leave, is fundamentally uh, struggling nationwide and in our community and is a huge need for working families. It's a tool that we have as policymakers and I'd like to see that prioritized for the next four months. So that would be my friendly amendment to the maker of the motion. A question for clarification. Uh, it's, if we're gonna be taking each of these individually, or is you're asking to include it then in the motion and then in, look at each of them individually? Okay. okay. Is that accepted from the second there? Okay, great. Councilmember Kern, and then we'll go through. Just a side issue, I was wondering about the uh, UCSC Long Range Development Plan Liaison. Where does that fall in here? Um, and and what, what would it take to get that started? That's an happening. It's happening and it's, it's happening. not advanced planning. And we're working with the, uh, the county to uh, do an MOU to be able to hire the staff person for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we're working on it. Cover that base. RFP is going out soon, next week or so. And there's a, a committee that's really taking the, the focus of that work. Yes. Sounds, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then we'll go through the motion. And you said that there were two separate individuals kind of working on these different items, and I was wondering where um, review of the rental inspection program might fall in here, whether that would be something that we could also include um, for one of these people to do if it's not going to be too cumbersome. Sure, and so that does not fall to the advanced planning team. That would fall to our code enforcement team. And here's Laura Landry. Yeah. Mayor, City Council members, um, Laura Landry with Code Compliance. And we are currently working on options to bring to council in October. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. some water. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to tackle the motion. Um, I have the first, and Councilmember Brown, maybe you can um, reiterate, the first element being to have the rental um, housing database um, and kept in but pending conversation this evening. Is that correct? Yeah, do you want me to just read? I can read it off if you yeah, let's do that. Okay, um, so the motion is to direct staff to return at our August 27th meeting with a revised six month work program for the advanced planning division, including the following, retaining mandated projects and retaining the SB2 planning grant application Retaining the housing data collection program pending uh, decisions to be made at this evening's 
city council session. Let's maybe pause there. <laughs> oh, Given yeah. that portion of the motion, how are comfortable are the council with those elements? To keep the mandated, to continue for- Mandated, there was, there was a cluster of things that were both mandated or had timelines. They weren't mandated. There was SB2 and then there was- there was a, a page of things that had, there, that one. So, but time sensitive being all but cannabis, essentially. Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're okay. are we supportive of as a council on that? Okay, so time sensitive and mandated, okay. Uh, okay, so that would then be including every element here other than cannabis, which we've had discussions about mm -hmm. l lowering the priority. Does everybody feel comfortable with that? Yes. Okay, so for that portion of the motion, all those in favor, please yes. say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. All right, and then maybe we'll take the next bit. All right, um, ADU affordability review pending Recognizing, sorry, recognizing that it may need to drop off depending on how much the time, how much time other items take. Yeah. And on that one specifically, I got the impression you said that you could maybe handle the ADU affordability review, but not the single family dwelling parking modifications. Is that correct? Not quite. Um, we would bring them together. The only issue would be if we would wanna bring the ADU item in the yellow is mandatory, so that will come. And as much as possible, we will bring the um, affordability review and the single family dwelling unit modifications, but I have them separate because they could end up being on a separate track than the mandates. Understood. Yeah. yeah. So the proposal and the motion is to move forward with the mandated legislative updates at this time, given the conversation around the corridors, replacing the ADU ref uh, other policy, right? Well, if retaining a ADU affordability review, if possible, depending on how much time the other items take. I, would, I just want to be clear that I don't want that to be eliminated. If it, if it turns out that, this, that the review of opening up the conversation about the corridors is simply a matter of the Planning Commission hearing it and some community groups that want to have a meeting that have been unable to get a meeting, for example, um, can do that, then it may not take that much time. So I'm just trying to, you know, maybe say. If, maybe if you want to do the vote on the corridors first, and that okay. will, I think, Let's dictate the thing. Yeah, okay. So maybe you can okay. specify what you want for the corridors. So um, to add uh, planning commission review of the general plans policies related to the corridors to resolve existing conflicts. And so I, I'd like that to be included in a in return at our next meeting with that included in the plan. Okay, so I think I've expressed my opinions about that. I don't think that's a productive way for us at this time to move forward with bringing our community together as well as making a difference in affordable housing as um, I think clarified by our planning director. I think that could be incorporated into the longer term conversation. So I will not be supporting that given we're about to embark on a three-year plan, which will engage the community. And that's a great opportunity to do that on a big issue like that. So for me, I won't be supporting it. Okay, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Okay, so then I think that was at the cost of the ADU component. So I guess ADUs will take a back burner to the corridor plan at this point. You specify like, that vote? Well, that, I didn't okay, actually. That, so all those that in favor were motion. Brown, uh, Vice Mayor Cummings, Glover, and Crone to reopen the corridors, um, sort of bumping ADUs and the work on ADU policy for this person <laughs> below that as a consequence. So that was not in my motion to do that as a trade off. I, the response was to. Um, Sarah's comment that that may have to drop off, but I'm okay. not asking that it be dropped off in favor of the corridors. I want to be very clear about that. But if anything goes, it would be the second ADU item. The mandates will come, they have Understood. to. Um, then what would happen is the second ADU item would, um, if possible, continue on the same track as the ADUs, but if they split on tracks and we have to choose between the affordability review of ADUs and the corridors, then based on the um, motion just accepted by council, it would be the corridors items that would supersede. Sorry. 
And that was supported by Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Glover and Crone, with Myers, Matthews, and myself voting against. Okay. Again, you, just want to be clear for the minutes, so we don't have to correct the minutes later, that this is not requesting that be dropped. Okay. Okay, is that the conclusion of your... Well, I, the, I mean, the rest of it was... The, this was a way for me to try to uh, uh, suggest or some reprioritization, um, but we can proceed with, I guess, ch the child care developer fees. I, the rest of the motion was to um, delay the remaining recommended projects until 2020, except where projects can be included to the extent they don't impede the added projects. The cash was also in there. So the ca rec any recommend, so I'll go back to my other page. Um, so the, so that, no, that wasn't it. The, okay. the, ca the recommendation, the other, addition was um, any recommendations from the catch to the extent that they um, involve advanced planning. Okay. I think, okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. And excuse me, and that goes where? In the six month AP? That goes in that person's, and that would be in, in, in lieu of the cannabis being prioritized, okay. correct? I think we have consensus on that. That's unanimous. Uh -huh. Clarifying okay. question. Did we, okay. did we lose the housing study session? We haven't voted on that one yet. Okay. Okay. Was that, I had a note. Was that part of the original I, motion? I didn't include it in my motion. I, I think that that can wait until next year. If that, if there's a trade off, that, that one to me seems. If I may, Mayor, um, there's one item that was missing, unless I didn't hear it, is, and the original motion was to retain the PC subcommittee conversation that we were going to bring on uh, April 20th or August 27th as well. Correct. Great. Thank you. Okay. So Vice Mayor coming in, I mean, sorry, Councilmember Glover and then. To we'll retain the review of the Planning Commission subcommittee. In the community outreach policy. In the community outreach policy. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. I think, sorry, Councilmember Glover, Vice Mayor Cummings, and then Councilmember Matthews, and then I think we just need to kind of wrap up what we can at this point. Yeah, and so that was the end of your motion, right, Councilmember Brown? Okay, wonderful. Wait, uh, we have still that, no, because I accepted. Um, okay, I'm gonna wait till you're all done with that. Child care developer fee. Okay. Be on after so that. let's go ahead and take that vote, and then we'll go ahead and, okay, so, um, so the child care developer fee was something mm -hmm. that was worked on by a, a person in our city manager's office, I think was really quite close, given that the county already passed one, um, had kind of lost, I, I mean, I'll let um, our team Bernal speak to that, sort of lost what, where we are with that, but was a priority that was specified in the housing blueprint subcommittee that I'd like to make sure we're able to move forward on. And, and I don't know if you have anything to add at this point. It was something that Casey Hemer was with. So it's not an advanced planning, so I would include that. Sorry to interrupt, but that it, like the inclusionary, I would not include that in the request okay. for the revised six And month. that wouldn't be in something that advanced planning. Okay, we'll go ahead and post it. All the planning is involved. In, planning is involved. In, 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 as it relates to um, Development. impact fees. That's yes, what exactly. I was So would that not fall into your so, staff's workload? That I believe, and uh, Eric Marlitz here, I think would that be more your team or would that be my team? I think it'd be like a both, yeah. And that's something I could work on. Um, okay. So it's, I could fit that into my workload. Okay, so let's go ahead and vote for it now, or vote for it wherever you feel it fits. Is there any further so, clarifying questions on that one? So in the citywide work plan, if, yeah, not necessarily it, it, the AP. But if it crosses into AP, then so be it. If, so we're, just, if we're on to citywide, then I wanna make sure that inclusionary is also, we can, so specify we can take that, that one next. We can take that next. Okay, so all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Do we wanna move on to the citywide um, then? Okay. One more on there, because I added in the standalone consumption site when the cannabis ordinances come back. Right, and I think that was acknowledged as that will be incorporated when that. The I didn't know if we needed to vote on that or not, so. Okay, we can. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Was that a motion? And that was, um, a mo we'd like to make it a motion by, count by uh, Vice Mayor Cummings. I'll go ahead and second okay, it for the purposes of moving it forward. And then we had a unanimous support for that. Okay, uh, Councilmember Brown, do you wanna speak to the inclusionary? I, I would like to ensure that inclusionary ordinance updates for ownership and rental projects be included as a priority for this six month work plan for the general um, city work plan. Okay, 
All those in favor, Wait, please. I have a question. Oh, okay, Councilmember Matthews. <laughs> um, so I want to ask, is that in AP or is that in economic? That would sit in economic development. So I do want to ask where that fits in in your workload. And we would partner with them and assist. Uh, again, that would probably okay. come from me. Um, but yes, it's it's housed in their team. Yeah, I'm, I understand it. I'm just, you've got some other big projects. Yeah, um, you know, as you just met at this afternoon, our new, you know, housing and community development manager, she's definitely getting up to, to speed on a lot of, of our various programs. Um, with that said, we have been working closely with this, also with the city attorney's office on this issue. So from a timing perspective, we were just trying to be sensitive to that process, but we're tracking it very closely. So, um, and then we're also been working with, with planning on this as well. So we need to just figure out the timing. Um, and then I think we'll have our team all on deck. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay. All right. All those in favor. Uh, I have a question also on this. Um, is, uh, is the in lieu fee, uh, going to be considered in this also? Is that, is that part of your, this is, well, this is a general, um, just general direction, but certainly Different. that's a conversation for you'll hear to be continued. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Were there any other pending elements of the motion that need to be addressed at this time? I had one question for Bonnie, if that's. Maybe, well. maybe before, if, is there anything else? That's it? Okay. A final question for Bonnie? I just had a question in terms of economic development's work plan around the wharf master plan. When there's, what's the timeline for when that's supposed to come back as well? So right now we're working on updating with the additional studies that we need um, for there's some nesting into some different environmental studies that needed to be updated in the, in the draft EIR. And so that's the next element. And so at the time we bring that forward, I think that's when you can provide some direction to us about the overall wharf master plan. Because as I understand, there's some elements and some general support to maybe modify the wharf master plan, which is um, is something that we'd be supportive of if that gets us moving forward. So um, the next step is the EIR and we'll bring that forward. And then we were anticipating that you could give us direction about the master plan at that point. Is there any timeline around when we're supposed to see the EIR? Yeah, we're working with, we already have our uh, environmental consultant who prepared the original Stephanie Strela with DUDEC um, engaged in it. And we're hoping it's roughly a two month process to be able to bring that back to you. Thank you. Okay, so I think that concludes, oh, Council Member Glover. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, there were two suggested actions in this presentation and also on the agenda report. One was to get a report back from the, the event and then kind of uh, have future direction. The other one was to confirm the plan. <coughs> Something I think, I think it was mentioned in this slide uh, deck was the recommendations from the consultant with regards to engaging in conflict reconciliation resolution amongst the members of the city council to make a more cohesive body. Um, I'm disappointed that I haven't heard any of that so far with regards to um, potential action we could move on, but I do think that it's something that's relevant, especially because of the uh, HR report, which has not been released to the public yet, but is ideally going to be really soon, where one of the recommendations from a second professional that's been engaged with the city council is that city council and staff should review and revise, or no, excuse me, should um, participate in professional mediation and conflict resolution. So is now a time to instruct staff to come back with a suggestion or plan for conflict reconciliation, uh, just because it seems now that two professionals, including uh, the, I guess four, three professionals that have come in as consultants that have looked at the way that this body operates and have all concluded that there needs to be some kind of conflict resolution. I've waited as long as I can, and so now here is a fantastic opportunity uh, to put it into action. Is this an appropriate time, in your opinion, any of y'all staff members to move it forward since it was a specific recommendation and we're talking about future action plans? I'll just um, clarify what I heard, I think in the presentation was that the city manager's office is moving forward with that and actually probably has a consultant already identified. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, great. So it looks like that's already in, in motion. And what's the uh, what's the timeline? What's associated with that? Is it, I mean, you have to give, excuse me, we've been here for six months. Uh, I started asking for this back in February uh, and we still haven't done it yet. So if you just have a timeline associated with it maybe or just so we know. Sure, so it may come as early as the next council meeting. Um, 
that's our intent. So I actually have a meeting scheduled tomorrow. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. That's that's the goal. Okay, great. Okay. So we'll go ahead and um, conclude the, this agenda, um, the afternoon session. We're going to kind of move our uh, evening item. We'll start a, a little bit after maybe 7.05-ish for oral communications. Um, at this time, we're going to conclude our afternoon session. Quick vote? question. I think we did. Did we vote? Did we take it all? Did you get the clarification of where we're at with all of the supportive areas moving forward with this? We'll at have this to look another video for that. But what about the consent? Yeah, as a the question. Of the consent? The consent agenda item, I think if we're going to try to stick to what the council directed, which is to have 7 p.m. as the um, time for oral communications as well as to get in a break for dinner, I will revisit that as soon as we conclude oral communications around 7.30 or 7.35. Seven oh five ish, yeah. So we'll adjourn until then. Oh. Okay, so welcome and good evening to our um, evening portion of our city council meeting. Um, we're gonna go ahead and call the meeting back to order at 7.10 p.m. And I'd like to ask our clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Crone. Here. Glover. Here. Myers. Here. Brown. Here. Matthews. Here. Vice Mayor Cummings. Here. And Mayor Watkins. Here. So we'll go ahead and now open up the meeting to oral communications. And oral communications is an opportunity for mm -hmm. members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. How many folks are here for oral communications? Hey, yo. Okay. So um, we'll go ahead and have those who want to, I will go ahead and allow for uh, 30 minutes of oral communications if fully needed. That will have us finishing around 7.40 p.m. with oral communications. In the interest of allowing hopefully everybody who wants to address the council, I'll go ahead and offer any individual who wants to briefly address the council in one minute to step forward to go first. Are there any individuals who want to address the council in the one minute time frame? Okay, please, you're welcome to come forward. <clears throat> My name is Freya Sands. I live on Wilkes Circle, and I'm speaking with regard to the property at 111 Eret Circle. The Circle neighborhood has had an open spiritual and community space for around 130 years. If 111 Eret Circle is developed as housing, the heart of our neighborhood, a heart of our neighborhood, and all its potential for future beautiful service will be gone forever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members of the community want to address us briefly in one minute during oral communications? I invite you to come forward. Okay. Is there any additional individuals who'd like to address us in the one minute time frame? Okay, seeing them, we'll go ahead and open it up to the left with the two-minute time frame. So you'll have up to one minute. Hi, my name is Lane Pianta. I live at 71 Front Street, and I've been a resident of Santa Cruz for a year now. I'm rising to speak against the recall effort against Council Members Crone and Glover. I'm very glad that my citizens, uh, my fellow citizens, have the right, thank you, to uh, to to uh, bring recall efforts forth. I think it's uh, an important part of our democracy. But the measure of a community is how it treats its most vulnerable citizens. And I believe that Council Members Crone and Glover have shown compassion, humanity, and wisdom in the stand that they've taken uh, in terms of defending the homeless people at the Ross Camp. And I call upon my fellow citizens to drop their misguided effort to recall our city council members. Thank you very much. attempt to get through all folks who want to address us. At this time, we'll go have you come forward. You have up to two minutes, and we'll make our way down the line. Okay. I'm, I'm Garrett Phillip. I, I wish I could get through all this, but I, I do want to say beforehand that it, this is in regards to really what is written on, say, staff presentations and kind of what is spoken, but I have no idea what you all do behind closed doors and, and when you interview people and stuff. So I could just be talking nonsense here, but this is what it seems like to me on just based on what I see, right? So uh, 
apologize in advance if I'm totally wrong. But anyway, as you recall last time, I spoke previously about the defective leftist group identity value system of diversity inclusiveness that elevates race or gender above confidence or merit and then produces mediocrity as a better qualified individuals may be discriminated against. Since this group identity membership inclusion into larger groups with however limited membership or rewards uses an exclusion based on a too many of this kind of formula of some race or gender to accommodate inclusion of other races, it is likely just as racist, sexist, et cetera, as the very civil rights segregations banned by laws of the past. As a possible recent example of this, I cite the selection process of the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness. The staff presentation made at least two mentions of either gender balance or balance of gender and also age different distributions as part of the selection process goals. These to me are the smoking gun signs that the staff has adopted leftist mantras of gender and age quota diversity as selection templates. As to the staff assertion the selection was diverse cross section of community members, I would say not, but was a selection of a focused class of homeless advocates, homeless service providers, and community activists. The laugher of the evening provided by, by the group identity possessed of the council was the attempted mandated addition of two currently homeless people to the advisory committee. While all candidates deserve due consideration, it seems unlikely homeless individuals are experts in how not to be homeless. I personally only believe in the real value of the diversity of ideas, not group identity membership, as the only diversity value system component that makes any sense if you care about excellence. Thank you. And you're always welcome to leave your comments with us. All right, next next speaker. And I'm just going to remind the community that everybody has an opportunity to address the council without threat or intimidation or feeling that they aren't able to come forward. We're open to hearing all perspectives, whether or not we agree with them. And so please refrain from um, uh, making somebody feel uncomfortable for whatever they share. And if I do notice that, I will give you a warning, a verbal warning. And if it continues, I will ask you to leave. Okay, you're welcome to your Thank you. Uh, Bob LaMonica, Santa Cruz. As a culture, we don't know how to deal with abuse of power. We have a judge, a Superior Court judge here in Santa Cruz that was censured by the California uh, Commission on Judicial Performance in May for fixing her own red light ticket. She's caught fixing her own red light ticket. There's no other way, way to parse that. What is even more astounding than Judge Ariadne Simons being caught fixing her own red light ticket and being censured for it is this statement of support that comes out later. Supporting uh, Simons and claiming, and I'm going to quote this, it says, she is a person with impeccable ethics and always places service above self. Now, I guess it depends on how, what the word impeccable means, and maybe uh, I'll ask Fred Keeley one day what he, he, meant, he meant, and the others that sign this thing mean when they say she has impeccable ethics. A judge, we're talking about a judge that was caught fixing her own red light ticket right here in Santa Cruz. This is a question of local application of values. This is abuse of power. We need to learn as a culture how to deal with abuse of power. This is what the Catholic Church would do, which they shuffled her off to Watsonville, or the Boy Scouts now. As a culture, we do not know how to deal with abuse of power. And I asked Cynthia Matthews and Martine Watkins to have their names retracted from this idiotic statement of support for a judge that was caught fixing her own red light ticket. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, next speaker. My name is Lee Brokaw. I'm a member of Santa Cruz chapter of ACLU from Northern California and still able to speak for the ACLU. California has immense economic inequality. Approximately 20% of Californians are classified as living in poverty, the highest in the country other than Washington, D.C. The poverty rate is even higher for youth. 25% of children are state under five or impoverished. Households living in poverty are disproportionately black, Latinx, or indigenous. California's high poverty and homeless rates cannot be explained by lack of jobs. The state has the fifth largest economy in the world, but also has the highest rate of homelessness in the nation. Half the households living at or below the federal poverty line spend more than half of their income on housing, leaving little left for other necessities. Result of unaffordable housing threatens millions of families with housing instability and the risk of homelessness. Recent studies show that Santa Cruz is the least affordable housing market in the entire country and the fourth least affordable housing market in the world. 
Therefore, it should not come as a surprise that Santa Cruz has a growing homeless population when we do not provide adequate protections for housing stability. The city can and must do better. We need to put in place fair and affordable housing protections so that people can keep their homes. Next speaker. Good evening, my name is Bruce Thomas. I'm an 18 year resident of Dufour Street and I'm here to alert the council to ongoing problems on Dufour Street. Um, this, these problems continue about, a, it was September 25th of uh, 2018, we presented, the neighbors at Dufour Street presented a petition asking for help and we've had great trouble getting all these uh, effective solutions to the um, problems brought on by the new Blaze Pizza and the Starbucks there. In fact, uh, Justin and Sandy, I told you about these at the, at the San Francisco Mine Troop thing last year. So I'm asking for help um, from the city council to monitor and um, see, maybe get some status on really finding an effective solution. The attempts have been made to try to solve problems with noise and the delivery trucks, waking people up and parking, double parking on the street. I've supplied photos. I did send an email to all of you yesterday with documentation showing some of the ongoing problems. So I'm asking for help. Um, uh, actually, a staff member of the city manager's office has called me Ralph. And so, but I'm asking for maybe status updates to the city council so we can really get this solved for a safe and health, health and welfare of our neighborhood. Thank you. Okay. If, if I could quickly Matthews. come in on that, we did get communications. I was under the impression that things had improved. So uh, if we could just get some kind of a report back. On, on yeah, I've asked Ralph. And I addressed this report in my email. Okay. And to uh, keep the council. And there's photos to say that yeah. things are not hunky-dory. Okay. There's double parking still going on. Yeah. Thank we'll you. get some updates. Right. Okay, sounds okay. Please. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Matt Wettstein. I'm the president of Cabrillo College, and I wanted to thank you for your uh, consideration back in June of AB 302, the bill that addresses homeless um, parking solutions for community college students. Particularly wanted to thank the mayor for reaching out to our staff to identify if we had any position that we had taken and the council for engaging in an open debate and allowing Cabrillo staff, Kristen Fabos, our uh, marketing and community communications director and our board chair, Christina Cuevas, to address you on that day. Um, how, housing and homelessness is a major issue for our students. and. Mm -hmm from a survey that we had done last year um, in connection with the Hope Center for um, studying these issues in, at Temple University. We learned that we have 20% of our students who reported being homeless in the last 12 months, that 50% roughly were dealing with food insecurity issues uh, during the same period. Uh, and as was indicated in a letter I recently sent, um, I was part of a CEO task force involved with this issue for community colleges last year. We had a number of recommendations, the most significant one of which is something that the legislature did not address in a meaningful way this spring, and we hope that it will come back next year. The single most important thing that can be done for our students is to ensure that they have access to Cal grants that allow them to pay for living and transportation and food expenses. If we can get that change, a lot of the homelessness and food insecurity issues will evaporate for many of our students in our system. But in a city like this where the cost of living is so high, and housing is so high, that is critical for our students. I wanna thank you again for your advocacy on behalf of our students. I want you to know that it is a critical issue for us we are engaged as a, as a uh, college and we are serving our students as much as we can. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Greetings, Mayor Watkins and council members. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I've lived in Santa Cruz for about 36 years and had a little business downtown for many, many of those years. I'm here tonight to talk about the proposed uh, mixed use library downtown and uh, this has been a some of the conversation in the community lately. And uh, I just wanted to share my thoughts. The proposed plan for a mixed use downtown library facility is nothing short of brilliant. The plan grew out of the creative thinking that values leveraging every tax dollar to provide citizens with the things they want. We want a larger, newer library with almost double the space for children and teens, as well as space to retain prized current programs like genealogy and immigration services. 
We want modern, fully accessible restrooms, and we want space for books and more computers and other technology. We say we want a modern, full-service library that is located near transit and other community services. We want all this, and we can have it too. Additionally, our downtown businesses and those who frequent or work at these businesses want more parking, and wouldn't it be great if it was centrally located? Uh, we are also painfully aware of how much we need affordable housing. And wouldn't it be great if that housing was located in our downtown where people could walk around instead of drive around our community? Unless we partner with these other uses, the other option limits us to a partial renovation of an existing building. A building 8,000 square feet short will have to reduce the number of books and services. The renovated library will not meet current user needs, let alone future growth. We'll spend all we have and have less to show for it. The proposed mixed use library, however, provides all that and more. I urge you to use our tax dollars wisely and build the best, most modern library possible. Get the parking our local businesses need and provide affordable housing in the heart of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm NateAlex.Kennedy at gmail.com. 346-9888. Uh, the first thing I wanna bring up here is the new 5G technology for cellular use. And it is way Nate, too fast. I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and pause you. We had that as our uh, on our agenda today. So uh, this is for items oh, that are not uh, on today's agenda. I wasn't here at that time. Okay, so the, the, it would be appropriate to talk to us about any other item that's not on today's agenda. So 5G we oh, didn't discuss. Okay, well then, then there was enough said there. Um, next subject. Uh, we have fortunately legalized cannabis in this state, one of the only states that's done it so far, and if we go back in history, 10,000 years back, people have been using it for anything and everything you can possibly imagine, clothes, paper, building materials, you name it. But uh, what we don't have now is a legal, legitimate place for people to consume it when they're when they're out in public, because you go anywhere in public, anywhere, and smoking the green stuff is still illegal. But uh, what I think we really need to do is we need to have several permits granted for what would essentially be uh, pot bars or pubs or tavern or whatever you wanna call it. I would happily start one myself, but uh, I need resources from other people, investors, people willing to work at it and all that. And uh, it's just, it's something we really need. We call this a free country, but you, it's not really that free. Um, that and uh, another thing about this, we need to focus more on industrial hemp that used for everything other than smoking it. And we, I think the city should take the forefront on this and grow thousands, like hundreds of thousands of hemp plants, <coughs> not kit. Not marijuana, but industrial hemp that we could use to make anything and everything you can pretty much imagine. Even Henry Ford himself made a car out of hemp in the 30s, all out of, all, all that he grew himself. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll have our next speaker. And then just for clarification for those, we'll go ahead and close oral communications after the last gentleman in line. Um, then we'll open it up to our evening items. So uh, the gentleman in the blue shirt with the beard, you'll be our last speaker for oral communications. And we'll go ahead and start with you. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. I'm here uh, to speak to the contract that's been offered to Supervisors Bargaining Unit OE3. I would ask that the council please consider their last best offer based on the following. I've been here for 37 years. This is the first contract I've ever seen rejected. Not only rejected, by, but rejected by 86% of the supervisors. Supervisors are your core of institutional knowledge in this city. They are the people that come up through the ranks, that show the greatest responsibility in rising through the ranks. They are the most responsible people that make the most decisions on any given day or night. They know their people, they know their equipment, they know their area. They make and keep budgets. 
Supervisors are that sphere where policy, life, and the work of the city that must be done all intersect, and they handle that every day. If you show a lack of concern for your supervisors, what does it say to the people we must supervise? And what does it say to those that may have an interest in taking these critical positions in the future? Please reconsider your offer. Hello, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Isef. I am also here with the OE3 Supervisors Bargaining Unit, and I am a supervisor myself for the Parks and Recreation Department. Seven years ago, I was extremely uh, fortunate to be hired by the City of Santa Cruz. I entered the city as a temporary part-time AA1, bottom of the wow. bottom rung. <laughs> um, I have achieved my current position the same as my fellow supervisors through hard work, dedication, integrity, commitment, sacrifice, all the things that you want, all the things that make myself and the other supervisors secure employees. Last year in the spring of 2018, myself and two boys were caught completely off guard. We were subject to landlord that is doing what so many landlords in the area are doing. They increased our rent by almost double. We'd been in that house for nine years since my boys were two and four. I was suddenly in a very unsecure situation. I have good credit, great job, great employment history, great references, great cr everything. It took me six months to find a place because most landlords here want three times what your rent is. We now found a wonderful place in Felton. It's a drive, but it's worth it. What I'm asking, what my fellow supervisors are asking is to have that sense of security that we provide to you, knowing that you guys are gonna get your, your work done, your programs filled, your, your drains cleaned, et cetera. Please, we deserve a fair and equitable contract. Thank you. At Kittle, Santa Cruz. <clears throat> Recently, uh, the Santa Cruz Sentinel banned me from making comments, and they erased all my comments with no explanation, simply because another commenter said, I'm reporting you for anti-Semitism. <laughs> well, what is anti-Semitism? I'll tell you what it is. It's any criticism whatsoever of Jews, Israel, or Zionism, any criticism whatsoever. And I'll give you an example. I've had uh, exchanges with uh, people of that bent online. I simply ask them, what is the harshest criticism of Israel, Jews, or Zionism that you would accept without calling it anti-Semitic? Did you get what I said? I'll repeat it if you didn't. I ask, and I ask everybody, what is the harshest criticism of Israel, Jews, or Zionism that you would accept without calling it anti-Semitic? <clears throat> crickets, crickets, crickets. Nobody wants to go there. They just automatically want to slam you down if you say anything about these subjects. And uh, we need to speak up. And this doesn't mean that there's hate involved, it just means that we need to have a fair exchange of ideas about these subjects. Because the Israel lobby is the most powerful lobby in this country. And if we don't stand up to it, if we allow them to intimidate us into silence, we'll continue to be sucked into wars in the Mideast that basically benefit Israel only. And I think that uh, anybody that wants to speak up about the Israel lobby, you should feel free to do it and don't let anybody tell you you can't. Uh, I was visiting a friend on um, Cedar Street and very late at night I noticed that she had a guest that lived in her, her, the doorway of her apartment, of her house. And she said, yeah, well, the day after Ross Camp was shut down and the, most of that week, you could hear people screaming and yelling over whose doorway was their doorway. 
And she was um, pretty disturbed that there were actually struggles and fights to, over the uh, finding a place to sleep in someone's doorway. And so we had the opportunity, particularly Justin, you had the opportunity to do something right, where we would have had a progressive majority that was interested in humanitarian issues and in the uh, poor of our community and the tenants of our community. If you had voted for the proposal to clean Ross Camp, remove the, enough people so it would be safe and make it a safe place so that those 300 people didn't have to find doorways on our streets. So I encourage you to go out there tonight at 11 and walk all the way from the post office on Cedar Street, go back across over to Front Street and walk back to the post office and see how many dozens and dozens of people are living in those doorways. So we're facing probably a, a pretty um, intense economic downturn. I don't know how many of you believe that there will not be a downturn in the next two years. Anybody here think that there's not gonna be a, a depression? The likelihood is very high. So if we can't even handle the number of people living on our streets today, how are we going to handle the thousands more who are forced onto the streets because of the collapsing economy? And that includes many of the people that currently right now have houses who are likely to have uh, faced foreclosure and end up living in the doorways of Santa Cruz. Thank you very much. All right. And you'll be our last speaker for oral communications. Um, Lyon, I agree that we gotta do what he's saying. We gotta keep finding more alternative campsites, more alternative living sites, make them fresh, clean, little houses, whatever alternatives we can. Gotta keep moving forward on this, just like with the environment. Now, what do we have is a big, another crisis with the recycling. No recycling in Santa Cruz anymore. I have to go to Watsonville, and that may end. So what are we, are we producing these products and not recycling them? And then before we were relying on third world countries, well that was kind of bogus too, because you know that wasn't gonna work. We need to have a sustainable system of our own. We need to start as a city and a county and ask the state to get money so we can redo the recycling system. We can't have replant it back then we gotta do it with ANS Metals, have a satellite site for them because they have lots of equipment to transport it. We gotta move forward on this, we can't just stop it. And there's a lot of people that are low income, not just houseless people that are dependent. Like when I was walking here, there was a pregnant woman I'd met before, Roy, really nice lady, and she picked up a can. I said, there's a couple more over there, and I told her about that she couldn't turn them in in town anymore. She didn't know about it yet. And she's saving those cans for her kids to go to school because she's low income. It's one of the only ways she can do it. She just got accepted up at the university to go to school. So that was really beautiful. Another issue we have, of course, is the bathrooms problem. Loud Nelson, we gotta open those back up. I even asked, okay, if I come here and play basketball, I can't use the bathroom, can I? No. <laughs> you gotta be in the program if you wanna use the bathroom. Loud Nelson would be turning over his grave. This guy's a freed slave who started this. The community center, we can't cut out anybody. Everybody's part of the community. It's just not fair. Thank you, Lyon. So we're gonna go ahead and close oral communications at this time. Um, I originally said that we were gonna revisit some of our consent agenda items at, after um, oral communications. I'm gonna go ahead and move those to the end of the meeting, knowing that we have a number of members of the community here who want to address us on our evening item. So um, we'll go ahead and jump right into the evening item, which is our data collection related to rental housing. And um, just for the flow, I'll go ahead and uh, remind our uh, council as well as our uh, community members members that um, those who, um, what we'll have is a presentation from staff and then we'll have a opportunity for uh, council to ask questions of staff and then we'll go ahead and open it up to community members who want to um, address the council on the topic. Um, I'll go ahead and allow for anybody who wants to speak for one minute to come forward and then group presentations and then the two minute time frame and then we'll return back to the council for action and deliberation. I just wanna remind those in the audience here that it's our uh, opportunity to hear um, 
our, our uh, professionals, as well as our council members, as well as each other, um, to hear their opinions and to allow them to voice those opinions without disruption or intimidation. Um, as I mentioned during oral communications, when others are speaking, um, to please refrain from speaking and, and refrain from any intimidation or um, making this so that this is not a democratic process that all can participate in. If I do see disruption, I'll ask that you, I will give you a verbal warning if I see it continue continued, I will ask that you leave. And um, I uh, want to thank you in advance for showing your fellow citizens that respect as well as our council and professional staff here who are here to present this on this item. So that said, we'll go ahead and turn it over to our staff presentation and we have the Sarahs um, here to present the item. Good evening. I'm Sarah Noisy with the advanced planning section in the planning department. Um, and with me is my supervisor, Sarah Fleming. and um, we're going to talk about a rental housing data collection effort to be initiated by the city. So a little bit of background. Um, June 11th, your city council received a report from a consultant about the feasibility to convene um, a citizen's task force related to rental housing issues. At that point in time, a uh, motion carried to bring back some recommendations at the June 25th council meeting about um, creating an online rental lease, rental increase, notice to quit, and eviction submission and tracking program. So we came, did come back on June 25th. Um, to discuss sort of a preliminary set of questions with your council, talking about what's the goal, what's the intended outcome of this program. Um, at that point, we got some direction from the council motion carried to bring back staff um, recommendations at this meeting to develop a rental housing data collection effort informed by a proposal that was provided by Vice Mayor Cummings at that meeting. That proposal was an attachment to this report, so it's available um, on the website through the agenda if any members of the public um, didn't get a chance to review that. Um, and focused on the number and frequency um, of rent increases, terminations of tenancy, and evictions um, happening within the city limits. So just a little bit of further background. Um, as was discussed in the uh, feasibility to convene a rental housing task force report brought by Dave Sappos, um, there was identified one, uh, one of the primary problems facing landlords and tenants right now in Santa Cruz is that there is a lack of mutually trusted data um, that both sides, for lack of a better terminology, agree accurately portrays the state of rental housing in Santa Cruz. Um, the Measure M campaign, both for and against, was largely based on anecdotes and conjecture. It was highly emotional and contentious. And um, I believe that the City Council's intention and our hope as staff is that impartial data could really answer the questions and tell the stories of landlords and tenants so that all parties see, feel accurately represented and heard and seen in the data that we collect. So um, our, one of our primary goals as staff is to really act as neutral collectors of verifiable facts. That's really what we want to have at the end of this effort. And we are hopeful that good data can lead to some good policy choices by your council. So I'm going to launch right into the staff recommendation. Um, given where the community is around this topic, we are recommending for now a limited term pilot program that would connect, collect some initial data and allow us to sort of get our arms around what this process needs to entail, what it looks like and how it works and how effective it is in meeting the goals that we have for it. We want to take an approach that's collaborative and unity focused and focused on really hearing all of our community members, those that are involved directly with rental housing and those that aren't. Um, as currently recommended in the staff report, the pilot would include all rental housing, so that includes units that currently are not subject to the rental inspection program, units that are owner-occupied where they rent a room, um, properties with ADUs, SROs and SOUs, mobile homes. We think so these are some of our more affordable housing types, and we want to capture that information. We don't think there's any good reason to exclude them from this effort. We're also at this point recommending that for the pilot program, it be a non-compulsory effort, and that there be um, no enforcement mechanism built into the program. We really want this to be an opportunity for community building and, um, and an opportunity to really see how effective it is. Um, so one of the other things that we want to um, be sure that we have as a component here is that we allow data to be input by both tenants and landlords, and that will allow us to get sort of a picture of how accurate is the data that we're getting. Are we, you know, 
does the data match? Is it, you know, sort of time stamped within like two weeks of each other, that there's been an event that occurred at a rental housing project. And we think that that will be a better way to sort of gauge compliance rather than building in some kind of an enforcement mechanism into this pilot program. Um, we are also recommending for um, ease of execution and in terms of staff resources and opportunity costs that this initial pilot program be operate exclusively online and not include a fee. There are some technical challenges with engaging in those efforts that are not insignificant. Um, certainly if your council really wants to go in that direction, there are things we could figure out. Um, and this is our recommendation that we not do those things at, those, at this time. Um, this would also allow us to create a program that could be initiated by a, a resolution rather than by an ordinance, which would allow the, the program itself to be a little bit flexible during its course of operation so that we as staff could like learn as we go and make some minor adjustments and changes as it happened. We wouldn't be bound specifically by a set of codes that was written before we really knew what was gonna happen. So, what I'm gonna go into now is our preliminary staff proposal. I wanna be really clear with everyone in the room that this is a preliminary proposal. It is going to be subject to um, a lot of community outreach. That's certainly our intention, is to launch this program with a big community outreach effort. Um, and also, I think it's important to really go through this in a, in a bit of detail so that we're all on the same page when we have this conversation. So my next several slides don't have any pictures. A lot of text. <laughs> so, um, and this is all uh, attachment two to the agenda report. Um, and I, I did take out, you won't believe this, but I did actually take out a little bit of detail um, here because, you know, kind of the typeface really just did get too small. So I'm just gonna, we're gonna go through this um, sort of point by point in an expeditious manner here. So based on the direction that we heard from your, city, your council um, the last time we were here, and the um, the proposed the purpose that was as was stated in the um, proposal that we received from Vice Mayor Cummings, these are sort of how we are interpreting the goals and the, the anticipated outcomes of this program that we will gain sufficient information to quantify and estimate the following items: the total number of all rental units in Santa Cruz, the mean and median rent amounts, potentially based on unit by unit type. Um, changes in rent, so the total number per any period of time, as well as the frequency that one unit may experience a change in rental amount, um, and then the percentage and direction of that change. Non-renewals of lease, the same, the total number per a time period, the frequency that happens, and then the timing. Um, is that a 30-day notice? Is it something else? Is it simply a non-renewal of a lease at the end of, at the, end of the lease? And then also unlawful detainer, which is, um, as I have learned, the technical term for an eviction. It begins with an unlawful detainer and notice to quit ends with an eviction when the sheriff shows up at the door. So there are, so, there are many steps. So um, that's what extent of process uh, means in that. So what point in the process of an eviction was reached before the situation was, was resolved. So these are sort of the goals as we understand them of this data collection effort. So in order to achieve those goals, the data that would be required is as follows. The address of a unit, so we can detect, we can determine what's a, you know, a unique address, a unique unit, the date the event occurred, the type of event. Is this an initial registration? Is it a new tenant, you know, or an initial rental of a unit? Is it a change in the rent amount? And then underneath each of these, you know, we would ask, what's the current rent, what's the proposed rent, how much notice was given, what, is there a reason for the change? So I put a question mark after that, and this was one thing that in the staff report, we actually discussed it two different ways. The, this was very much a team effort, and um, uh, rereading the staff report yesterday, I was like, oh, I see some things got a little changed around. So this question of should we collect a reason that a change, that an event is happening at a, um, at a rental unit, a reason that the rent is going up, a reason that someone is not renewing their lease. I think that's a question we should discuss with the community. We had feedback from our um, stakeholder groups that was kind of on both sides and we were leaning in one direction and then we were leaning the other direction. And um, I think that this is, it would be interesting to collect that data. I wanna hear more from the community about the utility of that and what those reasons might be. It, our intention is for this to be a drop down menu so that this is data we can really analyze. If it's a fill in field, that's much harder to sort of code and analyze if we're anticipating like 15,000 entries or something of, of that scale. So um, you'll see a question mark 
after the word, you know, reason in a couple of different places here. So further data, so this is now, sorry, so type of event, initial registration, initial rental, change in rent amount, change in the level of service, so like, is your landlord no, no longer paying utilities? They used to pay utilities, now they don't yet pay utilities. They haven't raised the rent, but your costs have gone up. So that, that's what we mean by a change in level of service. Um, is there a tenant initiated move out? If so, how much notice was provided? Mm -hmm. Was there a reason? A non-renewal of lease, again, timing, and it was there a reason? And then a non-renewal of a month-to-month -month tenancy or a termination of a month-to-month -month tenancy. And then um, the notice that was provided and any reason that may have been given for that. And then lastly, last the last two events um, was an unlawful detainer initiated via um, a notice to quit. Or was there a change in property ownership? So was the unit sold? If it was sold, um, if the person entering the information is a, it knows, you know, will the unit continue as a rental? Will it become owner occupied, held vacant, or we may not, we may not always know when these units change hands how they're going to proceed. So then, lastly, in order to give context to all of those events and you know the rent amount and um, you know, the season that these things happen in, we need to know the type of housing unit that is being entered, the size of that housing unit, and then the level of service. So what's included in the rent? Is it a furnished apartment? Is it, you know, does it have a parking space? Is there laundry on site? All of those things contribute to the rent that might be charged. So with all that information, so really, so let's just be clear, this is six fields of information that we would be requesting that people enter whenever one of these events takes place in a rental unit, um, either landlords or by both landlords and tenants. Um, so with that information, we could generate at least these statistics. This is just what I was able to think of. I'm sure, as with any data set, um, other people could think of other ways to you know, slice and dice it so that you could get um, other sort of information. But this would allow us to identify trends and make comparisons in rent amounts, terminations of tenancy by either party, the total number of rental units, vacancy rates, sales of rental units, conversions of rental units to owner-occupied units, and make those comparisons annually or watch for trends over time. We could, make, we could look for seasonal differences. We could see if there's differences between neighborhoods, if there are different pressures on different neighborhoods, and if there's a difference um, in the size or type of unit and how it behaves over time. We could then potentially, with the raw data set, you could identify trends for individual units or buildings. Um, and same with reasons. You could look for you know, changes in the reasons that people are giving for various events. Um, you could determine the value of individual units, potentially, if you can use the size and the neighborhood and the um, uh, level of service to sort of determine how much value um, a, a tenant might get from that. And then also, you know, sort of the ten tenant tur turnover rates for individual addresses potentially could be identified. So this is really just for discussion purposes, just so we're aware what, how this data could be used as we think about how we want to use it and how we want to make it available to the public. Um, because I will, um, next I'm going to talk about our stakeholder meetings. And one of the key pieces where there was not a lot of agreement was in how the data is made available to the public. Um, we met with both tenants and landlords. We worked with Santa Cruz Tenants Association to gather a group of tenants, and we worked with Santa Cruz together to gather a group of landlords and sort of vetted this outline that we have with them and sort of talked through our idea for the pilot and got some really um, useful feedback from them in general, which is summarized in um, attachment two as well there towards the end. Um, in general, tenants, um, we're interested in uh, several additional data points, um, which again, I'd like to you know, take those to, as part of the community outreach process. We're not recommending them at this point because we really are trying to keep this streamlined and focused and very simple. Um, and if there's something there that's really crucial to understanding the situation, we want to find that out and add it, right? So. Um, Tenants were interested in adding several data points and in, and in having like access to the database itself so they could run their own analysis and so that members of the public could really look at the uh, raw information and draw their own conclusions. Um, landlords uh, were, more, were very concerned about making sure that this process was something they could comply with and not that compliance is like compulsory, but that it was something that would be easy for them to do. So that's, you know, we really want to keep it streamlined, make it easy online, make it, you know, um, 
help them feel confident that they're you know, gonna be able to work this into their um, operation. And then they were also really clear that they wanted the data to be provided as aggregate statistics created by the city. Um, and so there's a question here of, is there a middle ground there? You know, is there some way where, where we could po provide um, sort of partially disaggregated data where we, you know, map it and we use our GIS to provide it based on like census block group. So we're not providing individual addresses, but we are allowing people to like zero in on a neighborhood and look at certain trends in different neighborhoods. Um, I don't know, again, I mean, that's, that's one of the pieces that we're gonna have to discuss with your council and with the public about what's the right way to make this information available to the public um, and to, and you know, to what end and all of, all of those things. There are some, you know, as you would imagine, privacy concerns, that's one of the reasons we're not recommending con collecting names of tenants that's not, um, it's not on the list of, um, of things, nor names of landlords. I mean, names of landlords are available if you know the address there's a little bit of work involved in that. Um, but that is definitely something we're keeping an eye on as we consider this process and move forward into um, the next stage, which is community outreach. So <clears throat> as your council is freshly aware, having just done your um, goal setting work plan item, um, there are some opportunity costs involved with initiating any kind of new program. Um, as we discussed in the letter, this, we have, set, there are several programs in the city that, that touch rental housing in various different ways. None of them are very well suited to generating statistics. They don't collect data that could be used to do that, but like the software literally doesn't work that way. So um, in talking with our IT staff and thinking about how those programs work and what they were initially created to do, um, we didn't find that there was any, um, any time savings or um, any anything was made easier by trying to feed into any of our existing programs that already kind of touch rental housing, which I understand is unfortunate for the consumer. And so yet an, another reason why we wanna make this, at least the initial pilot, really streamlined, really easy to um, get through and um, hopefully have a really high rate of compliance. So, um, IT and advanced planning would be sort of init initially involved in launching this pilot as we're currently envisioning it. Housing and community development would also be involved in terms of outreach to um, affordable housing providers. And, and then it also sort of consulting about how we handle affordable housing units within this database and then within the data sets and the statistics <coughs> that we generate, how do we identify housing vouchers, you know, there are several little details and we'll, so we'll be working with housing and community development on that, definitely. So our proposed timeline for this pilot as it's written um, in the staff report is that we would get direction from council today. Um, we would begin community outreach in September and have it run through early November and then be back with a resolution for your council to review and approve sort of November, December of this year, and then we would launch into creating the interface and the backend database and begin our notice and outreach to landlords and tenants, really, which would need to be a really robust effort if we're gonna capture um, as many rental housing units as possible. Uh, so we would wanna spend a fair amount of time doing that, making sure that we really had wide reach. So that would be sort of January to March, and then our initial re registration period would begin in April. Um, and we would give sort of initial registration we're envisioning would be sort of a 90 day window. And then we'd wanna collect about a year of data before we determined how well it was working. So um, that would put us back reporting to your um, council in August of 2021, which I understand looks like a really long time and is, is a really long time. It looks that way because it is that way. Um, and each of these steps is really important. We wanna be focused on bringing the whole community along with us and not shoving anything through too fast. We wanna make sure that we're doing all the right steps in the right order. We wanna make sure that everyone really has heard about it before it's too late for them to have input, for them to, you know, we don't want anyone to be hearing about this whole effort in June of 2020. I mean, I think that would be a really unfortunate outcome because you know they would be coming in late it would just so we really want to make sure that we have enough lead time to have a very carefully 
crafted program with a lot of public input that we have done a lot of notice and outreach to all of our property owners and tenants so that they're all aware that they're all involved and invested in this program. Um, and I think that's really gonna give us the best outcomes and the best data at the end of August 2021. So with all that, our staff recommendation is that your council consider creation of a pilot program of data collection on rental housing units in the city and provide direction as appropriate, including community outreach. Via, via oh yes, via a motion <laughs> approved by the majority of council members. So we're available for any questions. Okay. Are there any questions from um, the council for our staff at this time? Councilmember Matthews. I remember reading, but I can't find it. Estimated cost, it was quite a range. 30 to 125,000, yeah. I just read it. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit about the high and low? Sure, well, so um, there are a couple of factors. Um, as we've currently designed this, so should your council just say, you know what staff, you hit it nail on the head, just go do exactly what you drafted. It would probably be at the lower end of that spectrum. We've been here before and we know that rarely happens. So, um, <laughs> you know, that, it's a range, right? And it, it's gonna depend on, you know, do we hit any technical snags with IT? You know, right now, as we're currently envisioning it, it could be a pretty simple web form and put out into kind of an Excel database that we would then have access to to manipulate and create statistics and that's like, one way we could do it that would be pretty simple. If we get, you know, if we start adding program elements and changing things, it could expand and grow. You know, the one other sort of model for this type of effort that we've been able to identify is the city of El Cerrito. They don't have, they just launched a program um, for a rental registry. They, there are several things that are different about it. I mean, number one, um, it was approved sort of in line with a just cause for eviction ordinance. And um, that ordinance, you know, has gone through some uh, litigation. You know, there was an effort to sort of do a referendum about it, and the um, and their city council instead voted to um, just rescind the ordinance. So um, they are still doing the registry. They were also starting though from a place of all rentals in their city are already required to get a business license. So they were already starting from there of everyone had to get a business license, even if you're renting a room in your house. And um, so, and their software allowed them to sort of add this, or they did, they do all their noticing on paper. So they were able to just send another notice. Anyway, their, um, they're using about a half of a full-time staff member to just run that program. A lot of it's on paper though, so it's a massive data entry task. So ours would be different than that. Um, but we're also you know, not starting with having everybody already know they need a business license and so already having sort of a relationship with the city in that way. So there are similarities and differences, right? And so that's hence the range. Thank you. <laughs> Councilmember Glover. Uh, it's yeah, uh, there's a lot uh, going into it. Thank you for all of the great work we're putting it together. Um, I, there's a lot of moving parts to it, it seems like. Um, yeah, so you said you looked at El Cerrito. What are your thoughts on requiring uh, landlords to all register with business <coughs> permits? So, um, you know, I think there are a lot of, a lot of things we could discuss once we know how this part works, I think there are, you know, that it might be that having a, you know, a low cost or no cost business license simply as a way to capture that registration would be a good way to go. I think we won't know that until we really um, get through this process first. It, it's just because I know El Cerrito charges the $44 per unit uh, way to offset the cost associated with the program. Right. And then also, do you think that a simple web form that's non-compulsory that we won't get the data back until August of 2021 will really be reliable data uh, with regards to not knowing if, because if I was, let's just say I was a, a landlord that had the, the pattern of consistently increasing my rent or kicking people out because I wanted to get new higher paying students in there, I probably wouldn't turn in my voluntary registration information because then I would be targeted or be able to, or my actions would then be identifiable by the city and those looking at rental data. So I'm concerned with the non-compulsory aspect of it. I'm also uh, interested in what it looks like to have all landlords register as 
with as businesses with the city and then uh, levying a $44 fee on all of the units um, since I think we know or some fee that we decide on with regards to one step or the other, just with regards to uh, what that would look like as far as revenue generation, especially with our estimation of, um, of rental units that are currently on the market in Santa Cruz. And I mean, those numbers would be incredibly interesting and I think would kind of direct our decision most likely if we see that we could generate uh, enough for a half time person to come on and coordinate the process and then sure. you know all those kinds of conversations so it seems like there's a lot of opportunity for um, exploration and the other thing I was just con confused about was um, on the slide it said that the, the tenants wanted more data and transparency but the landlords wanted an easy process uh, but it seems like we're going with the easy process uh, and I know that we're in the middle of, of talking and all that kind of stuff but the way it's proposed right now is that it's just an easy process, non-compulsory, so it definitely seems like it leaves the tenant voice out of, out of the design process. So I, I hear that, and um, I would say this is uh, exponentially more data than we have ever had about housing right. units, so I think we're starting from a place of, um, I want to tell the story of tenants and landlords. I want to tell both stories. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, and I, I am not an expert in this field. I have learned so much about rental housing in the last four weeks, and I have a lot to learn still. We as staff have a lot to learn. This isn't really anyone's area of expertise here. So we are relying on tenants and landlords to tell us what's important to them. And um, there may be things that the tenants ask for that belong in this list. I would love to hear from your council if you have thoughts on that. I'd love to discuss it with the broader community and hear what they have to say about it. Um, you know, I, I think that there, there is a lot that's here already that is gonna, um, we, are, we as staff are gonna learn a lot in like operating this program and when we come back whenever, maybe you only want six months of data and then you wanna see how it's going. You know, I'm, I'm not here to tell you exactly what All to right. do, I've made a recommendation. And um, I think that we will know so much more once we get through an initial phase of this. Maybe it's not easy to run a web form and have it put out to Excel. Right now, it <laughs> seems like that should be pretty straightforward, right? But kinks come up. I, we wanna track our time so that we can, if, if should we set a fee, it would be an accurate fee, or at least the staff component of it would be like based on some real information. And then if there's an increment that the council chooses to add, right, obviously that's your prerogative. So, you know, we set these, we wanna have information to make these decisions with. And so we, are, we have come forward with a program that we feel confident we can execute. And um, if there are important things that are being left out, let's address that. Yeah. Um, I, do, I do think that in terms of like making a choice about having a business license or charging a fee, I really think that's premature right now. Um, we, there are some technical reasons that that's a little premature, and then I also just think um, we wanna walk this careful line of including everyone in this conversation and not setting anyone back on their heels to think that um, their voice is less important mm -hmm. or their story is less important. Yeah, I appreciate so that. So that's really, that's where our recommendation is sort of stemming from. And, and my main just concern, and I totally appreciate that because it's important that we hear from all the different community members and their needs, especially uh, the combination of tenants and landlords. Uh, my concern though is, is with the proposed timeline and the thought that we would be crafting ideas for policy after that timeline puts us you know, two years out uh, and in the meantime there will be people being actively displaced unless the council takes emergency action. So if we go with this timeline, um, then that's great but only if we have ten, temporary tenant protections in place in the meantime, in my perspective, but that's my question. So I believe, um, if, I, if I remember correct, correctly, Councilmember Crone and then Councilmember Myers had questions, and I don't know if I, okay. Thank Please. you, Mayor. Um, I saw you use the word SOU. Um, what, what, what is that and does it exist now? An SOU is um, a creature created in our, co our code. It's a small ownership unit. Um, it is sort of the ownership answer to an SRO, which is a single room occupancy. Those are typically rentals that don't have full, a full set of services in the unit. So an SOU is um, defined really, really dis 
distinctly and explicitly in our code. It's essentially a studio apartment. Um, we have a f one or two projects in the city that are SOUs. That, that exist now? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that somebody bought an SOU? Yes. Where so, is it? Uh, there's one, the one, the project at South Pacific uh, next to the turn. 555. The white building with the, you know when you're driving down Pacific and you're heading to the boardwalk <laughs> and you make that like left, that right bend and there's that it's just four story building. Five, five, five. Yeah, oh, 555. Yeah. Maybe it's 555. It's just past. Does anybody have Google Maps on their phone? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought that was old rentals. Uh, no, some of those units have been sold. They are allowed to, they're allowed to rent a portion of that. But, um, and they're the, they're the second project. There's another project in town, but I don't know where it it's is. It's like the 94 condos that were built there, right? Yeah. A couple, okay. Yeah. Um, the other question I had was, um, why uh, such, uh, could you talk a little bit about the privacy concerns again? Because I, I don't get it. I don't, I don't see how any of this is gonna be useful if people don't put the data on and the data becomes useful for someone to look it up. Um, and I understand, you know, they're doing it in a couple places already right now. So uh, wh wh what's, what's, what's the concern? So, um, so, I have a couple of concerns. Um, number one, I'm concerned about um, tenants that live, that are receiving a housing choice voucher and live in housing where their landlord receives a market rate rent and they don't pay a market rate rent. And I would be cautious about disclosing that publicly. I don't, I, I think that's a problem to identify the, those tenants. They would be identifiable by the rent that their landlord receives. It's a very specific amount. I think for one bedroom, it's like 1862. So you could conceivably scan through the list and identify all the Section 8 voucher holders by their unit. I have a concern with that. Um, number two, uh, what we heard from landlords is that they have concerns, people who own one rental unit um, and that, that someone could look up the information on their one rental unit and then make some assumptions about their income based on what they're able to find out from the rental database. Um, maybe that could be addressed by providing s different cost information from the landlord, you know, uh, so that that information is put in some kind of context. We're trying to balance that with not making it too complicated to, co to participate. So, um, I think that there are just some, some challenges in making this um, completely open source data available to the public. I think there's some sensitivities around that and if the community wants to go there, it should be a community discussion about it. If your council feels really strongly one way, obviously we're gonna you know, hear what you have to say. But I think that you know, landlords are also concerned with tenants being able to compare rents within the building and you know, one tenant that's been in their unit for 20 years may be paying a different rent than someone who moved in two, two or three years ago, which we would all kind of expect. And I could see how that would create some tension in a building. Um, you know, I think there, I think there are there are some questions that we can explore around that. Um, you know, I'm interested to hear what the council has to say. And, and as I understand, Alameda and El Cerrito are doing it now, and they they're they're collecting this information and. It is available, all the Section 8 rents are available, and you, you can... You can look up individual units. That's what I'm asking. Um, so, so Alameda, I don't believe you can do that. Alameda collects the information, they review it. They have a rent control ordinance in Alameda that applies to certain units and not to others. So certain rents trigger administrative action by the city. So they're collecting it to view that information. I don't, I have not encountered, does not mean it doesn't exist, but I haven't encountered an open source database of rental information. I haven't found that. Thanks, and just so everybody knows, all of our, most of our salaries, if you're a public employee, that's, it's sure. already, mm -hmm. you know, public. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Council Member Myers. Uh, I just had a question kind of in your process of thinking through this. So we um, approved the um, large rent increase ordinance last January. Uh, and so I'm just kind of wondering where, you know, the signal in, we may have missed that signal to some extent, correct, because of the timing of that. But um, I'm just curious about um, just your thoughts on 
for example, I noticed you, you mentioned that we could ask the reason for the change, for example, in a change in rent amount, you know, and so do, would you envision, um, I mean, because I think that's an important thing. I mean, I think that we have a policy in place that may either dissuade people from raising rents over a certain amount, or it may cause people to raise, potentially raise rents, the annual limit each year. So I'm just curious about, um, could you, could we capture that in this reason for change or did you think through that? Because we sort of have this policy that's come into place, um, which is a little different than sort of even this, the history of two years ago. So. Well, so when we, um, when we, draw up that initial list of like reasons that an event might have taken place, maybe that's one of the reasons we should add is like maximum allowable annual rent increase. I think it would be an important, if I we did ask that question, I think it's allowable. important to. Right. Yeah, not allowable, that's correct. I mean, and the, it's important to remember, you know, what that policy does, right? It's, t it's about relocation expenses, it's not about controlling the rent. Exactly. Um, but, so, you know, we would find the right phrase to say that, you know, maximum allowable under under county, city code XYZ. Mm -hmm. Maximum, you know, Councilmember cited, Brown. yeah. This is uh, probably a topic for a longer term conversation and I hope that um, through this process that hopefully gets set up um, to move in that direction, we can talk about it, but I do think it's worth um, also acknowledging that our um, large rent increase ordinance at least from what I'm hearing, it has a tendency to actually um, promote evictions because rather than paying relocation fees for, for those landlords who don't necessarily care who's living in their unit, they can find a new tenant and not have to pay the relocation. So just wanna put it out there that we should be thinking about that as part of this conversation for future direction. Any other questions from council at this time? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and first thank and acknowledge the staff for within a short period of time um, providing a really comprehensive uh, recommendation over the summer months. So just wanna acknowledge and appreciate your work here in bringing this proposal forward. Um, yeah, kudos to the staff, seriously. Um, so, at this point, I realize that some folks may have to uh, leave a little bit early or um, want to just briefly share, I'm so, a supporter, I'm against, or however. So I would like to open up pu public comment as I suggested at the very beginning of um, starting this item, that any individual who would like to address the council really briefly will be able to do so in one minute first. Um, once we're concluding the one minute, kind of just wanted to share X, Y, and Z with you. We'll go ahead and open it up to the two presentations that reached out to me in advance to have additional time, at which time then we'll return to the two minute portion of um, public comment. So any individuals before we move to presentations want to briefly address the council in one minute? Please. Uh, good evening. Good evening, my name is Gail Jack. And thank you all for this and for staff. Um, I just wanted to say I sent an email this afternoon supporting this project. Now I'm not so sure as I hear the presentation. And my concern is how long this is gonna take and what happens to our tenants over two, two and a half years as council member uh, Glover has pointed out. I think we need to, if this goes into effect, I need. I think you, I would encourage you to figure out what needs to be done in the interim. Because if, as uh, has been pointed out, we're finding landlords going to the limit on what they can raise rents on, we're gonna have more homeless and more people <clears throat> leaving the city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other I, I also agree that um, we should definitely um, do something as an emergency now. Um, if you are a tenant, you're living in total anxiety in this community. And the uh, this kind of a study I think would have to be done where tenants and landlords have to report every single month because there's going to be total chaos in, in, 
<laughs> anyway, with people being evicted at such massive uh, uh, amounts. The other thing is, be interesting to know how many of these units are owned by people that don't live in Santa Cruz, let alone in the state of California. And in my experience of trying to rent apartments in this town, it, the f foreign owned, which means maybe somebody from Chicago or DC or New York or something, the people that own those properties will never rent to me because, you know, of, of um, all kinds of uh, status. The most common being having been co convicted of a misdemeanor for trying to put free speech boxes on Pacific Avenue. Thank you very much. Any other individuals interested in addressing the council in one minute? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll go ahead and invite up um, our presentation folks. We have, I had Robert Norris from Huff. I'm not seeing Mr. Norris here, so we'll go ahead and invite up uh, Mr. Uh, Ke Keshav Kumar from the California Apartment Association to have uh, up to four minutes. Um, and to remind the community that everybody has an opportunity to address the council without threat and intimidation. Anybody who wants to address the council for two minutes, you're welcome to line up to my left and we'll go ahead and go down the line at that time. So you'll have up to four minutes, Mr. Kumar. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Watkins and honorable members of the City Council. My name is Kesav Kumar and I'm here representing the California Apartment Association. We are opposed to invasive data collection methods that are traditionally tied to rent registries. A traditional rent registry would invade the privacy of both landlords and tenants, requiring the disclosure of information such as addresses, utility costs, and the number and size of bedrooms and bathrooms in a unit. It would also make each tenant's rent payment history or non-payment history potentially public information. Data sub submitted to the city could be made public if it wasn't already, either through a public records request or by a subpoena through a state or federal agency. The purpose of the registry is to provide data on rent changes and evictions in the city. However, the data request that the city council originally proposed went too far beyond that purpose to include items outside of that scope, such as the square footage of each unit and property amenities. CAA views the originally proposed registry as an unnecessary burden on each property owner to create and maintain records that may not ever see the light of day. With all of this in mind, the California Apartment Association supports city staff's preliminary pilot program in its current form. Some of the things that we see as being important are that it will not collect lease documents, it will not collect documents in support of proposed landlord action, it will not collect the names of tenants, it will not collect previous rental data, and finally, it will not be enforced by a city entity. We also support, we also support the proposed timeline outlined in the memo. The timeline highlights the fact that snapshots of rental trends do not work. Having a year's worth of data will give the City Council a far better understanding of Santa Cruz's rental situation. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll go ahead and ask. Rent strike, rent strike. We'll go ahead and ask that if you want to take a phone call, please do step outside, sir. And if uh, those who are in the audience uh, wouldn't mind turning down their cell phones, that would be great. If you'd like to take your phone call, you're welcome to do so outside. Um, at this point, we'll go ahead and allow for the folks who want to address the council without um, interruption to come forward, and you'll have up to two minutes. I don't know what she said. I'm Nora Hockman. I am not a landlord, nor am I a tenant. So uh, let me just say a couple of things. They're gonna be a little scattered. First of all, it was quite a stunning presentation from your staff who <laughs> has now buried us in the bureaucracy of kind of nothingness. Because if you really push this program out, Half of you will not be here when this comes back to a council. And for some of you, that's a really good thing that you will not be here. But it begs continuity. That's what it's begging. That's number one. So it's way too long a timeline. Number two, that very first slide that went up that said something about unity and collaboration is not possible, and I say in the most neutral way, one group of people holds power, absolute power, over the other. 
When you have that situation, much like with OE3, although they have the power of their labor and they may yet flex it, but when you have a group of people that holds power over the others, you cannot achieve unity and collaboration. Number three, once again, the apartment association is in the room. They don't live here. They don't have to deal with this. And finally, the woman that you just heard from, who has worked for the city for seven years, who now lives in Felton, is your exhibit A as to why this ought to be a six-month pilot project with consideration of extension at the end of that time. Uh, Nicholas Whitehead, uh, co-founder of Conscience and Action. Um, I don't see how these statistics could uh, be objective. They're going to be skewed because they're only voluntary. So you're not going to get accurate, complete data this way. This, this is not professional. This is kind of guesswork. And the onus to report is probably going to be very heavily on the renters and the advocates for renters. Wh why would landlords want to uh, comply with this? So if the onus is on the renters, then that builds up the possibility of great animosity towards those renters who do the reporting. You gotta be aware, aren't we trying to reduce animosity between two factions in our county? Hopefully we are. Um, I, I think owners would also suspect how this data might be used in the future. And I'm not the first speaker to say that. Um, so I'm worried about potential retaliation against renters because I know a lot of renters have been retaliated against, especially if they're organizer types. And since the address would be given, it would be easy to identify who might have reported. And another, from my final thing is, what about including landlords' costs of maintenance and repair work? I mean, if you're gonna do a survey, don't you wanna include that? Some landlords struggle with that aspect. Uh, Garrett Phillip, a right, couple of three points. One is whatever cost this has will eventually be paid by the tenants. You, you do know that. Uh, secondly, I um, did a study back in November or whatever using best data I could, and my conclusion, and you go off check this yourself if you want, but the ratio of rent to asset price of single family houses is the same today as it was in the year 2000. So things haven't really changed. We've just had a lot of inflation. Uh, the argument then could be made, well, you could say, well, uh, rents are too high, or you could equally say incomes are too low. Actually, the data kind of suggests incomes are too low. Uh, at any rate, I'm gonna try to read through the best I can here. Um, uh, I'll start in the middle, I guess. Uh, landlords are mere retailers of rental housing. They abide by the same laws of supply and demand or wholesale to retail prices as any other retailer. It is a free market. Tenants can choose to live where they want if they can pay just like shoppers can buy where they want anytime it's offered as they choose any retail product. And I would add that the power that tenants have is the power to move. Uh, while they don't, they don't have to be oppressed, okay? Why landlords are subject to the harassment of the city council like this is not well understood and it makes little sense. That a small number of other cities harass their landlords and violate privacy rights means little to me. Ask Safeway or all the retailers in town to report price changes or refusals to provide service and see how that goes over. Uh, for I hope the last time I state that it is no more factually reality to state rents are too high than to state incomes are too low for some to live here. This is a Trojan horse attempt to justify rent control, implement some of its structure as a, you know, a trial thing that turn into, might turn into something else. Um, uh, even though there is, uh, excuse me, uh, you wanna implement some of the structure of rent control even though there is no rent control and the people don't want it as proven by the defeat of Measure M. Next speaker. Hi, um, I'm Reggie Meisler. I live in uh, Santa Cruz. 
I just find it really disturbing that the California Apartment Association, an opponent of a lot of tenant policy throughout the state, loves this policy. I think that this policy is meant for tenants. The reason we even have this policy here is not because landlords want data collection, it's because tenants have high rents and they have concerns about that. So I just think that's bizarre. Also, the main driver of cost in this policy is from a landlord request because they wanted it to be easier to use and so you're paying a lot of software cost. So I'm just pointing that out as well. Um, and then also like look at how this policy is written. Landlords want aggregated data, tenants want transparency. These are in opposition to each other and then one is seemingly chosen over another even though this policy is for tenants. And then landlords keep coming up here with California Apartment Association telling us that they're concerned about tenant transparency when clearly the outreach says tenants favor greater transparency. So, I mean, this is just so disingenuous. Um, and uh, just one last point about the subpoenas and this bizarre idea that we do records requests for data. I mean, that takes weeks, months to get. I, ha I asked for vacancy data from PG&E six months ago and I still haven't gotten it. So this is just ridiculous. So that's all I have to say. Hi, Darius Mosinine. Um, I really learned something new tonight, that there aren't, landlords don't, aren't charged business licenses. So do I talk to the finance department about getting a refund on the $900 a year I've spent in the past 30 years on business licenses for my rental properties? There is a, every property, not a landlord, but every property does have a business license. <clears throat> Maybe it doesn't apply to single family homes, but um, so I just want to correct that um, uh, statement there. <clears throat> uh, second, um, I'm concerned about, I, I like the idea of the data collection. To me, it's like uh, Zillow for Santa Cruz rental, rental market. We get to see what's going on uh, as a landlord, but I'm really concerned about the cost and so forth. And I thought before you embark on what could be an expensive and dubious result uh, pro project, do a focus group of just random tenants, not tenant activists, random tenants selected, give them, entice them with a $10, $20 Starbucks peach coffee gift card, you'll get a great showing, and it'll be 100, 200 random tenants sprinkled throughout the city, focus group, ask the very same questions. I, I would suggest doing that prior to kicking off such a, um, such an endeavor. And lastly, I'm still confused by the cries of displacement. What does any self-respecting, <clears throat> digitally proficient Santa Cruz resident do when they have a beef? They start a Facebook page. I have yet to see anything on Facebook, any of the Movement for Housing Justice pages, any of the tenant activist pages, any of the, the Santa Cruz rental pages of anybody complaining about being displaced. And Facebook is like our, you know, that's where we air our grievances. So help me out with it. Thank you. All right. I'll just remind the community to allow the individual to speak whether or not you agree with them without disruption. Please. Thank you. My name is Fred Antaki. I'm a commercial real estate uh, manager. I work in the city of Santa Cruz and elsewhere in the county. And I'm also an advocate for uh, affordable housing. Um, and I guess I want to say the end goal of our collective efforts, I think the collective efforts of the people in the city should be to increase the supply of housing, and in particular affordable housing. So in my opinion, the, the registration, this rental registration may sound like a, an innocuous measure to those who favor a price control approach to addressing the housing crisis, but I think as proposed by the majority council who initiated or supported this, it's an invas invasive compulsory rental registration, I think it's a thinly veiled attempt to circumvent the overwhelming defeat of Measure M, which lost by a 62 to 38 uh, percent vote last fall. Um, if this is made compulsory, which adds financial and operational burdens on to people who are landlords, you will succeed in driving more housing providers out of the market, particularly those who rent uh, single family homes, which happen to be the bulk of rentals in the city. This is a fact supported by data pr that we provided to the council. It was uh, showing that somewhere between 30 to 100 units were lost during the run up to and as a direct result of the threat of Measure M last fall. You cannot win by declaring war on landlords. 
If you're serious about implementing real long-term solutions to our housing crisis, you need to reach out to a broad spectrum of leaders who represent the interests of our entire community, including affordable housing advocates, tenants, landlords, property managers, and housing developers. And rather than try to make good on a campaign promise to pass rent control come hell or high water, I invite you to reach out and engage with all sides and stakeholders and do the hard work to find common ground because it is hard and I appreciate your efforts, what you're doing in general, but um, don't succumb to the kind of divisiveness that we see played out on the national level. So I would ask that you vote against the rental registration ordinance as proposed and work towards creation of more affordable housing. Thank you. Thanks. Good evening, my name is Mary Breslin. I'm a long-term resident of Santa Cruz and I just wanna show my support for this very um, efficient and kind proposal made by these two ladies. I think they did a thoroughly wonderful job of considering landlords and tenants. Landlords need to be considered as much as tenants, 50-50. I'm a landlord in another city and my property was remodeled and maintained in such a way that I put my tenant um, as a very prized individual. I'm not a greedy person. I don't know any greedy landlords. So I think, I don't know any greedy landlords. <laughs> so this plan that was sensitively constructed by this committee should really be considered over any kind of coercive effort to get landlords to bend to the will of a small group of this in this town who are angry and not able to live here economically. That's not a landlord's fault. Really technically is not a landlord's fault. So those of us who are very average middle-class business people in this town, we just ask for your consideration in making a plan that will ease us into something that both parties could be could work with. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nancy Crusoe. Um, I'm a tenant and I have really strong feelings about this, so I will keep it under control, but I don't feel as a tenant that I am ever listened to in this town or ever have been since in the 20 years I've been here. I think when we solve issues, we tend to solve them in the direction, as someone has said, of those who hold power. This is not a hate thing. This is an ask for some equality, a voice of, uh, 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 of rights, of transparency. If this is not enforced, it will invalidate the whole collection. If it takes two years to get information where, and we still don't enforce it, what good is it? If we don't require business licenses and unit fees, what are we gonna pay for it with and why wouldn't we? They are a small, small offering. Oh, I thought you were uh, motioning to me over there. <laughs> so, I think it should be required. I think it has to be required to have any meaning. We have listened to owners always in this country and in this state. The state has 40% tenants. We have more than 50%. We vote. We're just like owners, except we don't own the homes, but we respect living here. We don't wish to be transient. We would like to stay and have a voice, and we would like this to happen and happen now with full force. I th oh, one more thing before, one more thing about uh, information. I consider it important to know and from this, there's no reason not to know who owns a property. Are they in or out of state? And follow patterns. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Stacy Falls. I think I've told most of you that I recently got uh, kicked out of my home of 11 years, my rental of 11 years, and if I haven't complained loudly enough about that, I wanna complain about being kicked out of my home of 11 years. Sorry, Darius, that I wasn't loud enough about that. Um, I didn't wanna leave because switching homes isn't the same thing as switching the store where I buy tomatoes. 
Okay, I got kicked out of my house. I spent a lot of time looking at Craigslist. Uh, in the three months that I was looking, the cheapest rental that I found was a $1,900 studio apartment. So the, the owner of the cheapest rental in town is making over $20,000 a year. This is big business, and this needs to be controlled like business. We need to know what these business folks are doing in our town. 60% of Santa Cruz residents are renters. Their pocketbooks are directly affected. But I would argue that the high cost of rent affects everybody because we all count on low and middle income renters, teachers, nurses, sanitation workers, service workers who clean our hotel rooms and work at the boardwalk. We depend on those people and our entire economy is being eroded. And the city has a vested interest in figuring out what is going on and what can be done about it. I have a pretty good idea. My hypothesis is that it's because of skyrocketing rents. And I know some landlords will tell you, oh, it's not, the rents aren't going up that much and I treat my tenants like family. Great, fine. So let's collect the data and you can prove me wrong. I don't understand why anybody would have a problem with getting more information. This needs to be compulsory. It needs to be timely. This business needs to be tracked like the business that it is, a huge business that impacts the entire town. Hi there. Uh, my name's Jeb uh, Santa Cruz, and uh, I second everything Stacy just said, actually. Um, I wanted to say, so I was in the tenant focus group for this one, and this presentation bears very, very little resemblance to the conversation that we had, which was largely about enforcement. And to hear, to come back and then have, have no enforcement mechanism, completely voluntary process, I was shocked. I, I left that meeting relatively positive on the process, and now I, I wouldn't be in, in favor of this thing. Um, beyond that, though, I think the, the, the bigger problem that I have with all of this is the idea that we need to somehow, in thinking about, even in thinking about the data collection, we need to balance the interests of all of the parties. When we're interested in climate change, we don't say, well, what are the facts that the, that the oil companies want to give us, and what are the facts that the environmentalists want to give us, and then try and, try and figure out some sort of happy medium. There are facts that are needed for the conversation, and the city has an obligation to collect whatever is needed to, to facilitate this conversation. And for those of you that were elected by tenants and, and that were elected uh, on a platform, have, have spent time campaigning on rent control, if we can't even get a robust data collection effort like on the books here, I don't even know what, what the city council is for. I mean, this is the most, this is the most minimal tenant, tenant protection that we can possibly get. And I think that you all should be doing whatever you can to make sure that what we get is enforceable and includes, I think that most of the information that we're looking to collect is, is good. This is what we need. I think it should absolutely include uh, identifiable landlord information. All of this stuff should be in there as well. But uh, enforceability is key and, and we have to get this done. And faster than a year and a half from now. Uh, my name is Barbara Riverwoman. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to cry over spilt milk tonight. I think we had a much better solution to this whole thing. I'm going to say it was the rent board. That would have been a great institution to collect all the data, and it wouldn't have cost one cent. It didn't cost a cent in Berkeley. It didn't cost a cent in Oakland, other cities that have rent control. If we had had a rent board where renters and landlords could bring their complaints over time, we would have exactly the kind of information we needed, the kinds of problems that come up. We don't have that. It would have been cost zero, not $125,000. Could have gone into, into operation really quickly. We wouldn't have had to wait an outrageous two years. The second thing I'm crying over spilt milk is all of these studies We've had the housing blueprint, we've had all of these studies, listening sessions, and now it's gonna go back into a deep dive into the community. We've been yelling at each other for five or six years. We've heard each other out. We, we had an opportunity, and this is the second missed opportunity, to have a task force. And the saddest day in my life, after Measure M failed, was to see an empty chambers here, nobody from 
the anti-measure M people, nobody from the, not too many from the pro-measure M people, wanting to sit down to the peace table and talk to each other and come up with reasonable solutions. And I don't think all of these deep dives and all these listening sessions are gonna come up with solutions because they're not solution oriented. It's gonna take a structured, solution oriented, professionally guided thing like with the Water Supply Committee to actually come up with a solution. And otherwise, it's just gonna be the powerful against the non-powerful and we're not gonna get anywhere. So I'm crying. Hello, council members, uh, Faz, let me here in Santa Cruz. Um, I really appreciate the thought that's been put into this about the, or more, more so the intention about doing this. I think it's important. I think it's the bare bones of writing good policy, right, is for us to have data, right? Um, and I also like how had Gail had mentioned and how others before me had mentioned, they came into this meeting thought, thinking that this was something we're gonna support. Um, I have to say the non-enforcement mechanism is something that is very concerning for me. Um, just from a data perspective, right? I mean, professors can tell you this, right? If you're a researcher and you're doing data and you're voluntarily allowing people to file that data, you've already created a bias. You've created a bias of, of landlords who are who are price gouging their tenants and who are unfairly evicting their tenants, not reporting that data. And you have the landlords who are like, well, I'm not, you know, and, you know, thankfully for the good landlords who don't do that, you know, they'll be like, well, I'll report my data anyway. You're already creating a skew in that data and it's not gonna be accurate. And so I think that just, I, I appreciate the intention. I just don't think this is really gonna do what we're trying to do, which is find unbiased data. Um, it's just not gonna be reliable. I'm not gonna trust it, and I don't know if anybody else is gonna trust it considering the fact that it's not enforceable. So I think if we had that component, I think if we explore that component, I feel like it would make this pilot program a little bit more effective. So I really just urge you to think about that. Um, and yeah, so thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Martha, and I'm a landlord to a home I inherited in another county, uh, meaning my father had to die for me to be a homeowner. Uh, and I'm also a renter here in Santa Cruz and a Santa Cruz County employee. I also am a counselor for students at UCSC. As the data collection plan stands, I, I can't support it. Additionally, I'm skeptical of any proposed data collection plan developed by city council. You've been collecting data information and hearing stories of people's hardships for years and still have done nothing. Does this mean you will do nothing in the meantime? We need rent control, just cause eviction and relocation fees or some type of protection for renters now because the problem is happening now, not a year from now, not two years from now. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Scott Graham. Um, there's a few problems with what's proposed here. One is how long it's gonna take to implement this program. I think you could have a couple of uh, public meetings, community meetings prior to, November, prior to October and have the site up and running by October. You don't need to like march around town for a year before you uh, get people's input. Um, Secondly, I think this could eventually do harm to some tenants that leave negative things about their landlords on the site. So there would have to be some sort of a whistleblower law put into effect to make sure that tenants aren't uh, kicked out of their houses for saying what's true about the property that they live on. Um, the other thing is that this could be a double-edged sword. It might not only be good for tenants to find where the best housing is or the cheapest housing, but also landlords could look at it and say, hey, that guy two blocks from here is charging $500 more a month than I am, so I'm gonna kick these people out and raise my rents $500. And, you know, so the fact that it's not compulsory is also a problem because you're gonna get data that is probably gonna be unusable in a lot of ways. If it was a compulsory program, then hopefully the data would be more reliable. And so I think there's a lot of good that could come out of this program, but there's also some possible 
problems that need to be resolved before you implement this. Thank you. Evening members of city council, Mayor Watkins. Um, regardless of what you ultimately decide uh, this program should look like, uh, something that I really wanna talk about is privacy um, and privacy of information uh, for tenants specifically. Uh, I'm a tenant in the city of Santa Cruz. And I think that if you collect uh, financial information, like how much money I can afford to pay at my current address, and in a renter application in the future, a uh, different landlord asks me, you know, where was your previous address or do you have any references as to where you used to live? And they can see that I was able to afford more that could negatively affect me in the future. So um, I have moved several times um, while I've lived in Santa Cruz uh, because I found a better deal. And I didn't have to disclose that to my, to my you know, tenant necessarily. I could, you know, I, if, I, if I wrote other references of other landlords saying that I was a good tenant, maybe I didn't have to disclose that one where I had just lived. So I just want to make you aware of the potential impacts it can have uh, for tenants, I want to, you know, I've taken an oath to protect the Constitution of the United States. Uh, the Fourth Amendment um, keep, supposed to keep me, you know, sa my, my privacy safe. And I want you to be, you know, very conscious and aware of that, uh, of all the potential effects uh, that it can have um, in a, you know, a, a tenant's life. And, you know, if I'm negotiating salary, I don't know. I just, there's just many other things that um, having my address where a lot of people know where I live and the amount of money I can pay uh, disclosed to the public or available to the public. It's concerning. So please keep that in mind. Thank you. So, I just want to get a sense of who else um, would like to address the council on this item this evening. I did not get your request. Friday and today. Friday, I sent a request I did not receive that request. Did you receive that request? Okay. Well, you'll have. Um, well, you can have your two minutes. I'll go ahead and compromise. For more time. I'll give you. Th I'll give you three minutes. Having not seen it, I. I truly did not see your. Not my fault that you didn't see it. I sent it, and I can show okay. you that I sent it. Why don't we go ahead and have? Um, unless you hear back from me, it's usually not granted, and so well, sometimes I asked it could. You today was it granted? I didn't get any answer at all. Um, we started the meeting at 10, 10 a.m. today, so I didn't have a chance to check my email. I'll go ahead and compromise. We'll give you three minutes to, to speak on behalf of your group. Why don't we go ahead and allow you to come forward? I don't have any more groups. We did groups earlier. Um, is there any other members of the community who want to address the council on this item? Okay, why don't we go ahead and have you do your presentation in three minutes, and then we'll conclude with the last of the public comment. <coughs> So some of you have been re accepting data from spurious politically biased sources that without requesting the source data, so that's not a good practice. So um, in the stop, you know, you talk about a temporary, uh, I mean, a opportunity for community healing, but um, the, the temporary respite of another rent freeze would be the best healing balm for the tenants. Collecting data to answer questions about why you should stand up for tenants is a good place to start. Uh, a, a lot of cities are enacting ordinances that require more community participation from rental property owners and many are cities without rent control. I believe a per unit fee would pay for one full-time employee for the rent registry. El Cerrito has 20,000 people, we have 65,000 people. We have more units and that's more money, but they pay the person the same. So um, just as business licenses and tax information let you know what kinds of businesses, how many there are, et cetera. So the rent registry lets you know the economic impact of the rental market. Speaking of business licenses, some landlords object to having identifying information released in a public record. But um, heads up, landlords with business licenses have had their names and their home addresses and their rental properties listed forever in the city's public business license database. I looked at it today. I doubt any of them have sued each other, the city, or anyone over that fact. Um, the um, privacy concern is fake news and a red herring. Here's a short list of big and small cities that have required or currently require owners of single family rental homes and duplexes to buy a business license. Lancaster, Los Angeles, El Cerrito, Richmond, San Diego, and Fort Bragg. There's many more. Santa Cruz has been missing out on a lot of revenue, 75% single family homes. You're not charging for um, people who rent their single family home out. These are landlords, corporate landlords, people who live in other states and countries and cities. And they 
their average $3,000 unit, $3, unit grosses 36000 a year, but many houses gross much more than that. And, and many landlords don't live in the city, but their business impacts are streets, water, garbage, and traffic. And it's not too much to ask each landlord to pay a reasonable fee to help out. And um, landlords receive the right to practice in a landlord's market. First and foremost, the city's had dismal rental vacancy rates forever. Landlord information is also readily available from the county assessor and recorder's database. There's no legal reason to suddenly disaggregate it from the public record. Landlord information, um, this is simply a demand meant to slow down progress on a law that could reveal rental market data that's here, heretofore been collected privately by landlord groups such as CAA, et cetera. Retroactive data collection is not doomed to failure. Businesses keep records. Landlords file their income taxes and many of them get lots of big deductions so they do keep records. And I've included the city's current business license application form. It says at the bottom, I declare under penalty of perjury that the above information is true and correct to the best of my knowledge. You can have landlords do exactly the same thing like business owners do. It's really not a stretch. Uh, tenant information should not be collected at all. We never wanted it to be. You're welcome to leave your remarks here. Okay. So this will be the opportunity for anybody who wants to address the council for this portion. So we'll go ahead and see. I have two, if I'm reading correctly, two folks that want to come forward. Is that correct? Okay, we'll go ahead and well, you're welcome to blocked. submit them. No, there was somebody behind you. I said you can do your presentation first. Maybe so if there's any that. other members of the community, we'll have um, uh, these two as the final input. Please. Hi, I'm Susan minutes. Karen. Um, I participated in the relocation ordinance meeting, and I really appreciate the staff's recognition that those providing rentals are an important part of the equation. We do have a lot of experience. Some of us have done this for our entire professional careers, and we know rental housing that most people, information about rental housing that most people might not have at their disposal. I really liked what Sarah said about telling both tenant and landlord stories. I think that's one of the most balanced things I've heard through this entire process, and I just want to applaud that. Second, tenants do not have to identify themselves, is my understanding, through this process that was proposed, but landlords do, and I'm wondering why that is. Um, what, what safekeeping would there be that tenants are, are providing real information, okay, or that they're real tenants? I just, there's a certain level of distrust that was identified by the um, consultant before, and unfortunately, that's transferred to me. So I would hope that transparency would be required from both groups. You're concerned about tenant displacement, but what about displacing and eliminating units from the rental stock? I see this happen every day. There are a lot more than 100 units that have been removed from the rental stock. It's very sad. People are selling because they're afraid of this whole process. And lastly, there are so many hurtful assumptions being made. The divisiveness that is resulting is absolutely disheartening. It's sad and disappointing, and I hope you find a way to find a more balanced solution. I get the distinct impression that for some of you, the worst is thought about property providers. Fortunately, I have a pretty good self-esteem and I don't feel bad about what I do. I know what I do as professional. I'm fair, I'm balanced. Um, we manage properties that we own and it's not one or two, it's a lot more than that because we've saved our entire professional careers to do this for our retirement. It's my job, okay? This is not a hobby or a pastime. This is my job and I take it very seriously and I do it very well. And I think assumptions are made that most people don't, and I resent that. Lynn Renshaw, SantaCruzTogether.com. I appreciate what the prior speaker just said. SCT supports the staff's recommendation for a pilot program as proposed without amendments. The timeline and steps for community input are appreciated. You need to be very careful, otherwise the rental supply will be further reduced. Rental data should be confidential and only used in the aggregate to avoid creating new problems in the community, problems between tenants in the same building. If the honest goal is understanding the rental market, this is adequate. I'd like to remind the council that your 2020 budget on page 22 also cites the American Community Survey, an independent survey produced by HUD, which characterizes rents in Santa Cruz today. We appreciate staff recognizing the very challenging environment 
we're still in a toxic political environment where ordinary homeowners are vilified as greedy and evil. There is a need to heal the community and protect our fragile housing, rental housing supply. People should also realize that city funds for housing are limited. <clears throat> From the 2020 budget on page ED21, we find the following budget, housing and community development, $569,000, low and moderate housing acquisition, $691,000, low and moderate housing development, $242,000. That's 1.5 million at 350,000 a unit, that's four units. The vast majority of rentals are voluntarily provided by the community. Renters depend on the community to offer rentals. Your time That's is up. why we appreciate being part You're of the You're welcome to leave your comments. Okay. Mr. McHenry, before you get started, Mr. McHenry, I want to go ahead and give you a warning. I've, you've laughed and made other types of comments as people are leaving, and I find that as not in ad adherence with our council decorum policy. So that's been a warning. If you want to continue to stay, please allow for people to speak without disruption and allow our council deliberations to, to continue without disruption. And if not, I will go ahead and ask you to leave. So before another 45-second waste of time. Okay, you, you, you have been warned as well. Okay, so I have you as our last speaker, and you'll have, um, unless there's any other member of the community who wants to speak. Okay, no, you'll have two minutes to speak, and then we'll go okay. ahead and return back um, to the council. My name is George Cadman. First of all, just thank you for your work, staff. I, I don't, I'm not going to take a position on this, because I don't know enough about it. I will say I did vote for Measure M. And the reason I'm up here talking is because I heard one of the commenters say there hasn't anyone complaining on social media about being displaced. Well, I lived in the same house for 17 years. I was a reliable tenant, um, kept very good care of the place, and um, would never have been asked to leave except the owners decided to sell the house. They gave us 60 days to leave after living there for 17 years. And there were five of us, and it was, it was brutal. Um, this was a little over a year ago, and um, I can't afford to live in this town anymore, and I've been here since 1990, and um, I've worked at the same job for 20 years, and I'm still at that job, and I get paid, you know, way better than minimum wage, but I cannot afford to live in this town anymore. I had to move into a friend's house. She was kind enough to take my twin sister and I in. We share a very small bedroom. We share a bed. I am the displaced. I'm not saying I have the solution, but I wanted to speak up because I am among them. It's been very traumatic and affected me in countless ways. So, um, and when I did say something on my own Facebook page, I didn't identify my landlord, but I complained about numerous really disrespectful things that happened in the 60 days that we had to leave and we were still paying full rent. She went after me like with a vengeance because she saw it on my Facebook page. I did, again, did not name her, but somehow she found it and it was really messed up because the things I were complaining about was, you know, I shouldn't have to pay full rent and put up with all the stuff that was happening, you know, as I was trying to move out of this house of 17 years. So I am the displaced. That's all I want to say. Thanks. Okay. So um, that will then, we'll go ahead and close um, public comment for this item. I just want to thank you for being here and voicing your concerns. I um, want you to know that having been through a uh, number of these uh, meetings that it's it's always a difficult conversation. And I think, you know, as we move forward, I ask that you allow us to have some deliberation without interruption. After the CEPOS report, I think we have an opportunity to really try to change some of our uh, patterns and um, ultimately, hopefully, we can come to an area of consensus or an area of direction that will lead us to best serve our community. And I think that's why all of our council members ran for office. That's why we're all sitting up here. And, and we ask that you as um, observers and participants also respect this process. So we appreciate having had uh, public comment. We're going to go ahead and close public comment. And I ask in advance for your respect to allow us to deliberate for action and next steps without disruption. Um, so at this time, we'll go ahead and return back to council for action and deliberation. And I have Vice Mayor Cummings grabbing my attention, so please. Thank you. Um, 
So there's been a lot of concerns that I've heard, that we've heard tonight from the public, and there's a lot of concerns um, around, and first I actually want to thank the staff for all the hard work that you all put in, especially you know going through the summer months when a lot of folks were on vacation, um, and the fact that you all took the time to reach out to folks in the community, I think that's extremely important, and I love the fact that you all um, intend on continuing to do that, because uh, it's just another step at our ability to try to find some reconciliation in this whole process. Um, I do have some concerns with the voluntary uh, data collection around enforcement. And another point, another part of the um, recommendations I had concern with was really understanding uh, the current data collection systems we use and our ability to um, incorporate this kind of data collection within those systems. And so, um, so currently I don't support the staff recommendation to pursue the voluntary program, but I think the city council needs more information on what's an acceptable mandatory program, whether or not that's feasible, and to also um, get more community input. So I would like to make the following motion, given that it's nine o'clock and we still have, I think, four or five other items. Um, so motion that city council establish a two-member council rental data collection subcommittee to follow up on the information presented in today's staff report and to investigate further the feasibility and cost effectiveness of modifying one of the current city data collection systems or explore other systems to collect and provide comprehensive, reliable data and information on rent increases and evictions and notices to quit in the city. That's the first part. And then that the city council direct the appropriate city staff to meet with and assist the subcommittee in understanding the city's existing data collection systems and exploring feasible options for modifying them in a cost-effective manner. And that the subcommittee with staff assistance investigate similar programs in other communities and provide recommendations to the city council. And then finally, that the, that the city staff um, continue community outreach to further inform this process. The motion by second. Vice Mayor Cummings. We have a second by Council Member Brown. We have a hand by. Um, yeah, Clark. thank you. A couple, couple things. Uh, <laughs> so, Vice Mayor, what's your timeline associated with that proposal? Because that sounded like it was going to take a while. I actually am fairly confident that we could bring this back probably in the next two, next meeting or the, the mm -hmm. one after. I mean, because I think that what we're really trying to do is build on what the staff program is. The outreach, I think, is going to take a little bit longer time frame, and we're going to work. We could work on that plan with the city staff. When we saw the work plan that came out earlier, it seemed that um, the establishment of this program was going to take a few months. And within that subcommittee, I think we could work on bringing back recommendations and a timeline for the implementation to the city council for action. Totally. So the timeline that we saw earlier today was uh, from now until December, and it was my understanding, I must have misread the chart, I thought that was like, okay, we're going to start there and then we're going to collect data and start doing stuff, and I get that's the, the timeline kind of, except that the end result is August of 2021. So uh, I'm concerned on a lot of levels uh, with the, I mean, First of all, that motion was huge, so I don't even remember what all four of them are. Do you have copies of it for everyone so that we can look at what you wrote? I can pass them up, but essentially to create a two-member subcommittee composed of myself and Sandy Brown uh, to review what was proposed today and provide modifications and um, recommendations that we meet with city staff to understand the data collecting systems and explore feasible options, and that we assist staff, the subcommittee with staff assistance investigate similar programs in other communities and continue community outreach. And do you have a solution for, in the interim of this whole process uh, with regards to protecting tenants or? We would want to bring this back for action and deliberation amongst the city council members. So if we would like to consider another um, like if we're going to resurface anything that was brought up previously, I think that would be a separate item that we wouldn't be able to act on that at this point in time. Okay. Um, so just to uh, voice some other thoughts that came up through the conversation, um, 
definitely disconcerted that uh, the proposal is supported by both the Apartment Association uh, of California, which just to put it in perspective for everyone, uh, is the same body that uh, basically pressured the El Cerrito City Council to rescind the just cause evictions uh, ordinance that they had put in because of a threat of referendum. Uh, they were criticized by local progressive groups in the area for collecting signatures in unethical ways. And it's also a point to bring into a point uh, point of context that this is the same organization that dumped boatloads of money, uh, tens of thousands, not hundreds of thousands of dollars into our local election last time. So I'm a little concerned that they support the proposal. Uh, also Santa Cruz Together, which has come out and made it very, very clear that they have very little to no interest in renter's protections based off of everything that we've tried to establish and the consistent pushback against uh, anything even resembling representation of tenants in policy and in data collection. So those two things uh, make it immediately that I cannot support this. Um, this I also really, you know, the, the statement that came up about wanting for equality between the two groups, and I couldn't agree more with the speaker who mentioned the inability of us to maintain or even get to anywhere close to unity or equality while there is such a power dynamic that exists between renters and landlords. So we should really be taking that in consideration. And again, I do want to echo my appreciation for the staff for wanting to tell the stories of both the tenants and the landlords, but we need to be looking at this from a real world perspective. And in the real world, tenants have almost little, very little to no power uh, in what's going on. So that that needs to be taken into consideration in the community outreach process, in the structuring process, and in the engagement process. Um, the fact that I mentioned before that it's uh, non-compulsory is unacceptable to me personally. Um, doing some quick math, if we, it, there's, as I always hear this number, estimated 15,000 units in Santa Cruz that are for for rent. Let's just say that their claims of losing 100 or more rentals uh, throughout whatever tumultuous process there was, that would still leave 14,800, whatever. Let's just go with 15,000 though. At the $44 per unit rate, that would come out to $660,000 per year that we could use to run a program to analyze and look at data collection and figure out rental solutions. So there's the money for the program right there. We don't even need to talk about 30 to 125,000 coming out of our fiscal revenue. Um, also, it was brought up that we're, we don't have enough money for affordable housing, I believe it was the, the representative from Santa Cruz together that mentioned that. Well, you absolutely correct. Uh, I would agree with you on that, except that it's because we have failed tax policies that make it so that landlords, especially ones that are buying multiple properties or doing things, are not paying enough into our affordable housing development funds Mr. to be Weber, able to I'm build affordable housing. I'm going to go ahead and pause you. I just want to remind the community again to allow the council members to speak without disruption. We've had an opportunity to hear from you. Now it's our time to to deliberate, so please continue without Thank disruption. You. I, I appreciate that, even though I, I totally welcome your your auditory responses. Um, so uh, I think I really enjoyed the whistleblower uh, protection for retaliation because uh, post Measure M, we did see many uh, rental advocates experience retaliation and lose their housing or experience tremendous rent increases due to retaliation from landlords. Now, this is not, and I just want to preface because all a lot of landlords come and say, you're, you're painting us all with a bad brush. No, that is not true. But there are bad landlords and there is no protection for tenants against those bad landlords. As good of a landlord as you may be, you are not the unequivocal uh, example or sample of landlords if you are someone that's good. Uh, I think that's really important. And it's uh, what's really interesting to me uh, also is this sense of oppression that landlords uh, talk about when they come up and speak on the, on the thing. Now, it's not to say that their feelings are unjust, because if you feel a certain way, then that is important for us to acknowledge. But what's important is to understand why you feel that way. And there's a really interesting quote, which is unattributed to anyone, but it's that when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. And so taking it from that lens and looking at a, a, a population of people that has had literally unlimited power when it comes to their decisions on renters and where their renter alliances lead are now being put under a microscope and being asked to justify their behavior and rectify uh, issues in our community which have been caused from uncontrolled rent and unprotected tenants. So whatever we do, whether we go uh, along with council member, uh, excuse me, 
Vice Mayor Cummings' uh, proposal, seconded by Councilmember Brown, and uh, they do form the subcommittee. Uh, all of these things need to be taken into very careful and clear context when building this system. And looking at El Cerrito also, also I mean, yes, they have a paper, uh, a paper process and an online process, but their questions are robust. Uh, so I think that we should be looking at their questionnaire as a model for ways that we're gonna be collecting information. And I do think it is opening up a larger conversation. Um, you know, Darius, who left, is someone that, uh, who owns apartment complexes, and I believe that's the recommendation or requirement for having business permits, I would imagine. Uh, but everyone, if, you know, because one of the speakers came up and said, uh, it's, we're in the capitalist market. It's just like someone that's doing retailers. And the last time I checked, retailers have to have business licenses. So if we're gonna use the argument that we're in a capitalist system, it's a free market, and everyone should be able to do whatever they need to do, then we need to be holding landlords to the same expectations of our other capitalist ventures that are generating profit off, off our community. Thank you very much. Okay, Councilmember Brown, and then... I want to thank staff for putting this together and doing it fairly quickly, or very quickly, not fairly, very quickly. Um, the thought you put into it and appreciation for uh, the people who participated in the focus groups, which I didn't know were happening, but thank you for doing that. Um, I am interested in hearing more, and I think it is worth having broader conversation in the community about this. Um, I just want to say, I seconded that before I heard my name mentioned <laughs> as a, so just saying, but uh, <laughs> I've, my second stands, I, I just, uh, you know, and I, there's many things I could say, you know, about my, my feelings about um, the broader context in which we're tr trying to come up with some kind of data collection uh, program. Um, what's happened, what is to be the challenges that um, our community faces, the challenges that tenants face. I mean, I've, I've talked a lot about this, so I don't think I need to belabor that. Um, but I, specifically related to this proposal, I do want to make a, a couple of comments. Um, I have concerns about the voluntary nature. I, I, I don't see the, the we'll get any useful data, really, and I'm sorry to say that, but, you know, social scientists and several people in our uh, at public comment have mentioned self-selection bias will get us um, data that it really does not give us an accurate understanding of what's going on in our rental housing market. Um, even the most competent um, researcher uh, who qualified in, in quantitative uh, social uh, data collection methods would not be able to find ways of um, um, adjusting for you know the, those that bias. I mean, I just don't think it's possible. Um, so I have concerns about that. I have concerns about the timeline, and I, I again I understand um, that it's not as simple as it may appear on the face of it. Although I'd like it to be. Um, I also want to understand the data collection technology and um, you know the limitations there a little bit better. Um, and I also have concerns just, which I'm not gonna go into the details about those, but related to the, the content, kind of the substance of the collection, the content of the, the data, and um, its accessibility and transparency. So I think those are all conversations that we need to continue, and I, I don't know that we could hash them out tonight if we wanted to, um, but um, I'm willing to participate in, if like, other council members are um, amenable to it, in that process um, and come back uh, within, I, I think next council meeting may be a little ambitious, um, Vice Mayor Cummings, um, but um, you know, by the second meeting in September, maybe, so that gives us about six weeks, um, or the first meeting in October. Um, to um, so somewhere around there would but that, that'd be my aim um, to to come back to the council, and um, so that's what I'll say for now. Plenty more could be said. Thank council you, Mayor. Um, could you could you go over when you come back to council what you'll be coming back with? 
I believe that the uh, vice mayor here is uh, typing up your uh, motion. We're gonna be sending it over to our city clerk here so we'll have a more clear picture of exactly what's being proposed. Okay, and um, I just wanna say that I agree with um, not a year and a half timeline, but a six month timeline. Um, I would like to see the maintenance costs also um, uh, included as, as someone um, mentioned at the podium. I think it should be compulsory and timely and tracked. Uh, it should be enforceable, identifiable landlord information. Um, and I agree that there's, with Councilmember Brown, there's a self-selection bias, you know, if we're gonna go the way um, it's now written. Um, and I do think the, <laughs> the deck is stacked against tenants and it has been for a long time. And um, I, the, only, the only comment I wanna go back to is that someone said people are uh, selling because of maybe uncertainty in the market or fear. And during the whole Measure M campaign, uh, my wife and I, we own three units and we also own our home. Um, and I feel privileged to, to be in that position. But during that time, we got we received no less than 12 postcards. It was it was a weekly thing, telling us we should be fearful and the market is chaotic. And they were from real estate people and people from other cities, you know, saying you got to sell now. You don't know what's going to happen in Santa. And it was like stirring up this fear. I used to bring these cards to meetings and pass them around and say, this is what this is what's happening out there. So I don't know if uh, who created the fear in the market, but. Uh, I think it was like a self-created fear. Uh, thank you. Just in the interest of time, I, uh, many of my comments have ma been made and um, right now I'm leaning towards uh, supporting the motion and that I think we need to, to work on it a little bit more. Okay. Any other comments from council members? Council member? Matthews, as do we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bonnie, have you received the uh, motion? Okay, we'll go ahead and have that put up. Councilman Matthews. Just a few things occurred to me. I got the impression that our existing uh, IT systems were. Oh, sorry. I got the impression that our existing IT systems were just not in the ballpark for this. So, um, you know, if that's the reality, move on and look at something new uh, that will serve the purposes. Um, Certainly a voluntary system is uh, incomplete. It's something, it's a starting point. Uh, I'll be interested to see what comes back. And as I understand in your motion, you don't specify one or the other, is that correct? So we'll see where the cards shake out there. Um, uh, I am interested as you explore this to see what other sources of information, this is not my field, but I am under the impression that there are multiple different sources that in aggregate gives some information about average rents and increases over time and so forth. So I know others know a whole lot about more about that than I do. Um, a question is how often would this be reported annually or every time there's a change, et cetera? That's just a question to ask. Um, I give yourself enough time to do a decent job on it. <laughs> so yeah, October, um, because I'm under the impression that you wanna get information from other places. Um, I am concerned about privacy. Um, um, I, th I think that's it, uh, the subcommittee studying what other communities uh, systems have um, done and what, they, what their goal was in collecting this information. Um, I think the discussion now has said simply as a base of gathering information, um, not as phase one of some broader program. That may be some people's goal, but be honest about intentions. Um, and then also what time, I, I think it's good to consider this a pilot. So what, uh, when you come back to us, uh, have us an idea of um, once implemented, how long you're gonna allow for the pilot to, to get results and, and tell you something. Um, so that's it, um, you know, I, I have preferences, but I think asking more questions at this point is fine. I'll just make a few comments and then I'll go ahead and acknowledge Councilmember Glover and then Vice Mayor Cummings. One of the things that I um, sort of pick up throughout, which is woven in, I guess, in the, in the agenda report, is that, you know, there is, 
I think there is a community scar in this regard. And I think one of the things that this comes on the heels of is SEPA's report, which said not to form a subcommittee, but at minimum that there was alignment between um, various sectors in the community around wanting more trusted data. And I just really want to acknowledge the staff for an attempt to say that this is a sort of, if you will, a baby step in getting us to that place. Um, and I think absent acknowledging that, there will be a sentiment of it not being trusted data, and we'll find ourselves in this cycle where we won't be able to move. And I fear that if we're unable to um, come to a place that we can live with, that may not be one thing for one person or the other, but at minimum we can live with as a baby step to move us as a community in alignment in a way that will hopefully get us to a place where we're able to serve our community to the best of our ability of all types tenants, landlords, and everywhere in between, um, we, we, we have to remember that. And so I'm supportive of this process. I, I just want to acknowledge that sentiment in this agenda report because I think if we don't acknowledge that, then we're setting ourselves up for a cycle that we're not able to, that's paralyzing essentially. And, and for me, that's a disservice to our community. So I, ha I hope we can balance being in action, accepting that it's, it's, it's imperfect, um, but at minimum, we're able to try to move the needle in a way that's gonna bring us together and support our community members. Um, so that's just sort of my general comments in regards to this. Uh, in, this item in, at, at large. Um, and then in regards to the motion before us, happy to explore that as the best next step. I will just caution um, uh, any kind of date certain with the reality as mayor and trying to set mm -hmm. these agendas that it's really difficult to not have what we had today, which is a 12 hour meeting. And if there are dates certain that are out of my control and trying to manage that, I find us in a pattern where I'll either have to recommend that we move items um, and um, we're, it's just it's just too much to take on and, and so I just want to caution that, knowing the urgency of it with the balance of other items that felt feel urgent as well and how to balance those um, those agendas for those purposes, especially those that have high community interest. Um, so with that, I think um, the motion before us is is reasonable. I think one thing to think about if we are moving in a manner where we're looking to see how we get a blended sort of perspective, it would be interesting to see if it was a three council subcommittee and having somebody like uh, Councilmember Matthews on there as a landlord. Sorry, I'm not a landlord, I don't know. <laughs> I think, I mean, if we're looking at trying to have reconciliation and see where um, a variety of perspectives are sort of uh, providing a lens, um, I think that's an interesting first step next step to consider. I won't stand firm on that, but um, just something to offer to the council for consideration and to the council member Matthews who um, was named. <laughs> I'm being so. vetoed. Okay. Well, um, yeah, <laughs> that's up to the council at this point and it's up to you in terms of your interest as well as the subcommittee that's being proposed. So that would just be my thoughts and sentiments and uh, we can take them for what they are and see how the council wants to go. Um, council member, I think it was Council Member Glover, and then um, was it back to the Vice Mayor, if, if I remember correctly? Yeah, just a quick clarification. So is there going to be a goal as far as time associated with this? Because uh, there's been, from the Vice Mayor as early as next meeting, which I don't think any of us thinks is really possible, uh, but then also Council Member Brown saying the last meeting in September, and then uh, Council Member Matthew saying the first meeting in October. So it's always what I'm concerned about. It just keeps getting drip, drip, drip. So if we could get some certainty in there, I'd be happy with the second, uh, second meeting in September if that uh, was acceptable to the two motion makers, but I figured I'd just put that out there as a request, not even necessarily as a uh, friendly amendment, but I figured I'd just put it out there. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. I'd say on or before the first meeting in October, that way there's flexibility. If we're able to bring it back sooner, we can do that. And if it fits within the timeline and the schedule of the other items that we're gonna be putting on our agenda, then we can bring it back sooner. And if not, if it need, we need more time to work on this, then October and, and we can go from there. Thank you. All right. Uh, and Councilmember uh, Brown, just want to add, I didn't veto uh, the addition of Councilmember Matthews, but um, so if 
anybody on the, I mean, if you want to, if you want to self, if you want to self select, <laughs> that's okay too. But I just wanted to make that clear yeah. because I think we, you know, have, we can have the conversation with a group of three of us um, and staff. I mean, the goal I think is to, is to get with staff and, and try to move things along. And, and so I'm happy to do that in whatever configuration. And I just wanted to encourage the community um, to provide us with input. I think I've mentioned this a number of times that one of the things that we want is to start working through this reconciliation process and that's going to require folks reaching out to us and providing us with meaningful recommendations. Um, I think that, you know, we all want to move forward and we can do so, but we need to hear from the people in our community in order to um, incorporate the positive changes that they want to see. So I'm going to put that out there again for the community and for other members of city council. Um, and if there's some issue with Brown Act, maybe that can go to staff and they can bring it to the subcommittee. But I just want to make sure that that is out there. Okay, seeing no um, further discussion for deliberation on this item, we'll go ahead and call the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. And thanks again to staff for their hard work on this item. Mayor. Mayor Matthews. Yeah. I, I do want to express because I didn't personally my appreciation of the staff um, and I particularly appreciated the intention and the spirit with which you approached this. You got that message about the division in the community and trying to bring forward something that responded to the council um, and it's being further reworked, but I just want to appreciate your effort and your intention. Well, thank you very much. It really did come from a place of wanting to try to help the community reconcile and move forward. So thank you very much. Thank you. We look forward to working with you guys. I, I'm, I'm, with all due respect, uh, we, we, we heard from one part of the community that they were supportive. We heard really strongly from the renter part of the community that they weren't supportive. So, I mean, I, 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 there's, some, there's a disconnect here that I'm not really getting. Um, people are oppressed, they are desperate, they are tenants, and we are doing little up here to address their needs right now. So I, I'm just, I'm just upset that you would think that we are hearing from everyone and that we're going to sing Kumbaya now. That we need to do something for renters, that's, that's what we need to do. And this was supposed to be a renter-initiated um, uh, uh, database. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and allow um, for the chambers to transition as we will return back now to the remaining items from our consent agenda. Give it a minute. Thank you. Can we just watch a show instead? Yeah, something funny. I'm going to ask those in the chambers, if you want, you're welcome to continue your conversation outside of chambers and we'll go ahead and transition out. Why don't we just go ahead, why don't we take a, we'll take a five minute break. Continue items at this time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. By the sixth uh, request. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and return to our consent agenda at this point. We have still a few remaining items to finalize, so we'll go ahead and return. We have items 6, 10, 17, 19, and 20 to revisit. For those that are in the audience, I will re just let you know that we've already taken public comment on these items, so at this point we won't be having any public comment. Um, and um, I believe the remainder of the items, if and if I stand corrected, please let me know, but are um, pulled from Councilmember Glover, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so you can go ahead and uh, speak to the items. Thank you so much. So uh, starting with number six, I imagine this is something we can all get behind. It was in the consent agenda, um, and I want to give a shout out to it, it. First of all, it is the uh, resolution to endorse the Green New Deal both in how House Resolution 109, but also in Senate Resolution 59. Um, 
It was something that I brought forward uh, and got co-sponsored by Council Member uh, Brown and Vice Mayor Cummings, and we've been working in uh, communication with uh, Tiff Dr. Tiffany Wise West of our climate department to be figuring out what would be good, also running it by uh, the city attorney's office and other stuff to get feedback with regards to the language and some of the um, stuff. So it was a great um, opportunity to figure out how we can even further embolden our climate protection and our climate adaptation and our climate mitigation, but there were just a few changes uh, that um, myself and other climate uh, oriented community members and organizations felt could be strengthened and more inclusive. So you'll notice that is uh, noted in the red line. Uh, you should have one. Okay, cool. So I don't know if you want, you don't need to put it up if you don't want to. Um, so anyway, um, the changes <clears throat> are as follows, which is basically just adding that it incorporates and includes Senate Resolution 59, which also is a recognizing the duty of the federal government to create the Green New Deal. Um, it just adds that language uh, down towards the bottom, but first in that second to last paragraph, just making the language a little bit stronger and um, making a assertion instead of a guess uh, from could to will uh, exacerbate by climate change, and that's wildfire, wildfires, drought, and flooding, as well as coastal erosion. Um, the last paragraph on page one is just the addition of Senate Resolution 59, uh, resilience against climate change through investments, water management, uh, repairing, and now the statement of water management was not to disparage or suggest that we're not doing adequate water management, but as something moving forward, the emphasis on the need to continue increasing our water management and um, conservation. Uh, also, increasing renewable power sources, use in manufacturing, and that was kind of vague as it just said use in manufacturing of goods and materials, uh, eliminating fossil fuel use. So that was not in the staff provided one, so really wanted to make sure that we're working towards the elimination of fossil fuel use. Uh, then as we continue down into the resolutions specifically, um, uh, there were a lot of aspects of social justice that were that are in the Green New Deal language that were kind of left out of this document, so uh, decided to put it back in. Be it further resolved that with this resolution, we recognize the legitimacy and urgency for this new social contract, which upholds the value of workers, members of vulnerable communities, and their right to equity. So be it further resolved, local businesses and multinational corporations in Santa Cruz should be held accountable through policy and regulation for the environmental degradation caused by waste and pollution generated through day-to-day -day business and the products they sell. Uh, be it further resolved that as we implement policy moving forward, we ensure that future policy will help create high quality union jobs which pay prevailing wages, hire local workers, hold training and advancement opportunities and guarantee wage benefit parities for workers affected by transition. And this is language from essentially the Green New Deal. Be it further resolved that through future policy, we should guarantee that these new jobs will have family sustaining wages, adequate leave, paid vacation and retirement security. And then be it further resolved that through policy, we will help ensure an environment where all workers have the right to organize, unionize, and collectively bargain free of coercion, intimidation, and harassment. Now, just a reminder that this is a resolution, so there is no way legally binding, but it is in more of a spirit of wanting to see these changes happen in Santa Cruz and to strengthen our toolbox to be able to address climate change and make sure that the concept of health, equity, and sustainability are all taken into consideration when we are building our policy. Policies. So, um, any, I mean, I, I'm happy to answer any questions or comments that people may have from this. Uh, otherwise, I can make the motion for us to move forward and uh, pass the resolution. Well, I have a question. My understanding is that, um, t did Tiffany Wise West, our climate action manager, have a chance to look at these modifications? They were modifications that were in there originally and were removed subsequently over time because, uh, so specifically for the business lines, uh, they didn't want to alienate the business community. And so what I'm trying to get at is that we need to have a mental shift in our community, uh, one that starts to put the environment first amongst business interests, amongst development, amongst transportation, so that we can make a serious stance, make take serious steps and have serious accountability to ourselves and to the community around uh, climate change and the emergency that we face. So she's seen different aspects of the language. Some of it got taken out, um, but I'm putting it back in. 
Okay, I just want to also just acknowledge that she um, was here earlier but had to leave, and so um, I, I'm sure she would probably have wanted to speak to this, and um, I know that she was tracking a lot of these uh, details very uh, purposefully, um, so just kind of wanting to acknowledge that, because I know that she had to leave uh, to get to a conference, I believe. Okay, Vice Mayor Cummings. I know that Tiffany worked has been working really hard with us on this. And so at first I want to acknowledge her work. Um, and I know that she was here earlier and had to leave. Um, and I very much, and I just saw these corrections earlier today and really would have liked an opportunity to have her weigh in on this. So I would actually like to move that we put this back on the next consent agenda. And I think that this is also demonstrating um, how when we have these really packed agendas, um, that it makes it difficult for us to be able to have staff weigh in um, when we're going so late into the night. And so while I know that there's a lot of stuff we want to get done, we're also trying to manage this in a way that we can make sure that staff is here and can weigh in on um, all the items and we can move forward in a way that's efficient. Can, um, before I go ahead, and I'm going to go ahead and ask you again, Mr. McHenry, to please refrain from interrupting the, the thing. Next time, since we're starting a new item, we'll go ahead and give you a first wording. Next time, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to leave. So um, I guess one of the things that I could suggest is that we adopt the resolution before us as presented and then provide uh, further direction for potentially the subcommittee that brought, or the council members that brought this forward to work with Tiffany to have further refinement so that we're able to have something move forward at this time, but have an opportunity to hear it again in a, in a different form if that feels appropriate as a potential compromised solution. Okay, Councilmember Glover, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Crone, Councilmember Myers. So I, I appreciate uh, that suggestion, uh, Mayor Watkins. I am just, you know, I'm always in this weird spot where I question what the role of staff is uh, because while her suggestion, Tiffany's amazing. She's a fantastic staff member and it was a pleasure working with her on this, but we just uh, diametrically di or were in differing perspectives when it came to the language of, of um, certainty. You know, like if you can see here on the second to last page, it said that the Santa Cruz Climate Adapt Adaptation Plan update and local hazard mitigation plan, both state and the city, is vulnerable to coastal erosion, wildfires, drought, and flooding, and her language was, which could all be exacerbated by climate change. There, there, I, I don't understand where the um, disconnect is between whether it will actually be exacerbated by climate change or not, because we know that statistically and factually, wildfires, coastal erosion, droughts, and flooding are all exacerbated by climate change. So that's an example of some of the language changes which we've spent some time going back and forth on, but which I just don't agree with, and I don't think are strong enough language to uh, be making the statements that we are about, um, about climate change. So I would be uh, happy to do that and then ask for her feedback for it to come back at a later meeting or something like this. But I do also say that feel that this is an issue with moving things around on the agenda. I totally get why you were doing it. In the, and But it, it's just, there, there were people here, like there are people here that have been waiting literally all day to hear this, uh, this topic. Um, and because we moved it, because we were making time for something else, because the consent agenda was stacked with issues that, in my opinion, shouldn't have been on the consent agenda because they required some conversation. Um, so anyway, it's just, uh, I, I really appreciate your suggestion though. Okay, Councilmember Crown, Councilmember Matthews, Councilmember Myers. Um, you know, and I, you know, I, I've known Tiffany for many years. She, got, she received her PhD from the Department of Environmental Studies at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I think she does tremendous work. Um, Vice Mayor, you received your PhD from in, uh, up at UCSC2 in evolution, ecology and evolutionary biology. As you look at this, because we are the decision makers here, as we all look at this, what are we taking issue with? I mean, is there something here that you're reading that you don't agree with? And that would be something to inform um, Council Member Glover about what's, I'm, I'm willing to wait and get Tiffany's input, but I'm just thinking, you know, what is it that we might, the seven council members here, disagree with on that, that's in red? Okay, well, I don't think you have to answer at this time, but we'll go ahead and add, now have council member Matthews, Myers, and if you want to weigh in, you're welcome to do so. Could I, could I weigh in on a housekeeping matter just very briefly? Yes. I haven't seen the language that was uh, circulated. I'm just wondering also if there are additional copies available for members of the public who might be interested in looking at the language. I, 
I included one for the clerk to put up on the screen, which I thought was. We don't have today. Ah, technical difficulties. I could, oh, I can send it to you though. Councilmember, Councilmember Matthews. Uh, I'm not comfortable with the concept of approving a resolution and thinking we'll come back when you've adopted the resolution. That's what goes out there. <laughs> um, I would much prefer to have um, Tiffany, since she, since she did have strong feelings about this, I'd like to know what they were. I particularly had difficulty with the, the final uh, addition in red on the bottom of the second page. Um, further resolve that local businesses and multinational corporations in Santa Cruz should be held accountable through policy and regulation for the environmental degradation caused, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, you know, um, to what extent, and I think there's a different way to phrase that. Um, it, I think, shouldn't imply that we're, um, <laughs> I don't know what it implies. Uh, I think you can state that as saying that we um, uh, make a priority to work with local businesses to reduce waste, which is just what we're talking about in the, um, all the all the measures we've taken over time with plastic reduction and all that. It, it's kind of this, but it doesn't have the, the heavy hammer. And I don't know if that's what bothered her or not, but um, that's one that she left out at me. Councilmember Myers and then Vice Mayor Cummings. Yeah, I guess I'd, I'd kind of reflect on um, what I, you know, I, I think of as, as about 20 years of really progressive environmental um, work so far. And uh, I certainly um, support the Green New Deal, um, the concepts of it. Um, State of California has been basically doing a Green New, New Deal for about 25 years. Uh, we've spent almost uh, $300, $300 billion over the last 25 years um, protecting thousands of acres of land, restoring thousands of acres of habitat, building miles and miles of, of, uh, of bikeways. I think the city of Santa Cruz has been, and the community of Santa Cruz has certainly bought into that. I know personally of dozens of, of businesses here locally that participate in uh, creating jobs around that exact opportunity. So we have green jobs here. We have companies that are supporting green jobs. Um, we have uh, nonprofits that are um, certainly uh, supportive of all the, uh, all the in, uh, intents of the resolution. Uh, I'd like to see the language on, uh, regarding um, the local businesses and multinational corporations. Let's, I'd like to see some, some rethought of that. Um, I don't know. I think we are up to almost 500 businesses in our green in the Monterey Bay Green Business um, Program. I think our businesses are committed. So I'm feeling um, that some of these changes uh, could be vetted a little bit more and uh, certainly supportive of the intent. But again, I uh, I hope that we can uh, also acknowledge the uh, good work that we've done to date, um, and that we don't want to lose sight that we're not a community that is polluting. We're a community that created the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, the largest marine protected area in the world 20 years ago. And uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's remember that and keep creating green jobs and caring about the environment and move forward. Vice Mayor Cummings and then Council Member, and then I have a comment and then Council Member Glover and then Council Member Brown. Yeah, so I made a, earlier made a motion that we um, bring this back at the next city council meeting on the I guess it may be not on the consent agenda in the sense there is discussion about it, but I think that it would be really good to have Tiffany weigh in. I think that, you know, uh, as Council Member Crone pointed out, I also received my PhD at UCSC. I don't have that many problems with this, but I also think that um, Tiffany brings a lot of professional experience to the city, and I would want to get her, since she worked with this, us closely on this, I think that it would be really good to get her professional opinion as to what she, she would think would also be appropriate in this resolution being moved forward. So I'll go I just want to say that my intentions around this um, are really to, you know, work with the person who's worked most closely with us and understand, you know, if there are concerns, where that concern is coming from and so that we can make sure that this is um, a strong deal. I'll second the motion, and I will just suggest that if it's not prepared in the way that feels like it's complete by the next meeting, that we be flexible with that, because I think we want to get it right. I'll just speak to the um, kind of the topic that was addressed in terms of some of the language around um, uh, accountability. I want to remind the council that 
uh, we, along with a number of other jurisdictions throughout our nation and state, are um, in the process of looking at holding our fossil fuel industry accountable for their impact and influence in what they've known for decades in terms of how their, uh, their product essentially is destroying our environment and have intentionally deceived our uh, populations in um, how to move forward with that and are now at this time seeking immunity at the uh, federal level. So I think if we want to get that right, that's how we want to probably frame something like that because I think that's something that's very much so in line with previous council action and the position of the city and frankly was something that I was able to advocate for at a national level. Um, so that said, I'll go ahead and support the motion. Um, if there's further conversation, Councilmember Glover, Brown, and then Crone. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, with a statement, we should acknowledge the work that has been done and we have over 500 green businesses. I would totally agree with that, but I don't understand the danger, concern, caution, hesitation to make sure that the businesses outside of those 500 make a me uh, get a message from us that they need to be held accountable for what they're doing. <clears throat> it's that same argument of the landlords. Oh, there's 10 great landlords in this room right now. That means that all landlords must be great. It, it's just, it doesn't correlate logically to what we're trying to accomplish if you care. I mean, if the environment is w the number one issue, right, which a lot of scientists and people and activists say that it is the number one issue because everything else correlates to the environment, then why are we holding back or being tepid or offering milk toast resolutions that aren't going to make a difference? Um, the uncomfortable with the business section. Okay, I, I can appreciate and respect that you're uncomfortable with the business section, but what part? Why are you uncomfortable with the business section? Is it just because you don't want to call out business or what is it? Because it, it, those vague general statements don't help in crafting or changing the language. They don't help in providing context and they don't help in protecting the environment if you're just going to remove the accountability of businesses and multi especially multinational corporations. I don't even know why. <laughs> I don't understand why we would be protecting multinational corporations in Santa Cruz that are providing waste and stuff. Um, also, if you want to know what Tiff, again, Tiffany's great. I think she's fantastic. It was great to work with her. But if you want to know what she thought was appropriate language, just look at the document without the red lines and then look at the red lines that are added to the document and what they add, social justice, equity, rights for workers, unions, paying jobs, like all of these things that we as a city, I would imagine should resolve every day that we wanna have in our city and for us to be striving towards on a policy level. But for some reason, we're getting pushback about equity, justice, representation, and unions. Um, it, I, I don't understand. I, if, if someone could explain to me what you're talking about or why this is problematic for you, then I would, I, I think I would really appreciate it. I think people in the crowd would appreciate it because it, it, I, I'm finding it hard. And this, this is a problem I constantly have with this body. You say you care about renters, you don't do anything to protect renters. You say you care about the environment, but here is the most basic of resolutions that just say people should be held accountable and that we should support our workers, and yet we want to postpone it so that a staff member who has already weakened it tremendously from its original purposes is going to do it again. Like, what? <laughs> I don't understand what you hope to gain from additional conversation with the same staff member that already gave their feedback. Um, so anyway, uh, there's a motion on the floor, uh, which is to what again? Okay, we'll, we'll have uh, the Vice Mayor restate the motion or I can attempt to do it. Essentially what this would be would be, oh please. The motion is to have this come back at the next meeting so yes. Tiffany can weigh in on the comments that have been provided. So I just want to clarify, because of a decision by the chair of the meeting to push this until 10 o'clock at night when staff, there's no way staff could be here, now we want to push it out another two weeks because the staff isn't here because of the way that the meeting was run. I'll just speak to that a little bit. I think that, as you know, there's a lot of items that come before our council. There's a lot of interest of things that we want to get done, and there's a lot of community input that we like to hear. And in order for me to do the best I can at balancing that and allowing for us to have adequate discussion around big items, such as us talking about our council work plan for the next few months, I 
as mayor and anybody who is in this position after me and has been in this position before me is required to do the best I can at managing the meetings in a way that's a, a, allowing us to get city business done. Um, I do request that um, as city manager Martin Bernal mentioned earlier that if there's any questions or any types of items that you'd like to either make comments on or get answered in advance uh, to please do so especially in relation to the items that are on consent agendas and that for those that we do want to pull for further discussion we do so um, but recognizing that we try to cup or even and actually even logging in um, a statement of dissent or a statement of concern is completely appropriate but for the purposes of being able to have our city government function in a way that allows us for adequate time, it's really truly my responsibility and I and it's not anything personal or any type of manipulative approach, it's truly, it's trying to manage the meeting. Um, I do uh, I do regret that unfortunately it is now 10 p.m. at, at night. Um, um, Tiffany is unable to be here. I ideally would not have had it go that way and um, felt really uh, it was important for us to also allow adequate time for some of our general business items as well as some of the other large items before us. So I'll just sort of speak to that in general. Um, but here we are and I think that there are areas where we would like some clarification is sort of the sentiment I'm getting from the council in terms of some of these additions. Um, and we are lucky as a city to have a climate mitigation and adaptation manager and um, I feel it'd be appropriate to have her her eyes on this personally. Sure. Um, so that being said, how to move this forward at this time, there's a motion, there's a second, like further discussion. Sorry? I'd like to make an alternate motion or a substitute motion. Before you do, I wanna just make sure I acknowledge any other pending comments if that was, I believe Councilman Macron had a comment. I just wanted to ask the city attorney if he saw any red flags in the red letters on the um, alternate version. Uh, with the time that I've had to look at them, nothing jumped out at me from a purely from a legal perspective. I, I, I don't sense that that's the really the tenor of the discussion that the council's having right now. But from a legal perspective, I didn't I didn't see anything that I thought was problematic. And I would just like to urge my fellow council member, uh, I would like to see unanimity on this on this issue here because I think that we can get there. And um, if it takes having to come back and, and maybe asking Tiffany a few questions at the, at the podium and as an agenda item, um, I would really appreciate getting us all on the same page. <laughs> okay, well then uh, I will not make my substitute motion. Um, I find it hard on this body to believe that there are, I mean, something as simple as this, I would imagine we should have, in my opinion, should have been able to all get on the same page, but we have differing uh, priorities, it sounds like. So some of us care about the business community. Others of us care about the environment. Others of us don't think it's that big of a deal at all because it's already the work that's been done. I mean, these are just the statements that I've personally heard up here during this conversation. So um, we'll, I'm not sure what that looks like, uh, and but I will uh, move forward so we can move, get out of here. Okay, so Council Member Myers, and then maybe we'll take the vote. I'm or just going to, I, I just might respond. Um, you know, much of this language is, right now when I read some of your, of the language that has been put back in, which was it in my packet, and which I just received as, as the item was <laughs> basically started. Um, we have high quality union jobs. We pay prevailing wages. If you would like to look in the uh, records, you will see that any project that we build that has anything to do with infrastructure, climate change, the kinds of things we're preparing for, we pay prevailing wages on our contracts. We do the best that we can to hire local companies and local workers. So when I go through these, these, this language, what I'm looking at this as, as a city council person is, what is it that I'm trying to pass for my community that actually um, provides a map for people to either improve or to understand the urgency of an issue? And so when I see the language in here, which is written by a Congress, uh, you know, Congresswoman and Congress, you know, Congressmen and senators in other, other states, um, and other communities, maybe that language makes sense in a federal resolution or in a federal intent, but I think a lot of what you want is, is actually being done. And so um, 
uh, you know, I, th I, th I think that's my reservation is that number one, I didn't see the language until we sat down. Mm -hmm. And number two, <clears throat> reach out to some of the people that do this work, find out what's happening, talk to the companies. Don't assume that people aren't doing the kinds of things that are in the resolution. And if we can, let's make the resolution an acknowledgement of the progress we've made so far and the work to be done. But let's not be punitive about it. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, um, really briefly, I, um, I totally agree with everything that is in this resolution and in the um, proposed changes. I will support the um, motion to bring this back for a couple of reasons. One, I agree, I think it is important to see if we can get to um, unanimity on this kind of a resolution. It is, as Council Member Glover suggests, non-binding. It doesn't mean that we don't, we, um, it can't be improved. Secondly, I, I out of respect for Dr. Wise West, who did put um, some effort into this, who did contact um, the signers, the co-signers, um, and when she asked about having some additional conversations to um, make, uh, you know, to do some revisions and then bring that to us, I agreed. I said, yeah, that's okay, go ahead and do that. And this is the what we got as a result. Um, I feel like it's my responsibility uh, as, as an individual council member, and I'd like to see us just agree to go back and have that conversation with her and see what we can do, um, because I am I totally agree that all of these things are important. And I also wanna comment on the, um, you know, um, council member Myers has mentioned a lot of the progress and that we do have green industry and we do have green businesses. And we also have a community that has, um, you know, some pretty low wages, and that's not to indict the, gr you know, green businesses or green industry. That, that's just to say that's a fact of what is going on in our community. So making a statement about um, living wage jobs um, as part of this, as has happened in the federal resolution or the federal legislation, um, I, I don't think is a, a bad idea. I just would like to spend a little more time figuring it out, and I, th I think that if we do that, I'm absolutely on board. So that's... Okay, that wasn't as brief as I had thought it would be. Sorry. Okay, Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Matthews, and hopefully we can move the item. Thank you. Um, we're already, I mean, this gets back to just what was just said. Um, it basically, we're already doing it. Um, the language, which was just pointed out by my colleague to my left, is that we're already doing the, the union jobs, we're already doing prevailing wages. The language says, be it further resolved that as we implement policy moving forward, we ensure that future policy will help create high quality union jobs, which pay prevailing wages, hire local workers, hold training advancement opportunities, and guarantees wage benefit parity for workers affected by transition. So no matter what we're doing right now, whatever we implement in the future, needs to be guided by the guidelines of creating these things into a reality of those new industries that we're gonna see in Santa Cruz. It's not just a, a guess all that we're gonna get it. And then secondly, to say that we already have these union things, we had a union worker stand up here and say that she was forcefully removed from her house because of rent increases and now lives outside of the city because she can't afford it, while they're saying that their negotiation process has been lacking so that a huge population of their re members have refused our proposal, which means that we are not in that second line on the back, which we're already apparently doing, is having jobs that will have family sustaining wages. Because right now we do not have jobs that have family sustaining wages for our employees. So uh, it's, it's really disconcerting how uh, feverently we'll argue about how much we're already doing when our city is suffering in so many different ways. Um, so I look forward to the vote and bringing it back next time so that we can get un unanimity on it, but it's just the, the process is really disheartening. Okay, well in the spirit of unanimity, we'll go ahead and take the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Can, can I say something just really quickly? That passes unanimously, Council. To, to the point of process, again, I just wanna emphasize what's really helpful is to get advance notice of questions and issues, particularly for the staff. Because again, even if Tiffany had been here without advance notice, that just puts her in a very awkward position. You know, this is not about Tiffany. Uh, and I think it just makes it very hard for staff to come here and to be here when you know we don't, we're not able to 
prepare and get notice. It's just simply not fair. So I would really ask the council to please do that. Thank you. Sure. I, I think it's also not efficient. So we'll, we'll go ahead and note that. Can I just get clarification? So we have Council Member Glover made a motion, right? Uh, to Council Member Glover. I thought you made the original one to no, adopt no. this. I was he passed this out. To, you need a second. Okay. Yeah, I didn't even make a motion. Yeah. So there, he passed out the document. We reviewed it. Council Member, uh, I mean, Vice Mayor Cummings made the motion. I seconded it. All those in favor were unanimous. Okay. Mayor, so, uh, very quick question. Uh, if I have a, a suggestion or a comment on language, um, just Brown Act stuff. Uh, I would send it to Tiffany. Yep. Beautiful. I would send it to Tiffany because I had one too. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have um, us then return. So we have item 10, 17, 19, and 20. We have uh, Mr. Dettel here. Thank you. Stuck evening. with us. Um, good evening. Good evening. Can right, I answer any questions that you have on item 10? Yeah, I'll make it quick and uh, we can do two at the same time. Perfect. Item 20 and item uh, 10. Ironically, ten apart. Um, so my, the, they're both on acquisition of Caterpillar pro, uh, uh, tractors or excavators or all kinds of other kinds of stuff. So just some quick questions. Why are we going through Caterpillar? Um, what the landfill, typically all our equipment is Caterpillar. Um, our mechanics are trained on cal Caterpillar. Parts, spare parts are Caterpillar. They, they provide uh, an effective uh, piece of equipment for the type of use. If you look, we're replacing a 18-year-old Caterpillar oh. piece of equipment that's been rebuilt a couple of times, um, has a tier zero emission. We're going to a tier four, which is a higher quality and reduces our uh, NOx by 80%. So that's... Right. What, what the effort is. Okay, um, that is great. Uh, thank you. Um, it was uh, it was interesting just because they're fossil fuel and vehicles, and I know right now we're in the process of transitioning and the difficulty of available vehicles, and we talked about it before, so thank you for your consciousness around that and making the intentional push in your department to transition away from fossil fuels. I will say, though, that it is problematic for me with us to be using Caterpillar for a variety of reasons. One, the cease and desist letter that was given to a local business for the use of the word cat in their title, the, that's probably for them attacking local businesses. Um, but just as a, a disturbing is their participation or their equipment being used to destroy thousands of homes in Palestine. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but Caterpillar and their armored vehicles tearing down Palestinian homes to make room for Israeli settlements. So that is um, a problem. Also, the, the warranty thing with, with farmers uh, that live in middle America that can't work on their own tractors because of the warranty that will be avoided by Caterpillar, so they're forced to use really expensive repairs. So it's problematic and stuff there. And then, of course, the fossil fuels. So just want to put it on the record that I think that if ever possible, we should transition away from Caterpillar until they change their business practices. Uh, but I do appreciate Parks, or excuse me, Public Works and your intention to transition away from fossil fuels. So with that, I would make the motion to uh, move on the recommendations for item 10 and 20. Second. Okay, motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Councilmember Crone. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, we'll go ahead and move those. We'll um, now move on to item number 17 and 19 are the only two remaining. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, so number 17 is another example of things that I don't believe are appropriate to have on the consent agenda because they are so amazingly controversial and uh, directly impact the poor. Um, I, one of the questions I would ask is why was it put on the consent agenda? Um, and I, after I was talking, I understand that there may have been an associated timeline with it being a bill in the process of a bill, we remember that uh, Schoolhouse Rock uh, cartoon, but um, the uh, issue, you know, speaking to some catch representatives is that they were bummed that they weren't even informed about this uh, ahead of time, and I know earlier in the meeting we said that we don't, some of us don't want the catch to be the catch-all, uh, but it, this directly has to do with poverty and people experiencing homelessness. Um, also, I don't understand why we would endorse this bill before we understand in detail the situation of our citation data. Unfortunately, today, I really appreciate the city attorney putting together the information with the different staff members of the city, but we received maybe an eight minute overview this morning in closed session about the impacts of our citation rules and uh, whether they may or may not uh, do anything with Pardon regards me, to council stuff. Council member, I just want to remind the council member of the confidentiality of closed session discussions. Yeah, it wasn't on the wasn't it on the agenda? 
Closed session agenda, right? Yeah, but no, but wasn't it on the agenda about the, the data? No, it was a closed session discussion. Well, we couldn't talk, okay, well, uh, we, we, so without looking at any data with regards to uh, citations, which was requested and has not really been reviewed by the council in full yet, unfortunately, how can we move forward on the criminalization of people in their, uh, their vehicles, which is really problematic for me. So um, it's also, the bill is sponsored by the ACLU of California, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights of the San Francisco Bay Area, the Western Center on uh, Poverty and Law. I brought you all some, some fact sheets if you'd like them, just with regards to uh, the situation of the bill, as well as the letter that was written and distributed by the ACLU to Santa Cruz, I believe in opposition of the, the bill. So uh, also the data that's cited in the letter is a little um, concerning and what was brought up earlier today in public comment with the impact that it has on municipalities and also the cost associated with it. So in a report called Towed Into Debt, How Towing Practices in California Punish the Poor, there is a, a, a quote that cities are losing money on tows, especially when the reason for the tow is someone's inability to pay government fines and fees. Towed vehicles sold at lien sale in San Diego generally accrued $3,000 in fees and fine, but the average sale price of the vehicles is about $565 resulting in the public paying more. Also in that report, they go through heavy data that points out that poverty tows disproportionately lead to lean sales. Losing a vehicle can limit housing opportunities. Impact on individuals living in their vehicles are, is greater. Um, and that poverty tows disproportionately impact housed, unhoused people, immigrants, and people of color. So um, I would uh, make the motion that we not follow the recommendation and not send a letter opposing AB 516, and if it's an issue of homelessness that we want to deal with, then it should be an issue of homelessness that we're talking about, not towing cars. Second. Okay, so there's a motion by Councilmember Glover, seconded by Vice Mayor Cummings. Mr. Duddle, did you want to speak? I was just going to say that this isn't a homeless issue from our perspective. It's a, a parking citation uh, enforcement tool that we use, and we typically don't tow. We'd use our uh, booting system, um, which immobilize the vehicle, and then <coughs> the person can come to the parking office and, and either uh, is offered a payment plan if they can't afford to pay the citations. But we, we actually have been doing this uh, booting for about 15 years to eliminate the number of tows that we do. Um, it's been very effective. Um, and we see this as a tool to to um, implement our, our parking part, you know, program. So I, it's a concern when a, par, a car is, is either abandoned or parked in a neighborhood and there's a permit program or something like that. We get a lot of calls if we don't have the tools to deal with it. So it's, it, that's how we see this as a, it's a tool for enforcement. Okay. Councilmember Matthews, and then um, I have a quick question. Council. Uh, I'm going to be voting against the motion. I want to point out that the recommendation is a letter of opposition unless amended. And I think it's, uh, and that's the position taken by the League of California Cities. It acknowledges there are a lot of social equity um, implications in the abuse of towing and so forth. Um, I don't believe that we're doing that here. I think um, also there are in many other communities and there's a legislative option to um, uh, uh, implement alternatives to more expensive fines and so forth. Um, but I know in my own neighborhood, uh, um, many years ago, we had a real problem with people abandoning cars and there they were. And that's one of the, um, and they weren't that people were living in, they were just plain abandoned. They ran out of juice and people left them there. Um, and so I think um, there are other instances that are mentioned in the staff report where there are uh, vehicles untagged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that are either pollution problem or um, uh, identified with a law enforcement problem. And um, to my mind, the bill as written removes an important enforcement tool. So uh, I, I would support the language of, as of the resolution to oppose unless amended. And I, I believe and hope that at, in Sacramento, they're working on some amendments that uh, respond to the concerns of cities. 
Um, I, I agree. I think it's, we don't want to lose our local discretion. And I also acknowledge what I think has been brought up is that this has been misused in communities as a way to penalize um, those who are um, homeless or have no means to get their car out, and which is troubling and horrifying to think that we're only going to further kind of build, uh, dig them into a hole of homelessness. So I'm wondering in terms of us, I mean, maybe this would be at a future conversation or not, you know, but it, you know, how we're supporting those individuals, whether it be by playbit plan or if the HEAP um, funding has some uh, discretion in regards to um, individuals who want to make a case that, you know, they need support for any type of towing or costs associated with it. But um, I think the the challenge here is that we don't want to lose our local discretion on a tool that we can use appropriately. And we want to acknowledge the fact that this is a tool that's not being used necessarily appropriately in some communities and can further um, kind of, you know, propel a person into poverty. And, um, and we can look at our own practices in that way. But supporting that, um, the motion as suggested with the amended language, I think, will help kind of clarify that, um, but also give us an opportunity potentially at some point to look f at our own policies or our own resources to ensure that we're not contributing to that in that way. So that would just be my sort of sentiment on this this time. Councilmember Glover and then Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Um, so I do want to point out on the sheet that I handed out there down at the bottom, it does provide some support with regards to uh, AB 516 leaves intact over two dozen existing authorizations for towing. So it doesn't completely tie the hands of people uh, in our organizations or departments from towing. Uh, I, I think that we need to emphasize that. Also, um, the League of Cities while we are a member, has been increasingly and unfortunately more and more conservative leaning in their bill uh, endorsements, as well as being invested in the private prison system of, of California. So when looking to uh, signals of which way to go, the League of Cities is not necessarily my first choice of deciding where to put my votes. Um, also, I would say that the, I would, you know, I would assert that from my conversations of people that are advocates for people experiencing homelessness and people that are currently experiencing homelessness, I would say it's a stretch to say that we uh, don't un uh, disproportionately target uh, people from their own experiences that they report to me about um, their feelings of being harassed and ticketed multiple times and having neighbors calling them all the time and then having their cars towed or the citations mounting up so they can't renew their registration and then therefore lose their housing uh, because of their car. So we are a great city and we have a lot of great stuff going on, but I do fear that our uh, parking enforcement is problematic. Councilman Brown? Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm just going to say I think it's unfortunate that this was brought to us um, with a request to oppose it. Um, my, I've been following this piece of legislation. Um, my, I oppose it personally. I can't, I cannot, I mean, I support it personally. I oppose the, sorry, I oppose um, opposing it. Um, I support the legislation, um, particularly as it's been amended and, you know, thoughtfully moved through the legislature. Um, I given the the advocates or, you know the supporters the organizations i mean these are organizations some of them i've worked with and for in over the years um that i absolutely trust their um their advocacy um include the aclu western center on law and poverty equal rights advocates other i could go on but i won't um it's unfortunate they came to us i mean i i, I support it and but i wasn't going to bring a, a proposal to the council to ask for council support because for one, I don't know, I think it's of limited value. Um, our state, you know, somebody came and spoke earlier today saying that um, our um, assembly member already kind of has taken a position on it. So, um, but here we are. So I'm gonna support the motion. Um, I, I could not oppose this piece of legislation um, and I don't think we ought to as a body. Councilman Burkham. I'm just going to, one comment I want to make, because I want to feel like, you know, I think progressive Santa Cruz would, would support this. And I mean, again, uh, 
reiterating what uh, Councilmember Brown said, and I'll say it for the record because I, I want it to be really clear that camp, uh, Courage Campaign, Disability Rights Advocates, American Civil Liberties Union of California, the National Lawyers Guild, the San Francisco Public Defender's Office, and the Public Law Center all um, uh, organizations I'm fairly familiar with. So, and, and they all support this legislation. They haven't withdrawn their legislation and it's not pending um, amendments to the, uh, to the bill. Can I just add one more thing about. really quickly? Um, I think we also heard uh, earlier today and I, you know, I, I trust that it was a genuine, um, that the county sheriff has said, this is not a tool to achieve uh, removal of abandoned vehicles. So I just wanted to add that in there in terms of how that affected my thinking. Um, it just kind of re solidified my, my view for the record. Okay, unless there's any further discussion, um, I think we have a motion um, and a second. I guess just for the record, I um, support the um, recommendation, which is to have um, opposition unless amended, and that this is not about um, disproportionately further penalizing those who may be in unfortunate circumstances, but about ensuring that we are thoughtful about our tools um, for enforcing other types of behaviors. So just sort of for the record, I want that to be clarified. Um, and, uh, and we'll go ahead and take the vote at this point. So all those in favor of the motion on the floor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Okay, that passes with Councilmember Brown, Vice Mayor Cummings, Crone, and Glover in support. Matthews, Myers, and myself voting against. Okay, so we have one last item, item number 19 on the agenda. Yeah, just for the, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna say I love bike safety and uh, I make the motion to move the item. Second. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes uh, unanimously. So we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting and um, there we go. Good job, everyone. After all, too late.